he was brought the most populous nation on the earth here this is very iconic very iconical it's very monumental and symbolic that you could bring the most uh, highly populated country that has surpassed china also to bring them here you are speaking very deep and very big by their presence here these are very senior clergy even those who are still in india tuned in on radio listening to this prayer this is such a tremendous moment for india jehovah and i can see the signature of the disposition of your love over the nation of india that by their presence here i can see you are longing for them to enter your kingdom that you have a place for them that nobody can fill their place except the indians themselves and i thank you jehovah because you have said in your word you have shown us the end from the beginning so that we may be able to live wisely to be able to live with counsel well instructed by the fulfilled prophecy that will be fulfilled at that time the reason you have shown us prophecy and how it ends how this entire world and life and human history and contestation between sin and righteousness how it ends and lord you have shown us that finally jesus wins and finally the kingdom of god wins and that's why we are so grateful jehovah that even in showing us your victory you have shown us that the kingdom of god almighty uh, the nations that will be gathered around your throne will be multi ethnicity all nations all tribes all people all languages all continents all races all everything so that's why we are happy jehovah that this work to bring india into the fold is a work that you have set out by your own divine design and i ask you my father to capture their hearts today here and to capture their minds and give them a burden let them catch this vision and give them a haste an urgency to understand the imminency of the coming of the messiah and even today lord as i speak with them let them be able to understand the things that matter to you let them understand the emergency that you are laying upon the face of the earth for the nations to quicken themselves prepare a glorious church a holy church a mighty church a church befitting the excellent work jesus did on the cross a church befitting the king of glory lord help them and open big doors for them in india to share this message expand their ministries that they may reach many many millions with this tremendous glorious announcement on the glorious coming of the messiah lord i bless them for being here keep them safe keep them healthy keep them joyful jehovah even as they are here allow them to commune with the people of kenya the land of revival a wonderful conversation a holy conversation and also to commune with india and transmit to india what they have heard and seen in the mighty name of jesus i bless also australia that is here that all of them lord may have this similar burden for their nations in the mighty name of jesus so you shall be a man and a man and a man and the people of god say amen hallelujah very well now for the kenyan bishops if you are tight tight too tight you just extend the chair there's too much room here and then you can always handle that on your own on and the ladies also if you're too tight you just extend the chair towards the passage and then there is a, lo- a lot of room you could just clear room gunyali can always move almost halfway there and there's too much room yeah so they, you don't have to be shoulder to shoulder and so forth so can you be seated in the mighty presence of the lord hallelujah and so tonight is going to be quite long uh we are, we are going to uh essentially go try try to hit midnight and i'm only hoping that uh your hotels have been uh, respectively informed to prepare your dinners and keep your dinners hot up to that time when you come be 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock uh or midnight but then you are able to be served in this land we will be very happy to see you comfortable as we do this yeah i know the days are very minimal that's why i'm going to try to use time as much as possible but i wanted the whole nation of kenya and the whole world especially the this side of the time zone to benefit from your presence here whatever i share with you they also be able to benefit that you came hallelujah yes yeah, so uh now what a mighty mighty time that we are here in the mighty name of jesus and uh my heart is overflowing with joy I see a city. Is there somebody sitting here? 
Yeah, there is somebody else, right? You, who is that now? One of the delegates from India, right? Thank you so much. Just keep it for the person and they come. Now, I want to say the following. Uh, I have so much to share with you. So much that the Lord has spoken. It's like asking me to share what he has spoken from 2003 all the way to 2024. And the conversation, we serve a living God, the living God of Israel, and the conversation is non-stop. It's a continuous conversation to the extent that even if I sat here now, if let's say we got tired and I sat here, and then I, the Lord told me in sleep like this, I would hear his voice and see visions there. So you can imagine how much there is in terms of voluminous to share with you the instruction. And that is very powerful because when you look at the structure, the, the formation, the arrangement of the Bible, you see that there is a time when Israel, they called it the hour, the, the moment, the season of uh, the awful silence. Awful. From the book of Malachi to the New Testament, there was a deep silence of about 400 years. So you can imagine, it's always very beneficial when God is speaking. And so, the reason Israel called it awful, I mean dreadful silence, is because you do not know whether you are on the right road or you are on the wrong road. So, so at least let him say something. Even if to rebuke you, rebuke his love. If he rebukes you, then you get to know that, oh, just a moment, I was on the going on the wrong side, now I can go this way. But if the Lord keeps quiet, it's terrible. And that's why in the conversations I have to share with you from almost 2003, I began to be part of it yesterday when the Lord appeared in the sky and the, the, the golden sash around his chest, the, the, the crown, the nail pierced glorious and preparing the crown, the red robe going diagonally like this. Those are conversations dating back to 2003 around that time. So you can imagine trying to bring them all together and bring it to now March 22nd, 2024 when I shared in this direction, look, the king is coming in the sky and he appears there in his glory, the golden crown now, the golden crown becomes a uh, super brilliant like crystal glass or diamond. He, he appears now in the glory of his return. And it's a very powerful thing to speak with somebody or to have somebody whom the Lord is speaking with directly, conversationing with you at this time in the life of the earth. So in other words, you are hearing directly. It's a direct conversation from the Lord. And there is no better place than that other than to be in a place where there is guessing around People are trying to give fake prophecies or trying to mimic how God used to speak and so forth. Now that time is over now because of the time, the prophetic timeline. Hallelujah. And that's why I'm so blessed and honored that you have come. And remember, like I said, we are I'm totally free of charge. Total free. You simply need to write an email. We apply for visa and we come. There is no money down. The, in fact, we pay our own flight tickets, our own hotel. There, there is no cost. We just want to prepare a holy bride for this wonderful king, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. And so, and that's why I'm saying, uh, in this conversation, for example, tonight, we're going to get a little deep. I'm going to give you something tonight that I have shared. I've shared the vision itself, the conversation from the Lord himself. I'm going to share it here. But uh, I have never opened it up. As I, I thought I should do it when I come back from Taiwan, but I realize the hour is now to open it up because you are here. Hallelujah. And it's going to be a very powerful caution to the church. And remember the purpose for which the Lord speaks. The purpose for which the Lord speaks. You'll just help me today uh, as, uh, to be a little quicker. The team, the broadcast team, when I ask for a thing, you put it right on the screen. So um, what I'm saying is that uh, the purpose for which God gives prophecy he, he speaks continuously about the glorious coming of the Messiah. My daughters from India, I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you. You're welcome home. This is now home for you. India, we love you very much. I will come back to Tenali again, Coimbatore. I will go to Rajamandri. I will come to Delhi, Mumbai, New Mumbai, all Mumbai. I will go to every city up to the Uttar Pradesh. Yes, we will reach every place, you know. 
we need to spend more time in India because of the population. Hallelujah. So uh, the reason the Lord continuously gives prophecy and talks about the glorious coming of the Messiah, I just want to begin from the onset to raise this before you, this very important question, I mean uh, value, is because he wants you to use prophecy. He, prophecy is very powerful. Because w when God says the Messiah is coming, and he shows it to me, and I come to you, and tell you, so you now live in the know. You are now aware. You know, the most terrible thing is to live out of, to live in ignorance without knowing what's going on. But to know that the Lord is now preparing to bring the Christ, that is power. That's a lot of power in your hands. You can literally go and prepare a people and they enter inside heaven. So that's why he brings the prophecy that you may understand that look now, uh, he is going to come. And the church will be taken. So in that way you live in the knowledge. So that, that's always very powerful. And especially we that are, uh, now bring this to you. You understand the certainty also of his fulfillment. Because you see the other prophecies are being fulfilled. Now, now uh, let me just mention the following. When the Lord gives prophecy. For example, I give prophecy of Haiti earthquake. Chile earthquake. Taiwan. And you see I do the building like that. And the building does exactly that. It's very powerful. Or when I give prophecy that there is a disease coming, COVID, December 1, 2015, a clean four years in the YouTube with maximum power. Nobody really ever thought that those words bore such power to shut down the whole earth and to see what happened in India, the roasting of dead bodies and all that kind of stuff in the parking lots. You can imagine that. But it, it would be difficult for you by the prima facie, just looking at the face value of those words on the YouTube or in the, in the, in the, in the public space, you wouldn't know the power and the potent, potency of those words. But when they become fulfilled, and especially when they are given and attached to scripture, and it says, uh, the end it says, repent, repent, otherwise this will happen. Repent because this is a sign that the Messiah is coming. Repent because the Lord is giving you a little glimpse of what's coming in the tribulation that you may avoid going there. So when he does that, the power you have is tremendous. Because then it brings the Bible to life. You understand? It brings the Bible to life. You begin to understand just a moment. If the Lord promised these things, you know, and scripture is read, and then now we are at a place where you know, those, the Olivet prophecy, the prophecies Jesus gave of the earthquakes in Matthew 24, are now, he has now sent messengers who are now speaking earthquakes, going to a nation, talking about the earthquake, and they are happening, and they are attached to repentance. That is powerful, really. Very powerful. Because you begin to understand the clock also, the prophetic timeline of God. And that's why it's very important that the prophecy on the coming of the Messiah brings the Bible now to be a living book. Because now we know that finally every word written there will be fulfilled. And we also know very clearly that uh, when the Lord speaks prophecy and fulfills, like many times, many times uh, I can say this, many times I can give a prophecy, I can say that uh, like, like I've already seen the meeting in, uh, in uh, South Korea, uh, I've seen cripples get up and walk blind. In fact, I, the meeting, the healing service is in the night actually. And the, 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 so I'm walking, there's just little room where I'm walking with cripples that I've gotten up. There's one of them, two, two get up at the same time, first of all, and one of them, it is the left hand side, the leg and the, and, and the hand that are crippled. So when the power of God, the Lord brings me to the meeting, and the power of God hits them, so the hand is touched, the leg is touched, he gets up, it's a boy. He gets up, but look, the hand is like this. So the hand remains pointing down like this, and he's, he's, he's now learning to walk and balancing. You see that? So, so when when you say that, and then there's the, the, the another wave of healings, another cripples get up. It's chaotic, and then even the worship. I have a worship uh, team, uh, the keyboardists that play keyboard and violins in our healing services, uh, the healing services of the Lord. So um, they the, 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 they stop playing. The strings, there's the, there's the instrument they play in the background. They stopped because there was deaf ears that opened. Uh, so I, I switch off all equipment so that someone can do this at the back see if they can hear. You know that from the meeting we did in uh, uh, Ahmed Nagar and also in Mumbai. So, but after that, 
as the creepers were getting up and walking, the instrumental was quiet. I know all the details. So you can imagine when you give such a prophecy and then you go to that country and these events will take place. I've seen them already. The power of that is that it really brings the Bible to life. You begin to understand that, hey, the Lord is speaking and the Bible is the living book. So people now can depend on the word. Plus, it also cleans out now false doctrine. Because now, it brings clarity on what the Lord is saying. If he's saying, repent, prepare the way the Messiah is coming, then nobody can, can come with another agenda, a worldly agenda to focus uh, the church on the earth. We also know very clearly that uh, sometimes people become skeptical on prophecy. I mean, before this hour uh, dawned on the earth. But now, even the skeptics, are now believing we can get more people, we can evangelize them for Christ, right? And so it's very important that we understand this. Now, for example, I'm going to do a quick rundown here. The prophecy of the glorious coming of the Messiah that we're going to share here, that we're sharing since yesterday and the next two days. This prophecy, this master prophecy, as I call it, the grand master prophecy, this prophecy, if you look at, you can now turn off this air conditioning behind my back and put at least two at the other end which are far away. Thank you very much. So, uh, if you look at the prophecies around the Messiah, that's where I want us to begin from, because we are touching on the Messiah. This is prophecy. You know, you can say earthquakes are coming and so forth, but those are now supporting prophecies of this master prophecy that the Lord is fulfilling the earthquakes. He is fulfilling the, the Zika virus in, uh, in Brazil. He's, when I went and warned them in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, and then it came to pass, uh, the, the, the corona and the earthquake in Taiwan, Chile, Mexico, everywhere, Kenya, here and so forth. So the Lord is fulfilling these things, these prophecies, as support prophecies that you may be able to inbuild, inculcate, inbuild, in grow in yourself and say, just a moment, if this one has been fulfilled, then even the master, the bigger one, because they all point at the coming of the Messiah. So even the bigger one will take place. That is what the Lord is trying to say. So I just want to, just again, do a quick rundown to build, uh, to build you on tonight. on uh, The prophecies that have been touching on the glorious coming of the Messiah. That's what I want to handle now. I mean, just to, uh, as an introduction here. J just to see overview, an overview of it. You will find out that all of them are accurately fulfilled. And that really goes a long way to underscore a very important fact, important truth in you, that even the bigger one on the glorious coming of the Messiah, therefore, must and will be fulfilled. So we had rather prepare. Hallelujah. And so, for example, I want to mention the following. That uh, Isaiah 40 verse uh, 3 on the screen, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 on the screen, if you can put it there, we'll see it right away. Isaiah 40, yes, he says, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. So now, this prophecy is being given by Isaiah, and there are many notebooks. You'll be given notebooks. Kenyans have many notebooks they'll give to you. There are so many in the store. They'll give them to you right now. So, this prophecy here is a very powerful prophecy. Focus on me as they bring in the notebook. This prophecy is happening many years before the Messiah comes. And he's saying that the Messiah would have a forerunner. And sure enough, John the Baptist appeared as a forerunner for the Messiah. Anyone else who has no notebook, please? The, the Professor Ambula is here. Thank you, Professor, for being around. This is very powerful that you came. So you can be able to help me here under this. So you see, the forerunner came. And then Isaiah 7.14 says, it says, Isaiah chapter 7 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with the child and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. So you can see that he, however illogical in human understanding, however incomprehensible in this life, he said he, the, the Messiah would come in a virgin birth. And yes, we know that he came, this was fulfilled, he came in a virgin birth. Very powerful. And then 
The book of Micah chapter 5 verse 2 real quick because this is just introduction preamble here. Micah 5 2 he says Bethlehem he says you Bethlehem Ephrata thou thou art small okay though you are small among the clans of Judah out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler the ruler over Israel whose origin are from old from the ancient times so in other words there is no genealogy for him. There are no records for him. Remember Melchizedek appears in Genesis 14 when he appears from Genesis 14 verse 17 to 20. He appears before Abraham carrying bread and wine. The precursors of the new covenant. Right from the beginning. Pointing Abraham that through your lineage come, I will come. He came to bless the lineage. That he would eventually come through that lineage and through the tribe of Judah. And you can see very clearly here, he's saying that he would be born in Bethlehem. And then when time came, he was born where? In Bethlehem. So that's why I just want to sensitize you, to use this to sensitize you, my sons and daughters from India and those from Australia. I know you're somewhere. So I just want to sensitize you on the fact that when we come to such a prophecy of the glorious coming of the Messiah, we need to be very careful because they are normally accurately fulfilled. The prophecies that point on him and his coming and his mission. Hallelujah. So you see Micah chapter 5 verse 2 uh, that uh, fulfilled again. Bethlehem became the place at which he was born. And you can see how the Lord orchestrated it. He orchestrated it such that there is an order, a decree, an ordinance given out for a census. So everybody has to go back to their origin. And then they travel and they find that there is no inn, there is no hotel, there is no main, I mean, place. And so they cow shed a manger. But, but bring them all the way to make sure that this prophecy is fulfilled. Tremendous. The prophecies of the Messiah are always fulfilled accurately. In other words, even the prophecy I am giving you and what I'm going to give tonight must be fulfilled accurately. Because I have seen him coming. I have seen him. And that's why this is such a time, a quality time spent when you come here and you capture this, right? And he says, the book of Psalm 72, verse 10, and then later 15 if you want. Verse 10, he says, wise men would come. Wise men would come, he says. He said, the kings of Tashish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and, and, and Seba will present him gifts. The kings would come with gifts. And when the time came, they surely came with gifts. So the prophecies around the coming of the Messiah are accurately fulfilled. Very accurately fulfilled. Be very careful. That's what I'm trying to raise here. Isaiah 53 says, He would die and bear the sins of many. And it's true, He went to the cross and He died and bore the sins of many. Isaiah 53, we know too well. The book of Isaiah, I don't know how you, you handle this, but on my side, the book of Isaiah is more like a fifth gospel. Because the book of Isaiah is even more quoted, but the, it talks about the, the coming of the Messiah, the prophecies of his coming, and how he would do his ministry. And then you go to, 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 to the Galil, to the Galil of the Gentiles, directing him even how you do the ministry. And then eventually... Uh, so we have already given. Just put them down there. We have already given. Give professor there if you want. We, we don't have time now for that. So, so listen, fo just focus on me now. The book of Isaiah is like a fifth gospel. It talks about how he would come and then how he would come, the kind of ministry he would do, how he would die for the sins and then how he would deliver mankind. The, 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 passion, the, the crucifixion of Christ, the passion of the Christ. And so, and he says, Isaiah 53, that he would bear the sins of many. And yes, he came and he did it on the cross, right? And so, Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, that he would be sold, he would be betrayed, he would be, he would be estimated at 30 pieces of silver. And Zechariah 11 says, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. This was fulfilled. Hallelujah. Very powerful. That's why I just wanted to raise a caution, to use this to raise a warning to you, that the prophecy... Uh, the Lord has sent us to give to you regarding the glorious coming of the Messiah will be fulfilled. So you rather go and just prepare the church. It will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. 
And he goes on to say in the book of Psalm 22 that he would be crucified. If you read Psalm 22, he says, they are pierced my hands. They are pierced my feet. He's reporting to the Father. Psalm 22. He's, he, 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 early, early, why have, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Psalm 22. And then you see when the time came, exactly that accurately, my Lord. Very powerful indeed. It says, uh, Psalm 22, okay, that, that uh, they have not put there. So, Isaiah 53 verse 9, that he would be buried. And he was buried. And then Psalm 16 verses 8 and 10, that he would resurrect, the glorious resurrection. Psalm 16, 8 and 10, please. The glorious resurrection. And you, because I don't have much time. Yes. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secured. Because you will not abandon me in the realm of the dead, in the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Meaning will resurrect him. Because you will not abandon me. The, the let's clap to the Lord because that is the, that is our hope. That's why we can even afford to live a sacrificial Christian life. That's why you are being persecuted very much. The story you gave yesterday just broke my heart the whole night. We talked about it. In fact, we had a conference where we shared what you said. That you see, they came and destroyed the church four times. They were expecting that we would now stop it and go to the world. But we did not go to the world, back to the world. We continued building another church and equipment and we are still following Jesus. Th that was very mighty. But the reason we do that, even, even going to jail in India, even being jailed, even being jailed, I remember Sunil, Pastor Sunil. I, I know he's out, but you can imagine we wept here. It hurt me. So that is what I was sharing with you in the hotel in Mumbai. When I was telling, I see legal action. You understand? Yes, I was saying, I see legal action. Court and the lawyer and this. So the Lord was showing me that after we leave, he would run into that problem over there. And so, you, you can see the persecution. And in many countries, in China and so forth. That is why you can persevere. Why? Because of this glorious resurrection. Because you know, we are going to see it today. We are going to see so much of this today. That no matter what I go through... I, I, I will, the Lord has promised that we will share in his glorious resurrection. The life on this earth is very short. We may suffer. We may be punished by the, the, the ways of rejection going on, forsaken, abandoned, abused, blackmail, mockery that happens here. Let me give you an example. Oh, it, it broke my heart very much. I will never forget this. A pastor in Hyderabad. He broke my heart very much until now. I've shared it with my people many times. And uh, when I share it, it hurts them also. They feel like they want to weep, you know. We were there. And then a pastor appeared in Hyderabad when I arrived there. And then Sham Kishore. And then a pastor appeared. Some pastors came. And then a pastor appeared. There's a Bajara Hills. Bajara Hills, right? It's a very wealthy neighborhood, right? Bajara Hills. Yes. Yeah, so now, that pastor, as if he came, he saw the prophet of the Lord now, of this caliber, and he wants to report to the Lord what they have done to him. And he said that, you see, um, I just want you to know that this is what they have done to me here. It is tough sometimes. So, one time I was preaching in, in, door to door in Bajara Hills. I was trying to share Jesus. And then a, a big Hindu man, you know, those are wealthy people, and he opened his door and he saw me in the, in the neighborhood preaching to another door there, another home there. He came and he was quite big, you know, and well. And he said, huh? what are you doing here? He said, I'm sharing the gospel of Jesus. Would you want to know? And then he turned and he boxed him and beat him and beat him and he fell down. And when he got up, he beat him again, boxed him. And he was bleeding on the teeth and he fell down. He said, please don't kill me. He, he cried to him and he said, get out of here, never come again. So he was giving me that story. And he said, uh, it, so, so I was punished very hard and uh, so I went to hospital. The people tried to help me. So, and then later, slowly by slowly, the Lord healed me. But I've never stopped sharing the gospel. I continue sharing. So it, it crushed my heart. 
It just crushed my heart very much. You understand? Because I could see the scars also as he shared there. In Hyderabad, he was sharing this. And so, the reason we can persevere and live that sacrificial living is because of this promise of this glorious resurrection. That even us will share in that resurrection. That in this world, however much we suffer, but this is a shorter life. There is a greater life coming. And so, and that's why you see that, that, that there would be resurrection. And then Psalm 68, verse 18, then he said, you would be raptured, you would ascend into high, verse 18. Psalm 68, uh, six, yeah, very good. He said, when you ascend on high, when you ascended on high, you led captives in your train, you received gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that you, O oh Lord, might dwell there. For telling that he would be raptured into the clouds from the Mount of Olives, that he would go up. Again, that was fulfilled. And that's why I'm saying, let's be careful. I'm just using this to set a basis for our conversation tonight. Which is going to be a very extensive conversation. That every time the Lord gives the prophecy on the Messiah, those prophecies must always be fulfilled accurately. Accurately. Every description I've given here that Jehovah God the Father has given me on how he's going to come and take the church must, will be fulfilled exactly as I have transferred it to you. So in other words, the Lord is saying that when you now relay, when, when, you, when you place your lives or your ministry on this preparing of the way for the glorious coming of the Messiah, you can never be wrong. Whether you wait for it for 10 years and you're keeping preaching, prepare, 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 be righteous, repent, be holy, always wait for the Messiah, separate from the world. You can never get it wrong. Whether it takes 5 years and he comes, you will be right. 2 days he comes, you will be right. 10 years he comes, you will be right. So he's saying this is reliable, trustworthy. You can lay your life on this and you will enter glory. You can never be disappointed or put to shame. Right? Hallelujah. And he says, First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, now 13, 18, that is now the message of the coming of the Messiah that we are going to handle today. And so it's very, very important, blessed people, that we understand that what the Lord is speaking here will be fulfilled. And we know very well also in the book of Revelation, because before we go to First, this is going to be our main scripture today, but before we go there, the book of, Re- the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says the following, Revelation chapter 1, 3, before we go to 22, 7. Revelation 1, 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. That is very powerful instruction right there. He said there is a blessedness in anchoring your soul or your ministry or your life on the prophecy of the glorious coming of the Messiah. I want to deposit to you here today that if you look at the Bible from Genesis, all the way to Revelation, is talking about Jesus. It's talking about Jesus the Messiah and His coming and His kingdom. Hallelujah. And that's why you see when He ends, He ends here with the revelation about Jesus and His coming kingdom. Hallelujah. Very tremendous. And so he's saying that therefore it's beneficial. It is very blessed for you to have your ministry. You know ministry has many facets. You have the widows, like in Kenya here, you have the widows ministry. You have the orphans ministry. And then you have uh, the, the, the single ladies, the single men, single mothers, the men ministry, the married couples, and then evangelism, hospital ministry, and all the other ministries. You can do them which is the right thing, you have to do all of them. And you have to understand that when the Lord gives you, for example, the city of Hyderabad, I don't know whether, that's quite massive. Because when I was there at that time, it was 70 million. Now I know it's much, much more. If the Lord, for example, gives you the city of Hyderabad, and he says, this is your jurisdiction, I am giving you this city, now you prepare this city, that is a lifelong work. You can imagine how many hospitals are there in Hyderabad. You must have people reaching each of them. Like if you are in Kenya here, this revival, what it has done, we have saturated the hospitals. 
there are people that go to hospitals on a daily basis. They go in the morning. They are, thank God we have this favor where now the, the directors, the, the medical superintendents have given us authorization letters, allowed us to go pray for the sick. You know, when we got that chance, we really celebrated. Our hearts began to tremble. Because, we, you know, they could say no. And so, the Lord says, I was sick and you did not visit, right? Matthew 25, right? But listen to this now. When we go to hospital, for example, uh, you, you pray for people in the cancer ward, you will find the, the clusters or characterization of the, of the words. You will find some words are for terminal patients. Where now, you know, the terminal inoperable. The cancer is not inoperable. There is just a wide hole in the heart that they are using with a big syringe to pour some uh, porridge and so forth. You understand? And so they are really, those are now people at the exit door. They are about to live this life. And you know, we have learned much. They have taught us so much lesson. They, They have taught us quite a bit. The people, the people at the terminal wards. If you are to talk to some of our teams, our teams that are handling hospital ministry, my son from Shamkishore, if you are to, 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 to someone touch him. So, so if, if you, if you are to talk, if you are to talk to some of our people, uh, uh, that, uh, handle, you, you can put the camera on me at this point. If you can talk to some of our people that handle hospital ministry, this is what you learn so much. In fact, you will honor God. You, you will even be very thankful that you are alive. Because there are some words in hospital, in the hospitals, called the terminal wards. And we are allowed to go there. For example, the terminal cancer ward and so forth. These are people who are at the exit door. They are about to leave the world. And so, you can learn much by talking to them. You come to pray, and then the first thing they will ask you, for example, is, Oh, you, you have come to love me. Because you know now they have this wound going. The smell is not very good there also. And so forth. They cannot even turn themselves in that condition. You understand? Oh, you have come to love me. But I don't even know you. You don't even know me. And you have come to love me. To pray for me. They are shocked by that level of love also. And then, uh, when you listen to them, you will find that most of the cases, they are not talking about their wealth or their properties of land that they have, or their families. Not at all. All of a sudden, at that place, they are talking as though they are regretting. As though all of a sudden, it dawned on them that they are going to meet their creator. And that it will be required of them to give a report. All of a sudden. You know, you never... Never have we seen where the book of Hebrews chapter 9, 27 really comes to life than at that point of exit. The people, you know, if even you enter there, even the smell is horrible in that word. And so you are praying for him. The, the, the relatives say, please come and pray for my patient. He's really not good. He's not good. He's bad. He's in a bad state. And then when you get to talk to them, you say, can, you, can I lead you to the Lord? Then he texts the Lord and you pray for him. And then you ask, and, and then you speak with him you'll find that all of a sudden he is realizing that he was brought onto this world for a purpose. And that purpose was not to accumulate wealth or to build a family, which is part of living on this earth. Of course, not everybody knows that. But all of a sudden they realized that the purpose was not to be a professor. You can do all those things as part of being in this world. A doctor, a lawyer, whatever they were, business person. All of a sudden you hear him saying that, I wish God could give me even two more days or just heal me. If you could heal me, I would be doing what you are doing. As though all of a sudden they realized that they are supposed to have served the Lord, but they did not serve the Lord. So anyhow, when you lead these people to the Lord, and the next day, when our teams go there, and again, pray different words and come to this word and start praying. Then they ask, hey, what is the brother that was here yesterday whom I prayed for? Oh, that brother. In fact, it was so powerful that you came yesterday and led him to the Lord. We did not know. Kumbe, Kumbe is what means. So, so yesterday was actually his last day. So when you led him to the Lord in the night, he passed on. So you can imagine. 
Why am I bringing this to you? I'm saying this to you because I just want you to understand your jurisdictional authority, duty, and what the Lord has conferred upon you. That if you are given, for example, Hyderabad, you become the Archbishop of Hyderabad. The Lord is saying that not just the churches, not just must you ensure that there are churches in every precinct, every colony, every colony, every district. Every part, the wealthy, the poor, the everything, you must. You must have churches there. You must raise pastors, shepherds to prepare them for the Messiah. But also the hospitals. Uh, and you must be sure there are people going to every hospital and harvesting people as they leave the earth. As they are leaving the world, you change their destiny. Change their destination at the door. That is very powerful. Do you understand now? And so we need to be very careful. So he says here that blessed, again he says very clearly in that scripture, blessed are the ones that keep this prophecy. They read it aloud, he says. Why aloud that others may hear this prophecy? And then he says, and those, and keep it in your heart. Meaning it will transform you. It will instruct you. It will instruct how you live your life on this earth. When you have the prophecy of the Lord in your heart. It will remind you that you are under the Lordship of Jesus. It will remind you that the Messiah is coming. Remind you that life on this earth is very short. Hallelujah. And it says also verse, chapter 22 verse 7, real quick as we finish up this. It will influence your heart, your mind, your thoughts. He says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy, of the prophecy written in this book, in this scroll. And that's why we come to you with this prophecy on the glorious coming of the Messiah. Why? That it may change the way you execute your lives or the way you prosecute your lives. I just want to touch on one thing and then we will be on our way. Tomorrow we are going to handle glorification. Tomorrow. And that will be very big. Absolutely big. Because we said glorification is a main pillar. One of the main pillars of the rapture of the church. Today I will handle something different within the context of the coming of the Messiah. But before we do that, again, I just want to go back to the timeline. There is a timeline on, on uh, covenants that I once shared a few days ago with uh, pastors from all over the world, senior church leaders. This timeline, I said you can draw your own. You can dis- develop the timeline, a prophetic timeline. As you are aware, we are on a zero countdown to the kingdom of God. Let me just make this clear to you. Just be with me at this point in time. I want to make this clear to you. I said it to the team that was here before from all over the world. Now I'm saying it to you again. Listen to this now. The power and the beauty of Bible and Bible prophecy is that the Lord earlier on normally tells us how it will end. And we see very clearly that at the end, the Lord must win. So you are on the right place. You are on the right place. Whatever you go through, you just continue you on the right place because you know who gets to win at the end. Yes, it is the Lord and you. And therefore, it will tre- teach you to always be on the Lord's side so that you are on the winning side. This vision I'm sharing just now as an introduction here. In this vision, uh, I just want you to know that the Lord has shared with me almost all the visions of Daniel. Almost all. And there is a history to that at the throne room of God Almighty in heaven before the Ark of the Covenant which was brought by the cherubim of glory. There is a golden walkway there with two strips, reddish brown gold strips and then a richer yellowish gold in the middle, wider middle. And then the person of God, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me by voice there, directing me and telling me of everything happening inside the throne room of God. I think even that alone, if somebody appears and says, I have been to the throne room of God, that alone should also make you just stop for a moment and say, just a moment. I think something must have changed in the prophetic clock of God for someone to stand before us and say this. That he has been inside the throne room of God. How? So when you hear that, that a moment has now come for somebody to appear and say such a thing, that is shocking. And the same person saying so, calls God in the cloud and he comes. He calls rain and rain falls. And all this, instant, instant, all this. 
Then you realize that something has changed. The purpose is to shake you. To shock you that you may say, just a moment. I must prepare now. It seems that time has changed. So inside the throne room of God Almighty, I say there is a golden walkway. And in that golden walkway, blessed people, so uh, then, then the, the cherubim of glory, two of them carry the ark of the covenant of God inside the throne. Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone to talk about the ark that he has seen? The, uh, first of all, he has been inside the throne room, my Lord, of God. So the, the, I just want you to understand the gravity. I don't want to sing it as a story. The gravity of the words I'm saying. And I'm saying them on purpose because that's why you have come. Because here now you can get this which you can't get elsewhere. Listen to this now. The cherubim of glory, they carry the ark of the covenant coming down, the, 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 the coming straight to the... Uh, he's, 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 uh, he's with me. He's with me. So uh, the, the golden walkway. And they are like this. They are holding the ark of the covenant like this. And their heads are bowed. And they are walking sideways along the golden walkway like this. Like that, until they reach the throne position and put it. And then I see the river of life behind. So that, that is the throne of God. That is not a joke. That is now the throne of God. And then shortly after that, shortly after that, shortly after that, shortly after that, then after I said the prayer as the person of God, the Holy Spirit, told me to pray, that mighty Father, today I come before you with a lot of praise and thanksgiving in the mighty name of Jesus. Then the same cloud I called that came to Kisomo, let's see first of all Kisomo, and came to Kapkatet, and Kericho, Kapkatet, came to Kapkatet, the before and after. Okay, well, I don't know who is running things here because I hope there is somebody born again running the system. Kapkatet, before and after, you see that? And came to Kericho. I called him also. He came to Kericho. In a hurry. If not, I'll show them what's on the wall. Kericho, you see that? I gave the prophets. A few minutes he arrived. And you see he's coming. He wants to cover my head. And also came to, um, came to, to Kisumu 2012, which they can see up there. Anyway, if you delay to bring it, it's already up there. Before he touched down and when he touched down, already he's up there. You see that? Yeah, somebody is slow at work behind there. And I'm not going to stomach this because tonight I'm in a hurry. Yes, they must know their files. Otherwise, we get, just get another team. There are many young men with masters of IT in the ministry right now. You see, so, so, so you, you see that? Again, you see? So, it is him I'm talking about. In Central Park, he covered me. It is him I'm talking about. So, when I say that prayer inside the throne room of God, when I say that prayer, then now, uh, Inside the throne room of God, when I say that prayer, then now he came, he came along the golden walkway and sat on the mercy seat, the cherubim of glory on both sides, and sat like this, went up. Okay, he goes up very fast, he gains height, the cloud, very fast, but not continuous. At one point up there, thin again, and then big again like that. So these are details I'm giving you. I will not give you more than this. So, he, he sits on the mercy seat. And then at one point, he invites me to go and look inside the mercy seat. We will see the purpose for that when I handle the, 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 the vision of December 8, 2021. The wooden pulpit he lowered for me and said, replace the one in the church today. So, so, so this is serious. Very, very serious. This kind of visitations, you know. And so, the reason I'm talking to you about this is that we, we need to be careful. We need to be careful about this time. The Messiah is coming. That's why you have come. That you may capture this and go prepare your nation. That your nation, your ministries may expand. I've spoken here the stretching of the tent, the cords, so that now you may just go ahead and do what? And prepare the nation. You take a whole state and prepare it. There is no limitation, right? But now, in that timeline that I have here, in the timeline, this one here, you can do your own. But in this timeline, that I have at this place. In this timeline uh, that, that we have at this place, you will see that you can start from creation. All the way, are you with me everybody? From creation, all the way to the eternal state, the eternal, re the eternal real estate, the eternal commonwealth of the Lord. The eternal state. And in that vision, at uh, the throne room, what I have not shared with you, is that 
at one point we are sitting on one side of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and Daniel sitting alone on this side. So in, along the way he has shown me almost all the visions of Daniel. So li- listen to this now. One of them is this. A huge statue all of a sudden that vision is in front of me. The toes are up to about my head like this. And then a rock comes in this direction, from this direction, but at a tangent like this. And that rock is like this. Sharp in the edges, but fat in the middle. Heavy in the middle. Sharp like, like this, but swollen in the middle. And that rock smashes the toes, the feet, the toes of that statue. Like that. And then the Lord makes the dust to pass over me that I may know it's totally pulverized. It's totally finished. And then the rock becomes a huge mountain, covers the whole earth. That is in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, 44, 45, the translation, before I go to this timeline, and it says the following. In Daniel chapter 2 on the screen, uh, 44 and 45, it says that the meaning of that. Okay, I really need somebody that is born again to run the system there. He says here that in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all these king, all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. That, that is very powerful. Let's stop right there. Before we get started tonight, you can see now the target, the end, that all our churches, all the sheep under you, everything you do, even your personal life, you are in a countdown. You are headed to the eternal state. To the eternal kingdom of God. Just make sure you understand this. So that now, everything you do, whatever the ministry, and all the things you do, don't lose focus on your destiny, the destination. Everything you do with your ministry, the destination is the eternal kingdom of God. So be very careful. And this is your bearing. It's as though this is your magnetic north. This is your, your, your navigation compass. That in whatsoever you are doing on the earth, but you, your navigator would tell you, no, 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 the kingdom, the kingdom will always point you to, so you, it will direct you and keep instructing you. If you are trying to drift, you say, no, no, the, the, the compass is again telling you, no, the direction is this way. You understand? This is the direction. The eternal kingdom of God. And that's why, now when you go to that, of course he, say, he says, first of all, before you go ahead of there, in, verse, in that verse 44, what he's trying to say there is that God is in control. That is the most important thing you see there. That God determines all seasons, all kingdoms, all reigns and empires and whatever they are that come. He already knows them. He determines them. And God is saying, he has a plan. If you are born again, you have accepted Jesus, you should not panic because he knows how it ends. Because he says, all the kingdoms of the earth are crushed. The kingdom of Russia, of India, India is a superpower. The kingdom of India is crushed. The kingdom of Russia, USA, everybody. He says, all these kingdoms you see, the Lord is saying that they will come to an end. And only the eternal kingdom of God will be left. And if you ever get a chance one day, if we get a chance to read Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 13, 14, then you will see, says, and then the kingdom will give, be given to God's people. Meaning, God will win together with you that are on his side. You understand? So this is a very important anchor for us as we do this uh, tremendous uh, service tonight. That even your ministries, you begin to understand that this is the pointer. You are a pastor, you are a bishop, whatever you are doing, you must always be aware that you are preparing people for the eternal kingdom of God. Because sometimes ministry can be so busy and you get lost in direction, focus on the world now. Start focusing on the wealth of the world and preparing the sheep for wealth, preaching wealth, the perishables of this world. But if you understand what the purpose for your calling is, or the purpose for your living on this earth born again is, uh, as a pastor, or your ministries, that the, to, to prepare the churches, your nation, your jurisdictions for the eternal kingdom of God, you can never go wrong. And so, we see that finally, God wins. And we see very clearly that all the kingdoms you have today on the earth are perishable. 
But then there is another kingdom that comes, the kingdom of God. So if you look at, if, just focus on me because I know you are, you, you are very rich, you have theological colleges, some of you are running theological colleges and so forth. So I can share, I can open up, I can just have latitude and freedom to share with you a little deeper. If you look at those kingdoms in Daniel chapter 7, which we don't have here now, which we are not taking, those four kingdoms, right? Even if you look at the statue, for example, that's being smashed, whichever way you want to look at it, first of all, you see that it is temporary. It's as though those metals are not even mixing, right? At one point, they're bound to crash, right? But even most importantly, they are not just four empires or kingdoms. They are five because of this one. You remember the reason that the, uh, when, when uh, the, the magicians were brought in Egypt to interpret the five fat cows and five, uh, rather seven fat, I beg your pardon. I have seen that dream, by the way. The, the seven fat uh, gaunt, the, the fat cows and the gaunt cow, the fat and thin, the thin eating the fat, and then the corn and so forth, right? The reason they were defeated is because at one point, you have 14 cows together. At one point within there, it becomes now 14 cows. You understand? In this case also, there are five. They are not four anymore. So it's very powerful here when we know the end. That is what the Lord is saying. That the end is that God's kingdom, the eternal kingdom, must be established. So therefore, so therefore now, therefore, in that context, I now take you to the covenants, which you can draw your own on the screen. So if you are to draw the prophetic timeline, the, all what I'm saying until now is just introduction. All I'm saying until now is introduction, please. I just want you to understand this. It's just for you to catch base, and then I'll be able to bring the message today. I'll share the vision of the coming of the Messiah, and then I'll give the message. But I want you to be at par, because I now have so much, and I want you to give you as much, right? Because you have come. So now, look at this now. If you are to draw the prophetic timeline of God, starting from creation, Adam, over there, and you want to lay down and see how many covenants are along the way, you can use covenants. Hallelujah. You can use covenants or you can use Daniel chapter 9, 24, 27, which is the key to end time prophecy, which we shared yesterday here. But this one here, the covenants. If you begin from Adam and you go towards the eternal, look now, the rock crashes and become a mountain. The eternal kingdom of God, right? Then you can pick a lot of valuable information. Hallelujah. Because you see now at Adam there, at Adam, you see that the Lord had a covenant with Adam. He told Adam, I will devolve power. I will delegate you some of my power. And you reign over what? All creation. And you see also even the man of creating him in the image and likeness of God. So before the fall, you can see clearly that there is no death. So he also has a covenant of eternal life with Adam. And that's why and you can read the book of Genesis chapter 2.16 when you get time later in the future. In that scripture there, that he's calling for voluntary obedience. He's calling for voluntary obedience of Adam. He says that you can eat all the trees but don't touch the other one. You understand? There are many questions you as people that have Bible colleges, you can ask. Why did the Lord then have to put the other tree there? You, you understand? But you can see the thing here is that our God creates you and gives you voluntary will. He wants you to make the choice to come to him, to love him, to appreciate him, recognize him, and enthrone him, giving him his due position as maker, creator, king, ruler, sovereign ruler of our lives, right? If you don't, he, w he won't push you, but he will feel sorry. You keep sending people to you, right? So look at there. Adam has a covenant with the Lord also. A covenant of eternity. Because there is, Adam's life has three phases. The innocence phase, or the righteous phase, or the obedient phase, whichever way you want. And then you have the fallen phase, and then the restored, redeemed phase. And that's why, at this place now you see, this covenant with Adam, the covenant that he develops with him, Adam then falls. When Adam falls, then at that point, you can see that there is another covenant. 
If you ever get time, we don't have time to read it now. But if you get time to read the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 14 to 19, you see that the covenant of death has been brought in. He said childbirth will be painful. He told women, you will now be more dependent on men all the time. And your childbirth will be painful, very painful. And then there will be death. And men will sweat before you eat your bread, right? And so, you can see that one of them, for example, the covenant of death, goes all the way up to where? Millennial state. Up to the millennium here, people will still be dying up to the end of millennium. That is just how serious these covenants are. I'm just giving this a little brief for what I want to share today. And then, you can talk of Cain, if you want. Cain and uh, Abel. You see that the Lord loves the sacrifice that Abel gives. So a covenant of worship. In fact, there is blood there. But before you move, even still with Adam, Genesis 3.15, there is a covenant there of the cross. The proto-evangelium, the first gospel. When he said, and the, the offspring of the woman. Hallelujah. Meaning, he will come in a virgin birth will crush the serpent, and the serpent strike his heel on the cross, right? So that covenant also, that one there runs up to eternity. So Genesis 3.15 is a covenant that runs up to eternity. The gains, the trappings, uh, and, and the gains of the cross, they run up to eternity. Hallelujah. And, and, and the supremacy of the Messiah in crushing the serpent goes on up to eternity. That's why now we can say we'll share in his glorious resurrection, in his victory. That's why when he's coming back for the church, he does not come to argue the Pharisees. I've seen him, he has a crown. He now has a crown and, he, and he's coming with, with all the pomp and circumstance and color of a triumphant king. His glory of triumph and victory runs on eternally. So that covenant of Genesis 3.15 runs on eternally. Hallelujah. You can draw your own scheme here all the way to the kingdom of God. And then look at that now. Enoch. Enoch here, this is a covenant of the rapture. Of faithfulness. Enoch was known for faithfulness. That when you become faithful, I shall protect you. Even before judgment, I will take you into my glory. So Enoch there represents the church that will be raptured before judgment. Because, look at this now, the pre-tribulation rapture. Because Enoch is snatched away before the floods of Noah. So you understand? So the, if you look at the judgment during the time of Noah, you see three types of people. And that's exactly what we are dealing with right now. In the rapture of the church. Three types of people. You see now, those that will be raptured before the tribulation, represented by Enoch. They don't see death. Those are exonerated. But yesterday we saw, because you are very eloquent in uh, the Bible, in your Bible colleges, I said, however, they must die to sin when they are here. Hallelujah. So, so what I'm saying is this. The covenant with Enoch, for example, runs to eternity. It's the covenant of eternal life. The covenant of faithfulness. That if you are faithful, the Lord will always, always before judgment comes, He secures His people. Hallelujah. And so, you see it right there. And then when you move on, you also meet Noah. The covenant with Noah, right? You see Noah preaching righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. And as Noah preached righteousness throughout 120 years, it was quite a situation, right? People were mocking him. They didn't believe that. They didn't want to hear him. They were laughing at him, abusing him, right? But then finally, the Lord secures him. So you have three types of people. You have those who are secured by the Lord, taken away before judgment. Then you have those who are secured by the Lord inside the tribulation, inside judgment, representing Israel. And then, of course, and then uh, plus the tribulation saints, and we're going, to we're going to see that very shortly here today. And then you have those that perish in the judgment. So there is a covenant there. Remember again, Noah, you know, after the boat arrives somewhere, gets animals, sacrifice them, and the Lord develops a covenant with him. Hallelujah. 
So, as you move on with the covenants, you now meet Abraham. Genesis 12. That's a powerful covenant. Because now, can I explain to you why we, we get to Abraham? Let me just explain to you. This is important. Yeah, let me explain this. What the Lord is trying to say is the following. He's saying that in the beginning, he creates man and everything is perfect before the fall. But because of mankind, because mankind, the word is mankind, humanity, mankind fell, the Lord now tried to restore mankind, but the fall was so massive as Genesis chapter 6, 5, the days of Noah, the inclination of their hearts is evil all the time. Throughout. They are evil throughout. And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be now. So also at this time. I hope you have your water and your soda. Do you have your drinking water? You just make, okay. What, what, what was that? I delayed to come today. Is it true you're going to give water at this hour? I don't think so. I delayed to come for that purpose. So now, I'm saying, if you read Genesis 6, 5, you see now, mankind... God had a blessed covenant with, uh, uh, with Adam, with mankind, that, that no death, you know, as long as they are faithful to him. But the fall comes, Genesis 12. Genesis 11, there is already fall. Remember the Tower of Babel? Nimrod, where, you know, symbolizing the Antichrist, where you come from. There is so much there, if I have time, I can walk with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The creator of Babylon. Remember, there are only two cities in the book of Revelation, right? There is the New Jerusalem and then Babylon. Are we together? Those competing cities, they're always at war. So, it's very important to understand this. He's saying that when mankind fell, he wanted mankind to live forever. Wonderful covenant with mankind. But when mankind fell, then the Lord now tried to restore mankind and mankind was not able what he, up, what he did, still inclined to sin, what he did, he now finds a person. He finds a person who was an idol worshiper, of course. I think he was selling idol gods at that time. Abraham. And then the Lord now, he prepares unto himself a people, a lineage, a special people now. Out of humanity, now he pulls out Abraham. And he wants now to narrow down here, see if he can pull out a people that will be faithful to him and worship him and prepare to be his own people for his kingdom. All that is being prepared for what? The eternal state. The, the rock. The kingdom of the mountain. Of the rock. The eternal kingdom. And later, as you will see when I will handle the eternal gospel, the message of the pulpit, you will see very clearly there is a competing, comp there is a severe competition. The enemy is recruiting his people and the Lord is also recruiting his people. Why? Because there is Hamegido, the valley of Megiddo, the war of, of um, uh, Magedon, Hamegido, that's how it's called in Hebrew. But, but there is that war. So recruiting the army, like you sitting here, you are part of God's army. On that day you come back with Christ. You understand? But just focus, focus on this. So now, humanity, he tries to restore humanity, they fail. He ends up now pulling Abraham alone to try to build unto himself a faithful people. So there is a covenant there. If you, there are so many scriptures. But for example, Genesis 12, a big covenant there. And if you listen to Genesis 12, you see he's developing a covenant. He's talking about the Messiah. In verse 3 on, verse 2, 3, you hear him now saying that the, the, the verse 3 is the great commission that through him he will baptize all nations. You can almost tell indirectly he's talking about the Gentile church because he's saying all nations in Genesis 12, 1 and 3. That is a covenant with now Abraham. So now he's pulling out Abraham. He has a covenant with Abraham. Now it's not about humanity anymore. He's on his way to building Israel. Hallelujah. And then after that, you see very clearly, transfers it. You can go on up to Genesis 22, for example. Now, when he takes Isaac to the te Temple Mount, and on that rock, which has become now the foundation stone of the earth, and he lays him there to slaughter him. And then a ram. So, that the very powerful covenant. Now, that covenant runs eternally. Through the, the millennial state into etern eternity. Because the Messiah now He's now talking about the Messiah. 
And then, so the covenant with Abraham has the following. Let me just run through this one. With Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 and 3 on the screen. Real quick, we don't have time. This is not what we are doing. This is just introduction. He says, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country to your people and your father's household and to the land I will show you, verse 2. I'll make you into a great nation and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. And he goes on to three says, I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will fight, I will curse, I will destroy. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. In other words, now the covenant with Abraham, he has the following. Number one, he promises land. Number two, protection, homeland security. Number three, a great name. Number four, the blessings of God. Number five, a great nation and all that. You can literally list them down from there. So, it's amazing because in that covenant now, you can see that it's alluding to the works of the Messiah that is coming. Hallelujah. So, we don't have much time to go through that. But you know very well, Abraham and the entire of his life, even Hebrews chapter 11, when Abraham comes to this land, Hebrews 11 from verse 10 up to verse 40, Abraham, he still does, he just builds a tent because he's looking forward to a heavenly city. Hallelujah. So, so there's so much we could have shared there. And we could have also shared Second Corinthians chapter five, verse uh, verse uh, verse uh, ten onwards, or or verse nine onwards, or verse seventeen, where now the new creation and so forth. He is talking about the exploits of the Messiah. Hallelujah. But as you come from Abraham, then you enter the Mount Sinai covenant. Now the nation is talking about the great nation Israel is being formed in Egypt. Then the Mount Sinai covenant, for example, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, he says the following on the screen. Let's read it real quick. Exodus uh, chapter 19, 5 and 6. He says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured, treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. Look at that covenant. You will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you are to say to the house of Jacob. Very powerful. There is a covenant there on Mount Sinai. In this covenant, now he has chosen, he is finally, finally narrowing down the humanity, trying to help mankind, but then now he's building unto himself God, people that are faithful to him, that will worship him well and populate the kingdom. Hallelujah. And so, after that, now when you go, eventually, when you go back the timeline, in there, he meets David. He means David, everybody here. David. While still in the Old Testament, he means David now. And then he develops a covenant with David. In that covenant with David, Second Samuel 7, we can read from verse 10 on. We don't have to read it all, just a little bit. Look at what it says. You will see the importance of the rapture here. You will see why I brought you to these covenants. Because I want to underscore where we are sitting within the timeline towards the glorious coming of the Messiah. That you may see how critical it is that you are here today. At this time. Because of the urgency, the imminency, and the emergency, the suddenness with which he might come. We are just in the very, we are sitting at the brink, so to say. So he says, he says again, Second Samuel chapter 7, now, verse 10 on, he says, And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. So he's promising land, homeland, a homeland, right? And he's saying, Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, meaning he will provide homeland security also. This is now the covenant with David. Just put, pay attention to me. The covenant with David is not a conditional covenant at all. Because there is no requirement for obedience. This is a special covenant, by the way. So, then he says, Wicked people will not oppress them as they did at the beginning. And he says, And have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel, I will also give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. So if you are looking at the covenant with David, he mentioned the land 
Then he mentions a house. He's promising a house. So he's already touching on the temple mount. He's promising a house. That's And he is the one who will build a house for my name. Everybody knows that's Solomon. But then, listen this. And I will establish his throne and kingdom forever. When he reaches there, he says, oh, just a moment. He's talking about an eternal king. He's talking about a reign, a throne. So he has promised David a few things. He has promised him land. He has promised him a house of worship. That, and he has promised that his son, a throne, there will be a throne on which his own offspring will sit on. And then when you check that, at one point you see Solomon, but when you read further, and then you see it's a throne forever. A kingdom. He promised him a kingdom. So quickly you begin to understand, at this point he's talking about the greater son of David. He's now talking about the Messiah. So now David is, is a messianic office. That's why you remember in the book of Matthew chapter 15 from verse 21 when the Messiah, now he leaves Israel. He goes to the occult cities of Tyre and Sidon, the, the devil worshipping cities where there was human sacrifice. When he reaches there, then a Canaanite woman runs to him and says, Oh, son of David, my Lord, have mercy. But he has been fighting for Israel to recognize that for a long time and call him son of David and call him my Lord and recognize that the messianic office David is a messianic office. Has arrived. They did not. But when he stepped out, that is one of the places where the mystery, you could say, begins from there. You know what mystery I'm talking about? The mystery that the Lord could stop the process within the 70 weeks of Daniel, could stop the process of installing the glorious throne of David, the Messiah, stop it, and bring people that were not mentioned, Gentiles, into the body, the body of Christ, suspend the program of installing the glorious throne of David and bring a people called the body or a new man, if you will, the church, and then rapture her out before he continues the, the 70 weeks. That is the mystery that he's talking about, about, right? And when you see that, you begin to understand, now this is sensitive. This is going to bring your attention to time and the urgency with which you are sitting here. You must go back and prepare the church. Because he's saying he has promised David a glorious throne. An eternal throne with an eternal king. You remember the kingdom of the rock that crushes all. Here he's talking about the millennial reign of the Christ. The bridging kingdom. The kingdom that will bridge from this Jerusalem here with a thousand years of Christ into the eternal Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. So now, we, I think we are now at a place, right? Because now, when we go back to the timeline, now you'll understand it even better. So now, he has promised David a throne, a glorious throne on which the Messiah will sit. And so he has suspended where, at what point did he suspend the program? Suspend the program for restoring. This is just introduction before you start the message of the rapture. There's another point at which you could say he suspended the, the, he suspended the, 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 the restoring. Let me just be very clear on this. All the covenants were meant for Israel. Including the new covenant. If you want to know, you read the book of Jeremiah 31. Even the new covenant was meant for Israel. Only when Israel refused to recognize the Messiah. And I'm bringing this step by step to you that you may understand the urgency of preparing now. Because something is about to happen. My prophecies, my words have put Israel already in the news right now. In a terrible state. You remember Daniel 70th week? Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. He says there will be a peace treaty when pen, touch paper, the, the broker, the mediator, we're going to see him today very well. We're going to see that very well today. The mediator 
when he puts pen to paper, then the tribulation begins. The seven years begin. The last week begin. Hallelujah. And so, it's very important you understand this. That the conditions required for the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation, to start are the following. Number one, there must be the state of Israel formed because that prophecy Gabriel was giving when they were in Babylon. Right? They were they, 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 totally destroyed. There, there was no Israel there. Total destruction. So there must be a state, the gathering back. That has now happened. There is a country called Israel. I just came from there recently talking to the leaders there, right? Oh yes. So there is now one condition is fulfilled. 1948, Israel, the end time began, you know, they began to regather. I know all the details. Hallelujah. Because I work very close with some of the organizations there. The Zionist organizations. I work very, very close to them. So I know even the Jewish Congress that took place in, in, in Basel, in, uh, in Switzerland, when now it was agreed, they were debating, should we start the state now, go buy the land and start bringing people back, or should we wait for the Messiah to come? And so there were those two competing schools until today. If you go to the ones called the Haredim, Hasidim, who tend to be actually my friends, the ultra-Orthodox, if I go there, they are the ones who come to me normally. It's amazing also. So, but, but if you go to the Haredim, the Hasidim, who are the ultra-Orthodox, they did not believe that it was time to set up the state. Until the Congress that took place in Basel, I think it was in 19... If I, don't, I, I don't know, was it 1930-something? There was a big uh, Jewish Congress that took place in Basel. It's when they said, no, we, let, we must now go and start settling there and start bringing people back. Then it became a big fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Because now 1948, you have the state established, right? So that's one of the conditions, because Gabriel is giving that 70 weeks from captivity when there is no state here. They have now regathered back. They continue to do so. It's called Aliyah. Aliyah is to, to by the Jew, I, I, I work quite, uh, I'm a bit close to some of the agencies that do that. Aliyah is to move them from all over the world to back to Israel. Hallelujah. And so, now, you see, you see uh, very clearly, uh, very, very clearly, uh, now, uh, there is a state. You understand? Number two, Israel must be at war, in a severe war, and in a desperate need for peace. For there to be the need for a mediator. To put pen, the Antichrist, to, to broker peace. But if you look at your news, the prophecy I gave on Gaza, the prophecy I'm giving now on the Iran war coming, the reason I went recently to meet them and tell them, it's amazing. <laughs> In June, I took the, all the way from Sao Paulo, I rushed there, I did not even come here. To tell them there is a war coming with Iran. It's amazing the way the Lord just quickly set up the conditions. So if you look very carefully now, Israel is at war now. And Israel is in desperate need for peace right now. So when you watch your news, use your spiritual lenses now. Don't use the social media to look at news or to hear, develop your opinion and your position. Don't do that. That will push you to anti-Semitism. You cannot. Use the Bible. The Bible. So that when you understand prophecy and what is happening in the news, then you always be on God's side. So, what God loves, you love. What God chooses you, choose. You don't care about public opinions and the protestations going on all over the cities globally. You don't participate in that anti-Semitism. But now, what I'm saying is that those conditions are in place. So, if you look at that timeline, the, the timeline of the covenants that we're handling right now, this is what you'll see. You'll see that uh, at this point, so David is promised land, he is promised a great name, of course. Nathan is talking to David, the prophet of the Lord is talking to David. He is promised a throne, he is promised a kingdom. So that kingdom is the millennial kingdom. Now, look at this now. The mystery, I say it, is when God really stops the clock at the 69th week and brings in a people that were not talked about by Gabriel. That is serious. 
were not discussed. He now brings them in and they form the body when Israel rejects the Messiah. And then the Lord goes and then in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 15 he says the following uh, it's, uh, it's um, Hosea Hosea chapter 5 verse 15 he says the following he says that when they have rejected him he says then I will return to my pavilion to my tabernacle until they are born their guilt and seek my face in their misery they will honestly seek me so he's saying I am now leaving now look at this now he gave them a partial blindness he said, now, never mind, now you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And in this place he's saying, that now I am going, and I will not come back. So he went, he went up, I will not come back until in your misery you seek me. Meaning, in the great tribu- in, your, in the tribulation. That is when now, remember he comes to fight for them and they recognize, they weep like someone weeping over an only child, firstborn child, right? So he, that's what he was talking about, the tribulation. Now He said, now you will pass through it because of that. So if you got the timeline, you want to know where did he depart from? Where, where was the point of suspending the program for the glorious throne of David? Look at this now. Here, you will see that the Messiah was telling them all the time before he went to the cross. He was telling them who the Messiah is. He wants them to recognize him as the Messiah. He was busy telling them who the Messiah is. That they may recognize him. They refused. So, when he died, resurrected and ascended, then the disciples attempted to continue his ministry continues say, this same Jesus whom you have crucified, he has become the king, the Messiah, the Lord. They were telling, they, they continue the same ministry of telling Israel who the Messiah is. Until Peter and Stephen over there. Now, Acts chapter 7, until Stephen is stoned. When Stephen is stoned, then the Lord finally just suspended. Then now, Hosea chapter 5, Verse 15. Now you'll not see me again. Until you go through the tribulation. Because after Stephen is stoned, now the young man Paul, it went out now. It came. It came out the Gentile world. Now Paul began to teach what the Christ has done. The grace. Are we together still? There's a bit of water there. Drink it please. Drink the water. My son. So very, very, very powerful. So listen to this now. So really... This, now look at this now. This is the place. Stephen is stoned. This is a place of suspension. So you can have this as the church age now to the Gentiles. Now the age of the grace now. You can, you can, I mean, it starts from Pentecost, yes, but uh, now the grace is being taught. The Gentile world, the body comes now. The new man. And then, Look at this now. Over here. The body is taken away. And look what goes on there. Three and a half years, three and a half years. He said, in your misery you'll you'll look look for me. Look at this now. He's saying that during that time, he is restoring Israel. If you get to read the book of Romans chapter 11, he says, "When, when now the fullness of the number of the Gentiles has arrived, then now all Israel. All Israel means the following. You have to go to Zechariah chapter 13, verses 7 and 9. When you say that two thirds will be struck down. You know, in the Holocaust, it was one out of every three. Now it will be worse. Two out of every three will be slaughtered. And then the one third will pass through fire, refine them like silver and gold. So there you get now the full number. The number that says all, then Romans chapter 11 verse 25, then all Israel will be saved. That, that is the number. The one third. Why? Because of rejecting the Messiah. Now has to pass through it. The Lord in a tremendous vision, look at this now, in a tremendous vision, the Lord has given me a long stem. 
with a red rose with petals open, but under the red rose are green leaves, serrated. I even see them now, serrated leaves. Under the red rose. But the entire stem is naked, except it has thorns. Thorns of the rose. So the Lord gave me, and then I went to a place where the patriarchs were seated. Then he told me, he began to introduce them one by one. I think I entered glorified. When I entered there, I was totally glorified because I saw all of them cover their heads in that vision. I must have entered glorified. When I entered glorified, they all quickly covered their heads. And then the Lord by voice began to introduce one by one. This is so and so. Don't you remember? Don't you remember Miriam here? Don't you remember who? And then the Lord, they would open and go back in time. Then I would recognize, I would recognize. And then he told me, take this rose and give it to them. It was so painful to give them. Look at this now. In that tremendous, tremendous dream, it was painful to give them until when I tried to give them, I laid it on them. And it fell on them like this. It had stones. So, beloved enemies, so-called now. Beloved enemies. Meaning, the love for Israel is unquestionable. But now I have to pass through this. You understand? The thorns, the misery. Hallelujah. So now, why have I brought this up? I brought it up because it has relevance to the rapture. The message I want to share tonight. He's saying that for all this time, he has been spending time with the mystery, the body, then this new group of creation, new group of people. This new group of people, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Any one of them who believes Christ, they become the body. Are ah, we together? So, he has now sent us to announce the end of the church age. And he's speaking again and again and again and again about the coming of the Messiah. Tell them I'm coming. Tell them I'm coming. Tell them he's coming. Meaning it's urgent. Meaning we are sitting very close to this happening. That's why you are here. The rapture. He wants to begin to roll out the process. To finish now the 70 years. He has already spent two days plus. More than two days. Two thousand years plus. He has spent a long time with the Gentile church. Now he wants to start the process of the promises he gave David. The glorious throne. He can't wait for the millennial reign. Because we must move to the eternal kingdom. Hallelujah. And that's why you can tell in your news that there is an urgency for you to prepare the church. Because in the way the things I speak quickly fulfilled, quickly fulfilled, he tells you, oh, just a moment. He is in a hurry to establish the glorious throne of the Messiah. Why? Because the Messiah already died and did an excellent job. He's waiting for the glorious throne. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, you would, you would hear him saying that for the glorious throne set before him, he accepted to die even a humiliating death on the cross. So the Messiah, he wants to recompense the Messiah. He wants to recompense him. You see, it's going to be in verse 2, but anyway, we don't have much time on that. We're on the timeline. So, he endured the cross, he says. The scorning of the cross. So you can imagine how much the Father has sent us to let you know that the church age is about to end. The rapture will happen and the church will not be on the earth again. You're going to see it tonight, in tonight's message up to midnight. You'll see this. When the rapture happens, the church is gone. That's why I have come to you. If you are really the church, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, then you prepare properly and leave. Because after this, there is no church. As we are going to see, there is the tribulation saints. And even their type of worship, their worship ordinances, their worship experience is totally different. They must be slaughtered to worship, my Lord. Aye. That is not you. Why should the righteous judge of righteousness take those who have accepted Christ and mix them together with the Christ-rejecting world and put them to, to the same sword? Not at all. Hallelujah. 
That's why he has sent me to tell you to prepare quickly and leave. Whatever it is you have been enjoying in your country as you preach, oh, you, there's these people giving you some good money, doing this thing with you, doing what in the church. He's saying, no, 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 please. Right now, suspend those things and focus on preparing a holy church for entry into the holy kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Because he wants to fulfill the covenant he gave David. So God promised David that the Messiah would come from his lineage and through Judah, the tribe of Judah. It's an unconditional covenant because the Lord does not require an obedience on the part of David. We have many scriptures but won't read them here. And then you have the new covenant. So I think this sets up a good standard for you to understand the urgency with which the message of the rapture, the coming of the Messiah is being driven. And especially the imminency of his coming. Hallelujah. That you may understand that there are some promises. If you look at those covenants with David, the covenants with Abraham, there are some of them that have been fulfilled already. But there are some that are not yet fulfilled. So you cannot be in the church age comfortable and settled and thinking it will run on forever. Not at all. There are some covenants with David, with Israel, that he has not completed. And he wants now to go and complete them. Hallelujah. And bring the kingdom, right? So the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 25, as we finish, he says the following. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, 25 says, Then the end will come when he will hand over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. Then he says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under foot. The Lord wants to complete this. Hallelujah. So I think we are now in a better place to begin tonight's message. Are you in a better place? Hallelujah. So I'll begin sharing with you the tremendous vision of the Lord for tonight. But I have a, a prophecy alert that I raised out and I put in the web here, which I'm going to focus on tonight. For a long time, I have wanted to have time so I can be able to teach this, to, to, to unveil it really to the church, to give its translation to the church. This says prophecy alert, uh, prophecy alert, the Messiah is coming. If somebody would scan it, one day would have put it on, uh, on the screen. But it says prophecy alert, the Messiah is coming. Then it says vision of May, for, May 4th, the year 2014. And in this vision, you hear me talking about, I will describe it here. But this is a prophecy alert. Can somebody scan it and put it on the screen? Is it possible? Thank you. Just give it some. Can you take it and scan it and put it on the screen? Right now. Because otherwise I'm going to finish describing it here. So I would like you to put uh, the timeline on. Just put it on the screen right away. Prophecy alert. That was May 4th, the year 2014. For a long time, I've wanted to give translation of that vision, but I'm going to give it today. I thought I would do it when I come back from Taiwan, but because we have this tremendous guest from India, I will do it today. And then Australia has joined you here, I'm told. So and then uh, it will be very powerful to bring it to you, to bring to the world through this engagement with you. If it takes one second, do it in one second. If not, you just put the scripture and then I'll move on. Okay, so I'll describe this now. I'll describe this in front of the camera. This is the vision that is going to form a foundation, a basis for our conversation tonight. On that May 4th, 2014, all of a sudden I found myself in the vision of the Lord. Everybody focusing on me right now. And in that vision of the Lord, my daughters from India, just give me eye focus, my daughters. Thank you. In that vision of the Lord, I found myself in the vision standing on the earth. This time he did not lift me up, but I'm standing on the earth. As I'm standing on the earth, then all of a sudden, he made me look up. And when I looked up, I saw as, this, as if I'm looking at the sun, the soul, the sun, radiating in its brilliance, in the greatest brilliance of his radiance. Maybe the midday sun or something like that. And so, however, as I continued looking up, 
I quickly realized just a moment, hey, why? If it's the sun, then it's the sun without the reddish part of the, 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 the light. Pure white. And then, I wondered, because the, the, red, the rays were going to the ends of the horizon like this. Like this. As if I'm standing under a dome. That's when I began to question, is this really the sun? Then all of a sudden, by voice, he said, look, the Messiah is coming, but the church is not ready. Again, let me repeat this. By voice, he now spoke from heaven, God the Father. He spoke, he said, look, the Messiah is coming, and the church is not ready. But in my heart, he made me know, but the church out there, is, he was saying, out there is not ready. But the church out there. So in my heart he made me know, he's saying, but the church out there is not ready. Meaning, go unto them. So then, when he said so, all of a sudden, he made me turn a little bit left. And when I turned left, it was more like as if I'm standing, as if you are standing by the shore of a sea. And on the other side of the sea, it's as if there is a big rainstorm coming. Follow me on this now. Again, let me repeat this. In that vision, this is very important. And, and oh my Lord, there is a very powerful message on this. Just follow me on this tonight. Later I realize it's not the sun. Because the, the reddish rays are not there. It's just pure white. And it's radiant. It's unbelievable. But I'm seeing the rays are going in a pattern to the ends of the horizon. Again, meaning this event that is showing me when it does happen will affect the total, the entire earth. Nobody will escape this. When the rapture does take place, the impact, my Lord, will be total globe, global, my Lord. Now, now you understand. Because the rays were going to the ends of the horizon. Ends of the horizon. So I was like, I'm under a dome. I said, like, well, how is the sun doing this? And then I quickly realized, no, this is not the sun. And then the voice spoke at that instant. He said, look, the Messiah is coming, but the church is not ready. But in my heart, he made me know, but the church out there is not ready. The church out there is not ready. As in you go to them and tell them. So in that instant, he makes me turn left. And when I turn left, I'm like I'm standing at a seashore. You are standing at a seashore. The sea is here. And as though there is a storm, a huge rainstorm in the evening, something about to happen on the other side of the lake, of the sea. So it's kind of greenish, that kind of thing, right? And then all of a sudden, look at this now. All of a sudden, the other side, it did... You know the way lightning does on the other side, right? Are we together? Is somebody following me on this? This is very powerful. Just make sure you catch this. So he's saying that I'm standing there. I've turned left. Now I'm like I'm standing at the seashore. He has said, look, the Messiah is coming, but the church, the church out there is not yet ready. Follow me on this. By voice. And now when I turn, it's as if I'm at the seashore and on the other side of the sea, it's about to rain, a big rainstorm, such that you normally see streaks of lightning there, right? Doing on the other side, right? So it just did pitted like that. When the Bible says in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible is the only book that must be fulfilled to the letter, accurately. <laughs> Hallelujah. That was it now. So that is what he meant in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. So now, it did like a streak of lightning on the other side, did it like that, like that. When it did that lightning, I found myself on the dust, on the soil. And I'm rolling and weeping and groaning and grinding my teeth and, and groaning from deep inside the heart. I was like that, groaning and crashing and rolling on the dust like that, groaning and crashing my teeth. To make me feel how those that will miss the rapture will feel. I have always wanted to share this with the church globally. I've never had time. I thought I would go to some of the missions I was preparing to now handle this. I've not handled it for a long time. Really, I've not handled it. I keep mentioning it. But I've not handled the true meaning of what it is. 
Because I think if I handle it tonight, there will be a big awakening. No. You are talking about those. He makes me feel like how those who will miss the rapture will feel. I think that is the caution. That's why the Lord, instead of saying, look, remember Enoch. He was taken up. Even you just prepare. No. He says, remember Lord's wife. That when he raises the caution, you may fear and not go there. Not go that direction. That's why the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus, more than anybody else ever, preached more about hell than anyone else. That it may raise a caution. He could have just said, let's preach heaven. Even in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, you know what it says? It says, it's better for you to go and attend a funeral than to attend a wedding. You, yes. He's saying that it's better for you to not to, to, to go and attend a funeral than to attend a wedding. Because if you go to a wedding, you just eat rice. Rice, rice, rice and chicken and meat and biryani. Just biryani, biryani and curd. And curd, you just eat it with curd. Hallelujah. And then, especially from, from uh, Paradise in Hyderabad. I love the biryani from Paradise. Hallelujah. Paradise Hotel in Hyderabad is the best biryani. Remember when Sharaf was the president of Pakistan? He used to order biryani from Paradise. They would ship it to him by flight, right? Hallelujah. To Pakistan, to Islamabad at that time. So I love the, Hyder- the Hyderabadi biryani, especially the one in uh, Paradise Hotel. Hallelujah. So now, this is serious. He's saying that it's better for you to attend a funeral because when you are seated there in the funeral and that coffin is there and somebody is lying there, it might provoke and invoke you to think about saying, how about if that was me? Would I be ready, have been prepared, ready to go meet my creator? Or what would be my destiny? Would I be going to heaven or hell? And it might cause you to repent. Than to go and just eat biryani, biryani and eat with, with card. No. He said no. Right. It's going to be very profound. It's on the screen. Yeah, the prophecy alert is over there. Thank you. That is over there. Thank you. Very powerful. Look, the Messiah is coming. That is the prophecy alert. But put the camera back to me now. He's saying the following. He's saying that this is serious. And thank you for zooming my chest. This is very serious. That's what he's saying. He's focusing on me, please. Focus on me now. He's saying, I have turned this way and like there is a storm on the other side of the sea. Then there is a lightning. Something like lightning on that side. Meaning when the Bible says in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, in the closing. I don't know how you can calculate the nanoseconds. I know now we are dealing with nano. That is the smallest time possible. It is equal to the time when the light strike your retina and bounce back. You can imagine moving at the speed of light, strike your retina and come back. That is very high speed. We can't quantify. It becomes a fraction of nanoseconds. Hallelujah. Nano, because I am aware of nano, nanotechnology. I know even the medication now in drug design and discovery... We are working on nano. These are small molecules. We are working. <laughs> we are not working. I'm not working on it. <laughs> but I'm saying, we are talking about those drugs that can go through the blood-brain barrier. Small proteins and DNA molecules, right? They are more effective. Without cytotoxicities, knockout liver, ward loss, hair, and all this in chemo, right? But I'm saying this. There is nano in time also. So you wonder how small that time is. So you cannot even tell me that at that moment you will prepare. 
is not possible. It is not possible. So, looking like this, all of a sudden, like lightning there, next, guess, did, did I say, okay, now go down on, on, on your belly. Not at all. I just found myself. And I'm rolling down, gnashing my teeth, and groaning and weeping so bitterly from the inside of my soul. And grinding, literally, physically, physically grinding my teeth. To the extent that when I woke up, the first thing I did, I ran to the mirror. Because I thought I crushed my teeth. Then I checked the phone, my teeth were not crushed. In other words, he's saying that that day people will groan and roll and they will even crush physically, lose teeth, crush their teeth. The level of agony and pain and suffering and loss that they will incur when they miss the rapture. That is what I want to handle today. The great caution that the Lord raises there, that is what I want to handle tonight. Hallelujah. Because Jesus preached about hell. All the time, hell, hell. Even in India, when you go, just preach, hell, hell, hell. Be careful. Don't go to hell. Warn them. Then they will not go. And that's why. Quite amazing. I have seen the church taken up. For example, January 15th, 2017. And in that vision, he lifts me up above the earth and then he makes me look left and down and I see the exact moment when the church leaves the ground and they come and they are glorified. They have two things. They have glorious bodies and glorious white garments. And when they come to my level, they turn a little right and when they do so, they cross right in front of me here. And when they cross right in front of me, there are some things the Lord wanted me to see so I can come to India and tell India and tell also uh, 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 Australia uh, how w- w- the message of God. How that day will be. And so, and they really go up, but in front of me, what do I see? In front of me on that January 15th, 2027, in front of me as they cross, I see the super glorious, finest linen, bright and clean, the white garment, which the church is supposed to prepare. That is the message of the hour. And he says, if you look at the book of, on the screen there, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter, uh, we have Revelation chapter, uh, ch- chapter 19, verse 8. You can start from verse 6. I don't know whether we have time. Real quick, rush it out, out there. It says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing water, like loud peals of thunder shouting. Shouting what? Saying, look at that. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting. Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty, He reigns. No, that's very powerful. Do you know why He's saying so? Can can I just give that? So He's saying, That when that day does arrive, it is as though the most historic celebration in heaven takes place. The word is historic. Meaning one that has not happened before. Because he's saying, like a grand multitude, like the roar of rushing water, loud peals of thunder, all put together. And they were shouting. It was unbelievable noise. But when he listened carefully, they were saying, as if that day makes the affirmation, confirms and affirms and certifies and rubber stamps that surely indeed, now we know that the Lord Almighty reigns. Why? Because you are finally entered. Do you know why he, he, he says, he believes, he believes that day really God reigns because you have now made your entry inside? Let me explain to you why. Because in the manner of this celebration, verse 6, Revelation 19. We are, remember, we are on the journey to the garment. I want to describe the garment, the hour for preparing the garment of righteousness in India now. The hour for preparing righteousness in the church. You are the people that prepare the garment that will receive the Messiah. Hallelujah. But the reason there is this kind of celebration, I'll give an example. When, let's say you are going home, and you arrive home, 
and your family or your church, they celebrate so thunderously. Some are falling down and crying and rolling on the soil. <sighs> and it's chaotic celebration. They're, they're rolling, they're crying, they're, 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 they're dancing and the tears are flowing because you have come back home from Kenya. What does that tell you? They say, eh, you might even stop and ask In Swahili, the word is kwani. Do you mean? You understand? It says, kwani, what did you think? Why, why are you celebrating that? Did you think I was not coming back? And then you understand their situation before you came. So when you see this kind of historic celebration, like the grand multitude, the great multitude, the roar of rushing waters, loud peals of thunder, shouting uncontrollably historic. Why? Because the day, you'll see in front there, because the day of the wedding of the Lamb has come, and you say his bride has made herself ready. If they are going to make such a historic celebration, because you and the church in India have entered heaven, then let me explain to you. That means, for a long time when they were looking at the church globally, the Lord saw as if the devil was winning. Except for knowing how everything is going to end. But when heaven was looking at the church, look at this now. They see the nail pierce on the Messiah in heaven. I remember when one time, <laughs> this is tremendous. The, okay, JJ, you are sleeping so much. I'm li- We are live. Can you take drinking water, coffee, whatever it is? Pump coffee, water there, just drink it and whatever. You are sleeping so much. So much, so much, JJ. Yeah, yeah, Kilimani needs this. So look at this now. It is amazing the level of celebration. Why? Because when they look at the Messiah right now, they can see what is man-made on him. The nail pierce. And I will give the example here. One time in 2003, when the three of them came to me, God the Father, I know, I know, I know, it's just so tremendous to say such a thing. But I must say it. God the Father God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And what happened is, first of all, the cloud of glory, the cloud, the cloud you see I called, went and filled the hallway. The hallway was totally full of the cloud. So I am asleep in the master, but I'm able to see that the cloud has entered the hallway and radiant. And of course, you know, because they have come to speak with me, and then uh, the there are things they allow me to see in the cloud that they have come. Hallelujah. And then the gentleman, I don't know how much I can share with you, whether you're a young church. <laughs> Let me just share because it's not for me, it's yours, right? And so what happens? At the door of the master, the hallway, there is the hallway. And the other rooms there, but came direct. Then, what, what a gentleman. The left hand is the one he put on the wall like this. On the wall like this. And when he put there, so I could see the design of the garment, like this, the golden garment, but look, there is this. There is this here. So it is golden, but there there is like as if embroidered with shiny diamonds. And then when he moved his hand I thought it was a dust of gold that was pouring. Because the glory covered the whole world. But the hand when he moved I thought it was a dust of gold pouring. Right? Only when I checked very carefully it was not. It was the hem of his garment. There is gold string, very fine strings of gold. I noted they end at the same place all. So when he moved, that's why they moved on the wall and they have small balls of gold. They are ending with small, wonderful, fine balls of gold. So that's why when he moved, the glory covered the whole wall when he put his hand. But when he moved, what I thought was fine dust was actually strings of gold from the garment. That's the hem of the garment. And then this V shape, this shape here, triangular here, with now shinier diamond like gold or diamond embroidery like embroidered. And so when he moved, but why am I bringing this in? I knew it was his left hand 
Because he covered the wall. But why am I bringing? Because I saw the nail pierce. Remember I'm sleeping there. And the hand is like this. On the wall. They are still in the hallway. Until the, you, they ask. Until you allow. On the door. And so. I saw the nail pierce. When I looked at the nail pierce, it shocked me. I wept very bitterly for many months. Even now, I still, when I remember, I weep. The wound appeared to be fresh. So I was very shocked. I said, Ay, why is the wound not healed yet? So what shocked me is that, hey, maybe we may never know the real cost of salvation. Maybe the... In- they remain like that. We don't under, I, don't, I didn't understand that. So, let us be careful. I know the eternal body does not perceive pain. But the marks became eternal, his identity. Remember in the sky again, shown the nail pierce first, right? The eternal identity. Hallelujah. So now, I want us to walk this tremendous journey. To look at the things that will stop the church. The things that will stop you from entering the glorious kingdom of God. The the rapture. Being taken up in the rapture. What is that? What is that dramatization of May 4th, the year 2014? That entire dramatization to fall down and roll in the dust and grinding teeth and groaning and crying bitterly. What is that? What is the Lord trying to say to the church? What is the caution the Lord has? Hallelujah. So I want us to begin right away by simply looking at the things that will cause the church to fail to enter. Let's just begin from there. Step, baby steps. And then I will enter the message. Right? Hallelujah. Somebody put for us there the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 and 31. The things that will cause the present day church to fail to enter. Again I say it on the screen please. Thank you very much. From this point on we have only the scriptures on the screen. So that now everybody globally focus on the screen. Hallelujah. So he says, we read, I'm going to read here. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is such a statement right there before we continue up to 31. I am talking about a generation that has thrown the cross out, the message of the cross, and taken unto themselves another gospel, another message. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a generation that has felt that the message of the cross is so cumbersome in Spanish, they say duro, meaning very heavy. Cannot, it has surpassed this, the modernism of the earth has surpassed it. And that the Christian today, the Christian believer, is a sophisticated worshipper. Whose time, even in the house of the Lord, is well checkered, is well choreographed, it is well structured. You're, they have to come in quick. There is a billionaire in Hyderabad. He wants to walk in there. And quickly when he walks in there, he wants you to give him that false prophecy. He put down he, whatever lacks for you there. And he says, I have a meeting at 2 p.m. Just bless me. And quickly steps out. He goes in the, the feel good factor. The goosebumps. So he's saying that the generation has abandoned the message of the cross, the original gospel. You remember the first church that the Lord loved so much 
They preached Christ Jesus crucified and Christ Jesus resurrected all throughout. And if I have time one day to, to bring that message to you, the, 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 the entire of what the first church did and why he's saying this church must go back to preaching the blood and the cross. Jesus crucified, Jesus resurrected. is because that is where the power of the gospel is. And he's saying that at this time they have found a lighter gospel, a more modern gospel, the gospel of prosperity. And he's saying this is going to be the greatest undoing in the church. Is somebody hearing me or not? (laughs) If there is something going to cause the church not to be raptured, it is that one. Because First of all, how do they get born again properly? Yesterday we saw the characteristics. We saw the qualities of the church that I saw taken up in glory. And we saw among other things, among things, that church must be born again properly. But now, listen to me now, senior pastors with Bible colleges from India, listen to me now. How then can you get born again, be born again properly, if the message is already wrong? Do you understand now? Do you understand why later on in December 8, the year 2021, he shows me a vision where he lowers a wooden pulpit from heaven and he tells me to replace the one in the church today? The modern one, glass, sophisticated, convenient, expedient. You understand? Beautiful in terms of the worldly beauty. To replace it with one of wood now, wood. The cross now, the original cross. Ancient in design. Because The institution of the pulpit is where the message of salvation is being preached. The gospel. But how can they be born again properly if the message is already wrong? How? That's why this is now critical. I want us to begin first things first. That because they thought it not wise, to continue with the original gospel. They are going to miss the rapture in the church, my Lord. And tell me, this gnashing of teeth and rolling here, tell me about it. Is this atheists that were rolling here? No! These are Christians. The atheists, atheists, I gave you the vision. I've said it globally. The atheists, remember when the rapture happens in one of the visions, then the Lord takes me to a high, high-tech city. I mean, it was daytime in that part of the world. It's a kind of a high-tech park where there are a lot of uh, uh, the, the, the tech companies there. And he shows me, and they are running. They are not using elevator. They are running through the stairs. I even see this lady wearing a jeans uh, trouser and a, a, a grayish t-shirt. These are computer people, IT. Many of them, they are running from their offices for many floors. They are not using elevators. And, they are, and the Lord makes me run with them. Running downstairs. And they are saying, Oi, 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 Jesus has come. Jesus has come. Oi. So they are not saying the rapture has happened. They are saying Jesus has come. Then These are not Christians. And they come out to an area. There is a general area. The tall buildings and there is a general parking area and grass area where people sit at lunch and so forth. They are all there, there. Some are holding their hands. Hey, wait, so and so left. Because in their office, some people left cloth, watch, shoes, hat, tie, socks. It will be a day and a half. I know that when I prophesied coronavirus, I said there is a big day coming, when the, a, a, a tremendous day, when the Lord is going to shut it down. He will just go ahead and shut it down, to shut down the earth. People say, how, how, what is that? And when it came, there was a real shutdown. I don't know why he's showing that and I'm talking about shutdown. There, there, there is a real shutdown. There was a global lockdown. You remember? Bigger and better than what was in Egypt, by far. People in their houses, they were knocking saucepans. You remember in India? Knocking saucepans, France. Knocking saucepans. And played the windows, balcony. Not allowed to come out. Not allowed to come out. I know when it was fulfilled four years later, it was really bad, right? 
But now I'm announcing an even greater, bigger day of lockdown. Shut down, my Lord. The day when the church is taken. The day when people will mourn until all the tears in their bellies will dry up. When their loved ones have gone. When a church, a pastor will see that some of his sheep is gone, he has remained. He will roll and gnash his teeth and mourn until his tears become blood. What is the Lord saying there? So let's just go through this scripture up to verse 31 and see where the present day church has missed the mark. He is going to miss the rapture if she does not reform. That's why the Lord sent me to bring repentance across the nations. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Just right there alone before we move. He's saying, why the world, when the world is caught up in loss, there are people perishing. Majority of the earth is heading to hell, is in total darkness. But he's saying that, thank God, there are some people who are being born again properly. They are being saved on a daily basis. First things first. I would have wanted to look at the other half of the glass the other three quarters of the glass or so, which is empty. But I can't miss seeing at least there are some people. He said, while the brothels are open, and the alcohol discotheque, nightclubs are open, and people are perishing in the whole world, he said, however, there are some people who are busy taking the gospel, and they are being saved, my Lord. Hallelujah. That is what he's saying. And then he says, in verse 19, he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Today, they tend to act wiser than the Lord. You tell him, Well, I, I want you to receive Christ. He said, What? I? Yes, I need you to receive Christ because it's important. Well, why have you come to me? Why have you come, targeted me? Why not somebody else? I said, no, because God loves you. He died for you. Okay, I know that. And so, well, why should I receive Christ? He said, no, because there is a day coming when God will judge sin. There is a day coming of judgment. Oh, really? Judgment? What, 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 what? Do you believe God judges sin? Ah, God. Mm, no, you, you know, I'm not just that much religious. May I believe God is good all the time? No, 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 no. He, he will answer you like that. And then, and then, you say, how about sin? Will you repent and receive Christ today? Because God will judge sin. There's the day coming. Then he says, no, you see, for me, do you mean all these people in the world, God will kill them? He will, why should God just come and judge me for no apparent reason? Yeah, you ought to just come down on me, converge on me and judge me like that. And you're saying, kill me. And burn me with fire. Why? Are you trying to put psychological pressure in, on me? Say, no, I'm, I'm trying to help you. Say, no, 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 I don't need your help. God is going, no, God is going to judge you. No, no, me, I believe God is good. I pay my taxes. I don't jump the red light in the streets. And, uh, and you know, I, 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 I don't interfere with people. I don't go and attack people. I love people. I get along very well with people. Why should he judge me for no apparent reason? No, he will judge sin because all have fallen. He said, no, 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 that, that's your opinion. That, that's not mine. So today they reason their way out. Today they present themselves wiser than the Lord. And he says here, for it is written, I will ashamed the wisdom of... Verse 19 is where we are. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. And he goes on to say, where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
And then he says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through his wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Aye. Jews demand signs and Gentiles, Greeks, look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom or the highest wisdom of man. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. Remember even the church in Philadelphia. He said, I know you are weak. Then in that condition of weakness, you will depend on the Lord fully. Everybody is in the gym trying to build muscles to be strong. Nobody wants to show weakness. And yet the Lord celebrates a weak church as the church that enters glory. That I know you are weak. But you have not abandoned my name. You have not renounced my word. Serious. So he goes and says, God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Verse 31. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Hallelujah. He's saying that they have abandoned the gospel of the cross. That to them is not wisdom, doesn't doesn't crank, doesn't connect any sense. And he's saying that is the reason the present day church will miss the rapture if they don't repent. Hallelujah. Number two, second Timothy chapter three, one and five. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, continue, we don't have time, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, lovers of good, not lovers of good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of religion in the church. Another religion in the house of the Lord. Having a form of godliness, but denying his power. You make sure you have nothing to do with these people. Having another religion in the house of the Lord. If you go to Matthew 7, 21, 23, 23 ends up saying, to tell you the truth, I get away from me, workers of iniquity. I do not know you. They were in the house. He that knows omnipresent, omniscient, he knows everything. He saw them in the house, but he did not know what they were doing there. They even claimed to have had ministries there. From verse 21 he says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, meaning they are born again, they call him Lord. Not anyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those, not anyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So when you look at this scripture here, 
It should really worry you as a church in India. Or the church globally. In Kenya, everywhere. Tuned in all over, up to New Zealand. Canada tuned in here. It should worry you because this prophecy is given by Jesus himself. It is in red. Meaning it must be fulfilled. He's saying that there are two churches or congregation in one church. That one is the genuine church. The other is not. He's saying going to church every Sunday cannot take you to the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. You say, oh, what do you mean? Man of God, what do you mean? In India, we're trying to get everybody to go to church. I say, no, of course, that's all right. But why are you saying not everybody? He said, but he says it there. He's saying that there is a dangerous form of salvation. So dangerous, you are seated in the house, you think you are going to heaven, and you are not. No wonder the rolling and the gnashing of teeth. And then he say, go tell them I've shown you that. Rolling and gnashing of teeth. He's saying that there is a dangerous form of salvation where people think that they are walking towards heaven and yet they are on the wide road. And the devil is a liar. When you are walking on the narrow road, you know very well on the narrow road, they keep showing you that heaven, 200 kilometers to go, heaven, 150 to go, the narrow road. But on the white road, the devil has put the same signs. Heaven, 200 kilometers to go. He did not put hell, 200 kilometers to go. He knows if he put hell, thou runneth, thou fleeth from him. In the white road, he has put signposts, just be comfortable, heaven is 200 kilometers to go. He's saying there is a dangerous form of religion in the church. Whereby people think they are worshipping Jesus. People think they are right standing with the Lord. People think when they are blessed they have so much money. It is God's favor. It is God's love. God is with him. God is blessing him. And yet the devil also can give you money. So that it may easier be easier for a camel to enter through the eye of the needle than you to enter heaven. Hallelujah. He's saying there is a dangerous form of salvation where people today have turned the house into an entertainment center. Where women buy new clothes and that Sunday she wants to show a new cloth. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You know it very well. She will now that day, that Sunday she will walk in front of the pastor like this to go to the other side to look for a hymn book the other end. Or to greet a friend. There is a dangerous form of salvation whereby when you have come from the USA, you have been there maybe for one year so that you can, your green card can mature. Now you come back to Hyderabad. Now you have come back to the church and the pastor is there. You want people to know that you have come back from USA. You are now a green card holder. And now you come with your suspenders. You are even speaking and you are trying to pull your English and you are walking with sharp shoes and you are walking ta. Ta, ta, ta. You know, you have some, sometimes you remove your jacket, put there. You just walk around trying to greet people. You, you, you want them to know, you want them to smell your perfume, my Lord. He says, there is a dangerous form of salvation in the house of my Lord. Where people are thinking they are on the way to heaven. The same church, same cross on the house, same signpost, same pews, same Bible, same hymns, same worship songs. But as they worship, the heart, the heart, the heart is away. The heart is away. It's about the heart, my son from India. It's about the heart. Om Tima in Kiganda. Om Woyo. The heart. Hallelujah. It is serious. Corazon in Spanish. He's saying there is a dangerous form of salvation whereby false prophets are at the pulpit and they are giving the people prophecies that are sweet to the flesh.
And they are not rebuking sin because the congregation is modern in Hyderabad such that when you rebuke, she will not come back. She will go to your enemy's church. That's what he's saying. I'm simply talking about the things that the things that will stop the church from being glorified, from entering the rapture. Why? The Lord shows me the church that failed to enter. Step by step, right? Hallelujah. And he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. This is just the introduction. I have not begun the message. The message, not yet. And there's so much writing and scripture, by the way, tonight. We're going to midnight tonight. And he says there, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up with the sound doctrine of the cross and the blood. That a time will come when people will not put up with the sound doctrine of repentance and holiness. Repent. What should, why should I repent? What have I done? No, I repented many years when I received Christ. My pastor has never told me to repent. You are now telling me to repent. I said, okay, but uh, so you are born again? Oh yes, I'm born again. So, okay, now, now let's go step by step. Uh, do you believe that God judges sin? No, that, that's obvious. My pastor preaches that a lot. And so, then I want to ask, have you received the Holy Spirit when you became born again? He said, uh, yes, I received. I mean, I'm full of it. I mean, I'm, 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 I've been filled. But the Holy Spirit did not tell you that that dress is immoral? He did not tell you that? He's saying there is a dangerous form of salvation where pastors are pushing people. Can you put the prophets of God walking on the glory stretching people? There is a dangerous form of salvation where pastors are physically pushing people down and they are saying that is the Holy Spirit. Look at this. And I said, I'm going to, if you listen to the sound bites, I'm going to walk by you and the glory of the Lord will depart me and touch you. He's saying, there is a dangerous form of salvation where miracles are being sold at market price. And blessings are being sold at market price. At the highest bidder. If you come with $5,000, you can see that profit in what they call express line. But if you have, if, let's say you are poor and you have only $500, right? You are a humble person with maybe $1,000, you are humble. They say, no, follow the line. If you want, I can show you where the $1,000 line is. But I can also show you where the $500 line is. Aye! He's saying there is a dangerous form of salvation in the house of the Lord my God. And the people there are thinking that they are going to heaven. Nobody rebukes their sin. Nobody tells them they need now to make sure that they hearken unto the Lord. That they are righteous. That they are holy because the Messiah is coming. They are being told, touch it, claim it. He's saying that there is a dangerous form of gospel that is horizontally focused Focusing the church and the sheep of Christ to the world that they may stay here and this become their permanent abode. And yet you know that the Lord said that this world ain't our home. It is not our home. Hallelujah. Can you put that scripture? It says Romans chapter 1, 18, 32. It says... Serious, blessed people. He's saying, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The pastors don't want to preach holiness. They don't want to rebuke sin because they say, no, 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 no. Why should I beat the sheep so brutally like that. And yet you do not know that when you don't rebuke them, you don't love them. Your role as a shepherd is to give them guidance. You should not be looking for public opinion for the whole church to love you. Not at all. 
You are independent. You are called by God. The Lord himself called you. And so, you are not supposed to be trying to please somebody. There is a dangerous form of salvation where politicians enter the church and they preach a gospel to entertain him, to soothe him. Leaders, business people with money when they come now. Oh, oh Asha, can you receive guests? Give the front seat. I want you to give the front seat to the widows and the orphans. Because that is the house of the Lord their God. And he says on verse 19, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, the invisible qualities of God, the invisible attributes of God, the holiness of God has been revealed. The communicable attributes of God, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So what excuse do you have for refusing to lead your sheep, the church, into holiness and righteousness? He said, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That is powerful. He's saying, Nobody has any reason to worship an idol. The idol worship you see in India is so, it, it is blatant for no reason. Because he's saying the creator Jehovah has revealed himself. Even through his creation. Enoch, Enoch did not have a Bible. But when he looked at the stars and the creation, he saw the greatness of God, the glory of God. The Bible even says the heavens declare his glory. JJ, you are sleeping again. Hallelujah. Have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So that people are without excuse. 21, we don't have time. He's saying, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They know God. But they have refused to honor God. And give him glory. And so he goes on to say. Although they claim to be wise. They became foolish. Look at this now. And exchange the glory of the immortal God. For images made to look like mortal human. Mortal human being. And birds. And animals and reptiles. 24. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. This is serious. He's saying that the worst that can happen is for the Lord to give you up. He's saying the worst, the best that can happen is for the devil to abandon you. The devil say, I give you up now. I have destroyed you enough. Now I give you up. I have finished you. Let me look for someone else. At least you run to the Lord. But he's saying the worst that can happen is God, your creator, to abandon you. And this generation have celebrated homosexuality. Verse 26. Verse 26, he also gives them up. Verse 28, he gives them up. All the way to 32. He says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even women exchange their mortal, their natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, for homosexuality and lesbianism. The generation we're in. This generation demands the pure gospel of the cross and the blood of Jesus. The gospel with efficacy and power. The gospel that can lift up a cripple in Ahmed Nagar and open blind eyes and lift up cripples in Mumbai. This generation needs the power of God. They are looking for power. They don't want political power in the church where a preacher is talking like a politician. Not at all. He's saying the time has come for us to return to the gospel with power. The gospel of the cross and the blood. Sit down, we don't have my time. Look at them walking in, in Mumbai. Look at that. 
for the first time. Tremendous cerebral palsy, my Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Very serious. Very mighty. He says, in Matthew 25, we don't have time, verses 1 to 13, they are the redeemed and the lost. They, they, those who want to go, you take them. We're about to take a short break, I guess, but just go, my daughters. The professor will take you. Take them right here, straight up here. Inside here. Thank you. Hallelujah. He's saying, in Matthew 7, 21, 23, there are two people there. There is the modern salvation of prosperity and the true salvation of the blood and the cross. Matthew 7, 21, 23. And he's saying, in Matthew 25, 1 and 13, he says, also there, they are the redeemed and the lost. The wise and foolish virgins. In Matthew 22 also, you are those who are wise, they are picked from the streets and they enter, but they are those that are busy. I have have oxen. I've just married a young wife. Please, I cannot come. I've bought a field. I've bought oxen. They are the redeemed and the lost. Serious stuff. He's saying, in Luke 12, 35 to 40, there are those who are perishing and those who are saved. He says, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamp burning. Like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately get and op- get to open the door for him. Look at that now. It is good for those. Those. The word is those. 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 Meaning there are two groups. I'm talking about the introduction, the preamble of this tremendous message here. When I saw the church taken and another church is rolling on the soil on the earth. The others are going into glory. They are celebrating They are going to enjoy the Lord. They are going for the wedding supper of the Lamb in the kingdom of God. They are going to have crowns and rule with Christ. And another church is rolling and gnashing teeth and groaning and weeping at the loss, destitution, dispossession. He's saying, Luke 16, 19 to 31, there is the redeemed and the lost. Where now Lazarus entered glory. And then the rich man who thought prosperity was God's favor, remained, he found himself in the lake of fire. And over there, I will handle that. That's a very big sermon. Because in that sermon, the Lord tells them, no, 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 no. Let them listen to the prophets of Yahweh down there. If they want to enter. Meaning, it's very powerful to obey the prophets of God. Listen to this. Meaning, listening to the prophets of God Almighty, the prophets of the Lord, listening to them is eternal life. And that's why he says in Genesis 3.15, he says, God has, there are those who are forgiven sins by God Almighty. And those not forgiven. There are two lineages there. They are the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. Of the woman you can start from Abel, come all the way to Enoch, you go to Noah, you go all the way down until you meet Christ. Of Cain, Cain you go all the way down, You the, 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 the wicked generation of Noah's days, and you go all the way down to Nimrod. You go all the way down until you meet the Antichrist. There is the redeemed and the lost. This is just introduction that I get started with you. Hallelujah. And so, 
He is saying in Matthew 7, 13, 14, before we take a short break, he is saying the following. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, eternal life, and many are walking there. There is the redeemed and the lost. Be careful with this vision here of the rapture, that some were taken and others remain rolling and gnashing teeth. I want to focus on those ones rolling gnashing teeth until midnight tonight. And he says, Colossians 3, 1 and 7, focus on heaven. Matthew 6, 19 to 21 is what I'm reading. And he says the following, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up unto yourselves treasures on the earth where moths and vermins destroy and where thieves break in and robber and steal. There are those that store up treasures in heaven and those storing up treasures on the earth inside the church. Oi. And in Matthew 22 that I mentioned briefly there, you can see very clearly that Jesus makes a public invitation for all people to enter heaven. The wedding feast is ready. He says, go bring everybody. And you see that John 14, 1 and 3, he goes to prepare a place for all people that would believe in him. Are you aware that right now, as I speak, there are mansions in heaven with your name? And those mansions, look at this. Those mansions are asking questions. They are asking the following question. They are asking, Pastor, Pastor from Hyderabad, are you aware that you have a reservation here, your name is at the door? Pastor, Pastor from Hyderabad, are you aware that up here, everything is ready for you? Pastor, Pastor, are you coming? Are you coming? Are you really coming? Are you coming? Are you coming home? Public invitation for you to go. Even the dinner tables have reservation, reserved, reserved. This is the Kumar family. This is the Anil Kumar family. This is the, the, the Sham Kishore family. This is which family? The, 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 the tables are reserved. This is, so he said, please, remember me with your prophetic tongue. <laughs> there is the Sanil family. <laughs> tables are reserved. There are no flukers. Get crushers. People enter through, entering through the back door. There is a garment required. The garment of righteousness. Let's move on. And he says you must wear that garment because if you look at the garment of the church right now, it's as though they are trying to use personal effort. So, when the Lord gives that prophecy a lot, and he says, some people will miss the rapture. I really want today to focus on the people that will miss that rapture. The rapture of the church. Those are the people I want to focus on today. I know for a long time I focus on those that will enter. But for a long time I also waited. When shall I give this message? Hallelujah. And he says, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 12. Are we ready? He says the following. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. What does he mean by that? The rapture of the church. The gathering of the saints to the Messiah. He's saying, we ask you brothers and sisters regarding that return of the Christ and being gathered unto him. We ask you brothers and sisters not to be easily unsettled or alarmed by the teachings alleged from us. There was false prophecy and impersonation in this time. 
There were false prophets in this time. That is amazing. And he's saying, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, even a counterfeit letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. He goes on to say, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. That is serious. He says, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This is good news, right? Do you know why it's good news? Because he's saying that at this time there will be a temple. Because right now there is Al-Aqsa Mosque. And the Dome of the Rock. Al-Aqsa is this way where they worship. The Dome of the Rock they don't worship there. That's where the rock where Abraham offered Isaac from. The foundation stone of the earth. The center of the earth is that one. So he says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. We're about to take a short break. And you know, you now know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. He's saying, that the power of lawlessness ever since the fall in heaven when the worshiper Lucifer fell and then that power of lawlessness went where? To the garden and then that power of lawlessness has been reigning on throughout but the Holy Spirit has been so excellent in holding him back. But listen to this now. Over time he raises a warning that in the latter days that power will increase. And he's oh, I would eat club for that. And he's saying that wickedness would increase, including in the house. Why is it important? That is the secret. By the way, it's called the secret. It's one of the mysteries. The mystery of lawlessness. There's another mystery of holiness. That is that, that he would be a virgin birth. That he would come to bring this tremendous salvation, the cross, and so forth. But this one is now the mystery of lawlessness. The reason the Lord raises that mystery and power of lawlessness is because he knows it would have an impact on Christian salvation and change destinies, destination of people in the church. It would increase until you would have 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 and 5, until you have 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. You will have now another gospel. You will have people masquerading as messengers of light, and yet they have come in another way to be able to sell something, get some what, sow a seed here, get what there, run with money at the foot of the apostle. He mentions a warning. About that lawlessness. Why? Because it would affect the church. Until the church would abandon the cross. And would now take a lighter gospel. A sweeter gospel. A gospel of prosperity. Aye. Serious. And he says. For the secret power. Again. For the secret power of lawlessness. Is already at work. But the one who, is, who holds it back will continue to do so until it's taken out of the way. That is the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Church that is being inhabited, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Church. Did you hear the word holy? Being inhabited by the Holy Spirit. The holy habitation of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, that when that church is lifted at rapture, the habitation is lifted. And then, even the Holy Spirit leaves, but God the Holy Spirit remains. This indwelling now ceases. He goes back to the way it was in the 69 weeks of Daniel, Old Testament. He becomes now localized. We're, we're going to see it in front of us here. And he goes on to say, we are reading up to verse 12, then the lawless one will be revealed. So you can see the increase in, law, in lawlessness. 
increasing, entering the church, the church now becoming a posted, becoming the Laodicean church, Laodicea. The worldly church, the fleshy church, the materialism, which is synonymous with this time. And then finally, in the tribulation, he increases like this. Do you remember the statue where Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were told to worship? That symbolized what is going to happen in the great tribulation. It talked about that image that would be put in the temple. And people are told, if you don't worship, you are killed. So it would become increased until in the great tribulation, the man of lawlessness himself revealed in the tribulation, and then he puts his image there. That's what he's saying. And, so, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be accordance with Satan's works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders to serve the lie. Hallelujah. And he says, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are doing what? Perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. So now, we are beginning to narrow down to the church that I saw rolling down. She rejects the truth. And I'm now moving with her. I'm going to walk a journey today here with you. I'm going to move with her into the tribulation and see what is there. And see if I can speak to her from there. Hallelujah. He's saying, when the rapture happens, when the rapture happens, and that church has missed it, then that rapture begins to serve as a warning, as a caution, alert. But let's continue up the end, verse 12, when you see the Lord sends a visitation. He sends a visitation for those who refuse the truth in this age. They enter. They refuse repentance in this age. They enter into the tribulation. They continue to refuse repentance there. As we're going to see later in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, 20, 21, they still don't repent. But because they love deception, they love eh, to come to sell me some oil, sell him some what? Because they love that. He sends them a visitation that they may believe the lie. That is unbelievable. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. We will take a short break. He says, and so that all that will be condemned who have not believed the truth and have delighted in wickedness may be judged. So you can see their identity. Have, no, have delighted in wickedness, have not believed the truth. But when the rapture happens and they enter into the tribulation, I want to walk with them there. That rapture now becomes a warning to them. All of a sudden now they know the people they knew went up, are not there. And all of a sudden they have just realized, just a moment, the Bible is true. And it's harsh there. We're going to walk this journey together tonight. But you are going to see how the wise ones will navigate in there. Because they are already Christians, they are rolling here, they will be left here. All of a sudden, the reality of hell becomes real. And he says, those who dismiss the rapture prophecy, the announcement of the rapture, who say it is unthinkable, and they don't believe it, when the rapture happens, all of a sudden, a lot. They wake up, caution, they fear. He's talking about the people rolling down here. When they were being told, the rapture is coming. The Messiah is coming. They did not believe it. And he says, like in the days of Noah, Genesis 6, 7, 16, I beg your pardon. People did not believe for 120 years. Noah is warning them the floods are coming. They are asking, Noah, please. I think there is something we are not understanding. Can you help us understand this? This is a dry place. That what you are talking about has never happened to you. And we see you building a boat in the dry land. How? Why don't you build it near an ocean somewhere? Please. He said, repent. Judgment is coming. God is coming to kill the whole world. He said, but no, how can God do that? 
God loves these holy people, these people. Those that did not believe the prophecy of the coming of the Lord. Rolling and gnashing teeth. The rapture has now happened and now they have entered the tribulation. All of a sudden they realize the Bible is true. And fear strikes them. I want to see how they navigate themselves inside the tribulation and the great tribulation. I really want to see. I hope you also want to see. When you will hear what happens with them, you, you will today, you're going to say, no, I don't want to enter there. I don't want to roll in the dust, in the polvo, in the soil, in the sand. I don't want that. He's saying, people did not believe in the days of Noah. And today they don't believe. And to make it was in the church. And yet, when now, the pagan king in Egypt. Did somebody hear the word pagan? When he heard the prophecy of the Lord from Joseph, he believed. He believed. The pagan king believed the prophecy of the Lord. We are talking about, <laughs> somebody listen to me. We are talking about a king that has never met the Lord, has not known a God like Jehovah. He has only known pyramids and, and rocks for God. He has no Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And then, the witches come and say what they are doing, the enchantments and everything. He is able to connect with them, communicate. Comfortably. But now, when Joseph appears and starts uttering the prophecies of Yahweh, of the Lord, of the God of Israel, the king said, no, this thing will happen. He was shocked. The king, a pagan king, has no Holy Spirit, has not read the Bible, he has not watched a DVD of a creeper is walking. He has not seen the rain of the Holy Spirit of Mount Carmel. Not at all. He has not seen the cloud coming. He has not been at crusades and conferences. Not at all. But when he simply heard the prophecy of the Lord, he said, no, no, no. He trembled. He said, this thing will take place. And he believed it. But how do you get to know that he believed? To know, for you to gauge, to measure that he believed is the change in conduct. The change in behavior. When he hear the prophecy, he changed the behavior around the prophecy according to the requirements of the prophecy. And yet the church, the church of Christ today, the announcement of the coming of the Messiah has been on and on social media, global broadcast, on TVs, on what? Throughout. At a time when Jesus has come and is living in your hearts. The Holy Spirit is here. And the church is behaving as though they don't believe. Why? Because their behavior has not changed. For the king of Egypt, he began to build silos and tell farmers to grow crops and keep 5% and storing in every city. Changing behavior according to the requirements of the prophecy. The Lord is asking, why hasn't the church in Mumbai, when they saw the creepers walking, why hasn't it changed its behavior? The church in India, when the prophecy was given that the visitation of the Godhead is coming, to prove to you that the Messiah is coming. And I came and commanded heaven by mere presence, and rain came down in a shocking manner. You should know, you don't know even what I said when I arrived in that car. I think we were in the same vehicle, right? You don't even know what I said. Because in the prophecy, I say it here in this prophecy, that when I just arrive 
at my mere presence. Heaven must obey and God the Father himself open heaven and bring rain instant when I just arrived. Look at this now. So, when I arrived and stepped out of the car, you don't know what I told the Lord. I stepped like this. Just stepped out of the door. One leg is still out like this. Then I said, now where is the God of Elijah? That is what I told him. That's why when I went and the pastors were in a room, I told them there's a rain coming now. And when I just stepped out like this, wow, like that. Unbelievable. The flowers are still in my hands. The flowers of reception. And you know, Professor Joshua, you know, he runs a university here for us. We bless him so much, right? Let's clap for him. <laughs> Professor Joshua, when he was lecturing here, theology, to the team, to the ministry here, he told them, please, can you tell the mega prophets of the Lord that when they come to India, can they please command heaven to open, open heaven and bring the rain of Mount Carmel there? I was watching him lecture and I heard him and then it is Dr. JJ that stood up. He said, Professor Joshua, I'm shocked you have not known this. The prophets of God have already said whenever they come, whichever year or time, on that day, heaven must open at their mere presence. So, Professor Joshua is the one with the flowers to receive me there. And then, boah! <laughs> Even when I'm in the stairs, when I'm at the stairs, it's my feet is raining on the stairs there. On the st- well, I know, but you know, Randy is full of, uh, you know, these guys are not even born again. The stairs, the stairs of the hotel there, when you see Professor Joshua is the one recording me. Hallelujah. Serious hour in the church. Which church is this one that rolls after the rapture? She is now regretting. She is regretting that she did not, she did not obey, did not believe the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. She continued enjoying her own things. Oi! I want to enter with her inside there and see how she fares on. But when the rapture does really finally happen, people all over the earth, number one, will be looking for answers. (laughs) Now I'm beginning to enter with her there. She's rolling and gnashing teeth. And then when she enters the uh, the, 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 I mean she's on the earth. She enters into the tribulation. You remember that vision the Lord showed me. People running out. And they are all out there. Jesus has come. Because so and so has disappeared. So and so has disappeared. So and so left his clothes. People will begin looking for answers. There is yet another vision also. Where the Lord shows me the bride of Christ. Quite uh, along, I mean, down the road. And he tells me by voice, go tell her the Messiah is coming. And the church I saw, they were there, okay, she was dressed fully and long like that. So, so when I arrived and just gained contact with her, it was at a junction. One road is climbing a little bit up like this. There is a shopping mall there. And one, look at this now. Amazing. It's a particular place. The road goes like this. And at that junction where the church was standing, there is a little bit of a ramp like this, going up like this, and the parking there, it's a big mall. When people shop, the exit on the, is on the other side. The tellers are on the other side. And then, there's an, this road also continues, the, the, continues, but there is one that curves, curves and as if comes back, as if trying to come back like this. There is a house here, and there is a radio station there. And there are some two young men, they don't tuck in their shirts, the, the untucked shirt. And they are announcing to the world. People are looking for solutions. And they are the ones saying, no, 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 no. It is the rapture that has happened. But what a terrible thing to be those young men, right? That you know is the rapture and you've missed it. People will start running all over the earth 
looking for solutions. You know why? Because they will say, some of them will say, their loved ones have been abducted. Their loved ones have disappeared. They will report missing persons. Can you imagine the chaos that ensues? I'm going to walk with you until you see the necessity of the Antichrist. Until the earth now become, need, need him. <laughs> I tell you, until they need him. And he says, the whole earth will have turned chaos like I saw. People are running up and down, calling their loved ones, not finding them. Phones were jammed. The other side was night. It happened there also. This side was day. It happened here also. People have gone missing, looking for their loved ones, looking for their... Ay, ay, ay. Do you really know the day I'm announcing? Do you really know how serious that day is? That's why I said, it is very easy for me to read First Thessalonians chapter 4, which we are going to read tomorrow. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We can even read it tonight. Verses 13 to 18. The key scripture on the rapture of the church. The coming of the Messiah. It is easy for me to read that scripture. And then, begin to announce to you what that scripture is instructing. Number one, you will see in there that scripture saying that his coming will be in its imminency. The day and hour is not known. Number two, you will see very clearly in that scripture that the Lord will be saying that there is resurrection and glorification. Which each of them is such a powerful instruction. Number three, you'll see those exonerated from death. Number four, you'll see glorification as a major hallmark of it. Number five, if you go to verse 17, you'll hear him now promising eternity with Christ. And so we shall be with Christ forever. Number eight, you, no, no, you, number, number whatever, you'll see him in verse 18 saying, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Meaning, that message is supposed to comfort the church, make you persevere, no matter the circumstances. For as long as you know that he's coming for you. So it's very easy for me to, I'll go through that. I'll handle, what does it mean? But, but most importantly, look at this now, is I will handle also what is the consequence of the rapture on the earth? Consequence. Because the earth changes totally. The tribulation begins over here and it's unbelievable. I'm going to show some fulfillments of prophecy here today as we continue after the short break. You'll see the earthquakes are prophesied, how they have demolished and destroyed cities and nations. And I'm going to anchor on that and now bring you the earthquakes inside the tribulation. So that you may begin to understand <laughs> that it is actually useless to bank on this world. That it may, be, it may be an obvious choice to just bank on the coming kingdom of God. I'm, I'm going to walk with you on this tonight. But step by step here. And he says, the church will have disappeared. I want to walk with that church inside the tribulation. But the church will have disappeared. Hallelujah. Hey, the pews are empty. Churches are now empty. The church is gone. The few that are remaining are now converted into tribulation saints if they are going to persevere. And so, you can imagine the desperation that consumes the... I'm talking about the total earth. In Swahili, they say, Leoni, today is today. Today we will know. Is it, is it really worth fooling around with the prophecy that's announcing the coming of the Messiah with power, with creepers, walking with blind, free of charge, cloud, 
Is it really worth ignoring it and fooling around with it? Today we will know. I mean, if you are really banking on the world, your palatial homes in Bajara Hills, then he's saying there will be a great demolition also. There will be toxic, the planets, the everything, the water. Uh, can you allow me to move on? Hallelujah. Is it really worth ignoring the Lord when he's announcing the coming of the Messiah? Hallelujah. Today, I have confronted the modern church. And I want to ask her, why have you not believed the prophecy? Why are you behaving as though when you enter the tribulation, you'll make it, you'll manage? Aye. The people left behind will be desperately, look, desperately looking for their loved ones. Desperately also looking for information. W- what is this that has happened to the earth? Hallelujah. Today I really want to go into the consequences of the rapture. I've waited for many years to give you this. Also, there is the consequence of the rapture in heaven. What is the consequence when finally the church also enters there? What is the change in worship before the throne that's going to happen? What is the consequence? Because you saw already big historic celebration happening there. Revelation 19. If you read further here, finest linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. The reason for historic celebration. That we did not believe she would make it. Look, she's now wearing a glorious garment. She has made it. She has overcome. We thought the devil was winning. But now the Lord has won. He reigns. So this is a journey we are going to take together tonight. I know we should be taking a short break. Just allow me. But it's going up to midnight. Don't worry about that. So he says in that vision, I saw people and I saw a pastor deny Jesus, renounce Jesus. They asked her. I saw the Antichrist. I even saw everything. The cloth and the what? The heart with, they call it Ngano, right? In Swahili. The officer's kind of heart. Why do we think that uh, you have been a, you have been a pastor? She said, "No, no, no, I, I've never been a pastor." But the Lord made, made me know that she was a pastor. She denied Jesus. It will be bad. For um, allow me, I don't want to kick. Start, I don't want to jump it because I want to reach a place where you take the mark for you to buy food and eat. Otherwise, you'll be in the garbage looking for someone who de-skinned chicken and threw there and it's rotting it, take and eat. Can I walk this journey? So that we may ask, is it really worth ignoring this prophecy? Why has the church in Mumbai not yet changed? When creepers walked, the holy message was preached, the glorious announcement was made. Why haven't I heard that a big revival has broken out They have now changed like the Egyptian king. They changed totally. The Egyptian king did not see a creeper walking. Or blind eyes open for him to believe and change his conduct according to the requirements of prophecy. Not at all. But Mumbai saw with on Indian doctors verifying and then walking. Very powerful. Hallelujah. And many hills, not just one. Tremendous. Confusion will reign over the earth. And people will start looking for counsel, help, advice. Thank you for putting that script, the other scripture because I don't, I don't want people to focus on that. You are wise, you are born again also. Hallelujah. They will start looking for counsel and they, they will move towards needing the Antichrist. Needing him. <laughs> Chaos. Confusion. People are lost. People have disappeared. It will be a terrible time on the earth. And the church has rolled here. The rapture 
The rapture itself removes the church from the earth. The very person, the very entity that has been saying, God loves you, uh, turn away from this. Restraining, restraining wickedness is removed away. Hallelujah. The very one that has been uh, holding back it is you that are preaching love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are preaching the love of God. Can you imagine if you are taken away the love of wickedness that remains? Jesus removes the faithful church before the seven years of tribulation begin. Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. Let's begin from there. Hallelujah. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I also will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole known world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Take him straight. Just straight here. Straight here. Bella Apple. Thank you. The whole known world. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I also will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole known world to test the inhabitants of the earth. That is serious. So, now, the church is rolling here. And she is now left behind. She is not church anymore. Jesus has taken the church. That is serious. He says, there are key words I want us to look at there. This is more like a conditional statement. Conditional. That because you have done this, I will also do this. I, there is responsibility in the grace, right? The grace is a much higher law than the blood of animals. Because this is the blood of the Son of the living God himself. The blood of God. And he's saying, because, because you have kept my command. What does it mean to keep the command of God? Why? Because it's important. These are the people he took. The ones who did not do this are rolling here. Hallelujah. He's saying, since you have kept my command, to end, and then, what does it mean to keep his command? And what is his command? Then he says, to endure patiently. What does it mean to endure? And what does it mean to endure patiently? You want to know who these are, their characteristics, their identity, that, that you may make sure your church is this one. Because this is the beloved model church. This is the benchmarker. And he says, because you have kept my command, meaning to take the word of God and put where? In your heart. Do you just keep it there? When you put it there, it does what? It will instruct you. So these people, they did not only reject the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, that's why they are rolling on the soil, but they also did not keep God's command in their hearts. Otherwise, it would have instructed you that, guess what? You are under the Lordship of Jesus. It would have instructed you that, guess what? The Messiah is coming. You need to prepare. Hallelujah! I want to enter with them into the great tribulation. The first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. Hallelujah! I really want... I know it's time for a short break, but coffee break. But just allow me to do this. Who are these people? Now we are beginning to see the ones he takes away. Because the rapture, at the rapture of the church, Jesus takes away his church. They cease to be the church. They rejected to keep his command. What does it mean to keep the command? Do you remember Josiah the king? Josiah 
When Hilkiah the high priest went to the temple, he, Josiah instructed that the high priest go and repair the temple. He hired people and sent money there. To, to, to restore the temple, rebuild it, repair it. And when Josiah did that, then people began to repair the temple of the Lord. Beautiful work. And he says, take some money and go give it to the workers there. Don't even ask for accountability because they are trustworthy. But he'll hear the high priest. When he went in there to take the money of the offering to those people, he found what? They found the book. They found the Bible. It was Lost somewhere and dusty. Aye. And then, when Elkia the high priest saw that, he took the Bible, the book, and he gave it Shaphan the secretary to take to the king. Go tell the king, we have found a book, a book. We have found the, the book. We have found a book. We found a book, the book. Hallelujah. The king is wearing golden clothes, glorious clothes with diamond and everything. But now when Shaphan the secretary arrived, he said, he said to the king that Hilkiah the high priest has found a book and he has told me to bring it. A book. He has found a book. It, it was lost in there in dusty. So, so, can you open the book and read it for me a little bit so I can hear? I, I'm sure they read the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> I have a little more information. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when Josiah the king heard, when he simply heard the words of the book, what the words of the book said. He was so shocked that he took his golden robe and he tore it. Why? Because Josiah, the king, the reason he tore his robe, he said, I cannot believe I cannot believe. I cannot believe that all these years we have been going to church in Hyderabad, to church in Nairobi, to church in Johannesburg, in New York City. Every day we are entering there, worshipping every Sunday, coming back on Wednesday, doing sometime Friday night. I cannot believe that all this time we have been worshipping the house of the Lord without the holy word of God in our hearts. I cannot believe that. Can I put it better for you? He said, I cannot believe that we have been entering the holy house of the holy God of Israel to worship the holy God of Israel without his holy word in our hearts. I cannot believe that. Why? Because judgment is coming. He's saying, I cannot believe that all this time long, we have been worshipping the house every Sunday, every Sunday, and none of us stood up and told us that you guys, how come you can't see that the presence of God is not here? Hallelujah. Do you understand why he tore his robe? I'm simply working on kept the word. Since you have kept my word. What does it mean to keep his word? That you may be raptured. He said for them. He will keep them. Look at that. From. This is the rapture. From. Not through. From. I will remove them. From the earth before that hour comes. Hallelujah. He's saying, I cannot believe that all this long we have been worshipping the Holy God of Israel and we did not miss the holiness of God. Women walk naked. The abortions have been here. Homosexuality has been here. 
And we did not miss the holiness of the Holy God of Israel. We were coming every Sunday. Oh! He's saying, I cannot believe that all this long we have been worshipping here and nobody ever told us, look, how come you can't see that creepers are not walking? How come you can't see that the presence is not in the house of the Lord? Josiah asked. Hi. Look at the present day church. They do things. They are worshipping. And yet the Lord is saying, I want to visit. He's asking for repentance. And the church, they are doing their own things. They are even they have reached a point of faking miracles, faking, my Lord. You remember the elders of Israel when they remembered the glory that was in the first temple, they fell down and wept. How come nobody has looked back and said, "Just a moment, can we look at the church where Peter was and Paul was? How come we can't see that power now?" They abandoned the cross. Who is this church rolling and gnashing teeth? Hallelujah. He's saying, because since you have kept my command, and he's saying that command is to endure patiently, the present day church cannot endure any trial, not at all. They rather renounce Jesus or abandon that husband and go and marry another man. They cannot stand persecution. They want just to enjoy life. They, in other words, they want to get away with it. And yet the Lord Jesus has ordained for us a blood-stained path. And yet the Lord Jesus is saying, there is no glory without suffering. Romans 8, 17 and, uh, and 18, we know very well. It's right there on the screen. There is no glory without the glory. The glory, my Lord. The bloodbath. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, my Lord. The church today has become a big discotheque. Entertainment center. Look at the church in Australia. It's one big celebration every Sunday. And yet the Lord is saying, sharing in his suffering that you may share in his glory, my Lord. Oi! Who are these that are rolling here? I want to walk with them inside the tribulation and see how they fare. So I may see whether this ignoring of repentance, ignoring of the announcement has any basis whatsoever. Hallelujah! He says, verse 18, I don't have time. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. When Paul was saying that he does not consider that this present suffering is anything comparable, weighing the weight, weighing the weight of glory and the weight of suffering that we have now, temporary sufferings that we have now. When he was saying so, he was about to be headed, to be cut on the head, my Lord. Aye! Who is this church rolling here? Has she accepted persecution? Not at all. She's enjoying the disco right now. She's dancing in the, in the, on the altar. Oi! There is a tragedy. The guitarists are stepping down now, stepping forward and playing the lead guitar now in the middle of the song. She's doing it now. The present day church. The girls are dancing in there. Girls, girls are dancing. Oh, who is this church that is rolling? The rapture has happened and Jesus has taken his church and has remained. He's saying, <laughs> taking a weighing scale and weighing suffering 
Counterweighing it with glory that is promised. He's saying which one is greater? Paul is saying so. His meaning, this beheading, I'm about to be beheaded, is nothing compared to the glory coming. Aye! Aye! The present day church does not want the glory. She wants the glory without the glory. The glory without suffering. Do you want glory? Oh, I love glory. How about the suffering? No, I believe God is good all the time. Serious. Let's go back to Revelation 3. I don't have time. We don't have much time for all this because I have so much ahead of us. I really want to enter the tribulation and you people are not even allowing me to do it. Right? I need to get there. I need to see the basis for this ignoring of the announcement. And then rolling and gnashing teeth. The Lord has taken his church. He's out of here. He's gone. He's gone. He's not here. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he's saying, since you've kept my command to endure patiently. You remember too well when Josiah, after he tore his robe, then he gave instruction. Then he told now the people to go back and start observing all the feast festivals of the Lord. To obey now repentance. Has the present day church seen that now the book has been found. Holiness has come. Repentance has come. The cloud has come. The rain has come. The, the announcement has come. The call for visitation has come. Has she realized that and then decided to repent and change her ways? Not at all. They are running kingdoms. Yeah, yeah they are kingdoms. They believe that they are kings in, 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 in kingdoms. Hallelujah. Then he says, I'll keep you from, that is the rapture, to be kept from, away from. That is not Noah's ark. Noah's ark entered into the flood, into the tribulation. He would have said, I'll keep you through, or I'll keep you in. And he says, I'll keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come to the whole known world. Meaning there is nowhere to hide. I want to know, what is the hour of trial that we may be able to question the church. Then why are you behaving like you can manage? Why are you behaving like you can manage? You are ignoring the announcement. In other words, you are saying, if it comes, I will manage. I will go into the hour of trial. I have it here. It's not something, it's, like, it's something I have. I haven't seen it. I've given some prophecies into the tribulation. So let's see. If the church, the modern day church, what is the basis of her ignoring the announcement when the king of Egypt has already trembled and built stores and raised Joseph into prime ministership and now started collecting grains and in that way he saved Egypt and Israel. <laughs> I think it's a zero sum game to ignore the Lord, right? Okay, we don't have much time. And so he says there, the hour of trial, we need to know what it is. Today you will know this. That is going to come, what does it mean to the whole world? So, in the book of Psalm, the book of Psalm, oh, I know, just a moment. How about the inhabit to test? What does it mean to test? Today we are going to see the testing, testing of the inhabitants of the earth, so that I may see if this church rolling here will manage it. What does it mean, the inhabitants of the earth? Who are they? It's now not talking about the church. He said, this hour of trial is coming to a particular people. He names names. Their names are the inhabitants of the earth. Those are the dwellers of the earth. They have settled the earth. They become the enemies of God. We will see that shortly after the break. But we have so much scriptures here which I need to mention. Isaiah 26, 19, 21, which he says very fast. I don't have time because we need to take a short break. He says, Isaiah 26, 19, uh, 19 to 21. He says, But your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust of the earth wake up and shout for joy. For your dew is as fresh as the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Then he goes and says, Go, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Shut thy doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while, seven years, until his wrath has passed by. 
He takes them away at rapture. So who is this? I. Their identity changes. Their identity card must change. Now become the tribulation sense. If he wants to endure. Aye. Now you see you have this short, small endurance here and perseverance. Now you want to go into the big thing, right? Let's see how far we go. Now I just want to do this thing. The book of Psalm 27, verse 5, real quick. It says, Psalm 27, 5, it says, For in the day of trouble, I'll keep for in the day of trouble, the day of tribulation, he will keep me safe in his dwelling place. He will hide me in his shelter, in the shelter of his sacred tent, and set me upon a rock, Christ Jesus. So he's talking about taking literally away, because the tribulation is coming, the whole earth, there is nowhere to hide. So this hiding must be up there. Okay. Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3. Hallelujah. Real quick, we're running now. We don't even have have time. He's saying, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what what he commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps he will shelter you on the day of the Lord's anger. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 9, chapter 1, verse 9, 10. Real quick. Hallelujah. We must take a short break now. Time is not on our side. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. Remove that thing from the screen. In a hurry. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. And to wait for his son from heaven. Again, the key word there is wait. Whom he raised from the dead. Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. So it's very clear at rapture he takes away his church, right? I think we've seen enough now. Even First Thessalonians chapter 5, 9 and 10. He says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis nineteen twenty two. he says, because of time now, Genesis 19.23 says, But flee there quickly, because I cannot do any tribulation until you reach it. Hallelujah. I cannot do any judgment until you get there. Lord, run there quickly, because I cannot do anything. I cannot release fire until you reach there. All indications that God always has a protocol. He has a program to secure his people first. And that's why after that I want to walk with this guy into the tribulation and see how he fares there. And see what message comes from this vision. That the church may never ever joke with this announcement again. I tell you, things are heavy here. Right? He says, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That's why the town is called Zohar. Genesis 5.24, we saw that he took away he took away Enoch before the floods. Romans 5.9, real quick. He's saying, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the coming wrath? From the wrath through him. Hallelujah. Very powerful. I see people, I think it's time to go now. Just give me a moment. He says the tribulation occurs right after the rapture as he's rolling there. And the rapture is being caught up, to be caught up with the Lord at the grand reunion. Step by step, allow me to say these words. And he says the rapture is not for everybody that attends church. Hallelujah. In this rolling here, the Lord is saying that the rapture is not for everybody that attends church. It is not for everybody that proclaims salvation or names the name of the Lord. And we saw Matthew 7, 21, 22. And we saw Matthew 25, 1 and 13. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 5. 
Hebrews chapter 6, 4 to 6 in a hurry. He says, it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, it's impossible to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace, public shame. The Lord is saying that those who are left behind at the rapture are not the true believers that in the church, that were in the church. They are not. Aye, the church has two congregations, right? And that's why you have a good job now to go back to India to now just clean up the church that all of them may enter. Nobody may languish like this. Those left behind, they are not the true believers. The rapture announces that the church age has come to an end. And another dispensation has now come in. Hi. That is serious. Daniel chapter 9, 24 again, 26, if you don't mind. 24, 27. Hi. I also need a short break now. He says, 77 have been decreed for your people Israel and your holy city Jerusalem to finish transgression and put an end to sin to atone for wickedness and bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place including the millennial temple of course. Verse 25 Know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty two sevens it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Verse 26. After 62 sevens, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death, but he will have nothing. He will not take the kingdom at that time. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Verse 27 he said, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of that seven, you put an end to sacrifice and grain offering at the temple. He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that his decree is poured on him. That is very serious, blessed people. He's saying verse 27 kicks in. Hallelujah. Verse 27 kicks in. If you look at your news now, it's quite terrible. Second Peter chapter 3, 11 and 12 as we finish now, we take a short break. We are a long way to go. We've just begun. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed up His coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. So those that store up treasures on the earth, the reason for them not to accept the prophecy of the Lord, because they are wealthy on the earth. That they say, I am wealthy, and they preach their gospels, and they just live their lives in a wealthy way. They don't want to obey the instruction of repentance and walking in the narrow road. Now look. Said everything will go up in flames. So the Lord is saying this church, the earth will recycle, the church is taking the earth to recycle back to the time like the 69 weeks. It is called the 70th week of Daniel or the time for Jacob's trouble. We're about to see it after the break. And so what I want to ask is this when I come back. This person here, he is rolling and gnashing his teeth. Oh, oh, he's rolling and gnashing teeth. He has been left behind. Is there another opportunity? When we come back, I want to look at that. That's why I want to follow him. Is there another opportunity for those? Again, let, let me just tell you this. You know, let, let's talk the truth, right? 
Even just here, all of us here. Chances are not everybody will enter. That's why this is important. Again, chances are, even just the small number here, 100% may not enter. This is serious. That's why I will want to understand, is there an opportunity for them to be born again again inside there? In the tribulation? Or what is their fate when we come back after the break? Thank you. Of the Messiah is fulfilled accurately. That all the prophecies that pointed towards his coming, his coming in the first coming, were fulfilled accurately. And we found out that there are other prophecies about the Messiah that are not yet fulfilled. We saw, for example, I approached it through the promises, the covenant with David. And we saw that that prophecy, part of it is not yet fulfilled. The glorious throne, the kingdom he promised David, which is actually the kingdom that you see in the millennial reign, when the glorious throne is put there. He already died on the cross and achieved excellence for us. So he deserves that throne. Even us, we are happy to see the day when Jesus is rewarded publicly for the work he did on the cross. We want to be there to celebrate him. Hallelujah. Even us, we are happy. We are looking forward to when he will come. He will come and be rewarded with a glorious throne. Be the ruler of the universe, right? You remember when he said in the book of John chapter 14 that I'm going to the Father's house. Let's begin with that one right away on the screen. John chapter 14 and I say this with a lot of love, blessed people. I know I'm trying to cut down again. I'm caught up in the same situation whereby because of time, I normally will try to chop some stuff out. But it's a great disservice if I don't give you the full instruction. The full counsel of the word of God, right? I think we should not look at time. I should just try to see as much as possible to move a little faster, right? The whole counsel, that you may know the consequence of not adhering, not hearkening, not accepting, not following, not obeying the prophecy when the Lord is making such a mighty, mighty announcement of the glorious coming of the Messiah. And the way he's announcing it in a very powerful way, you take to your country, India, you tell them the Lord is announcing in a very powerful way with creepers walking, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, right? With the cloud of God coming, with the rain in Ahmed Nagar, creepers walking. You remember in Ahmed Nagar, in that meeting, it was just dead silence there because people brought creepers, blind, everybody's there, uh, mute and so forth. And when I just walked in, I told them tomorrow, I'll just walk in. The moment I walk in, everything will change. And I said a simple prayer about, and I told them, I'm going to say a simple prayer here between three to five minutes and everything will change here. You, you, you know, I, I get to see with the mind of the Lord. So I get to see many, many people what they're thinking even when I'm preaching here. I get to know what people think. So pe- some of them were asking, how? How is that going to be possible? But the mo- immediately, the moment I gave that three to five minute prayer, every poop creeps up, everything chaotic. Chaotic, their blind eyes opening and so forth. So that is, it. do you know why that is happening? To point to the prophecy on the coming of the Messiah. That you may know that, that, look at my daughter there, the eyes popped open, born blind like that for many years. And so, that you may get to know that surely the Messiah is coming. The announcement is being given with power. This is the time to desert sin. To just walk away from sin. Especially sexual sin. Make sure you stay away from sexual, especially sexual sin. And of course, lying becomes also very proverbial and very normal with pastors today at the pulpit. They lie, the prophecies and so forth. But this is the time to purify and be right with the Lord, right? And so, we begin right away over with John chapter 14, just that you may understand what he says there. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will be back. And take you that you also may be where I am. You know the way to where I'm going. So this is very powerful. What he's saying there, if I summarize for you, is as though, you know, we know very well that there was the event on the cross which was very painful, very abusive. And most of it, the Bible tends to be a little bit diplomatic about it try to put some diplomacy on it. But the Lord showed me every detail 
it was quite, it sent me weeping for three months non-stop. When he showed me how the Messiah was crucified, it was unbelievable. There are things, there are things, there are things in there. And remember at that time also crucifixion, if they don't, if the Bible may not have described, but the hand normally is pulled to the farthest, if it's the right hand to the farthest right and nailed. And this other hand is pulled to the farthest left and nailed. And you know breathing, you need your chest cavity to be doing that. And the legs they pull. Such like that now, you can't breathe the way the chest should open and close. So there are things there. There is the cost of salvation. There is the pain of crucifixion. Failure to breathe. So that's why you see he smeared a lot of blood on the back of the cross but by trying now to breathe up and down like that. So you see very clearly says that he is going and he will come back. So for us also, we are really looking forward for the day when Christ will be glorified publicly, honored publicly with a glorious throne as the king of the universe, the devil has been dethroned and it is given to him. We are looking forward. So we are enthusiastic. We also want it to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. And we are saying in the manner in which crucifixion took place, and then you saw the prophecy, the key prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, 24, 27. In that prophecy you saw, he said, he will go to the cross, he will be killed, he will die, but will have nothing. Meaning softly and quietly he will live and ascend. But we also look for the climax. He said, I will be back. He said, when I come back, you'll know who I am. you come back with a crown. you come back with glory. Come back with power. Come back with a kingdom. And come back with a throne. So we also look forward to that day when he will be rewarded, recompensed, and given a big recognition universally as the king of the universe with a crown. I have seen him. He has a crown at this point in time. Even recently, March, the March 22nd, I gave you 2024, which we began to discuss. I saw him, which we had yesterday, the prophecy of the rapture. I saw he has a crown. And it's a tremendous thing to have the Savior now send us, the Lord, the Father, send us to announce the coming of the Savior, the coming of the King, the Messiah. Even you hear the announcement, look, the King is coming in the sky, in the sky. It's a tremendous thing, blessed people. Even to hear the voice of God announcing that, and then I repeat it here. It's very powerful. Hallelujah. And so, the Lord speaking with the church and telling the church that there is a a situation right now going on in the house of the Lord right now, whereby the announcement is made, and then people recycle back to their normal business as usual. He says, not at all, not on this one. The prophecies that talk about the Messiah's coming, they accurately get fulfilled accurately. Hallelujah. And so they will get fulfilled. That is what the Lord is saying here. And we saw very clearly in that vision of May 4th, the year 2014, I've been waiting for so long to go with you through this, and I'll be able to run, some of it may look like repetition, because I was simply writing off head and emphasizing certain key things, repetition to emphasize really, But uh, I was trying to bring the gravity to you. Why the Lord shows me the church that fails to enter. That is serious, blessed people. Why the Lord should show me the church that does not enter. In other words, that is a warning. The Lord said, you be careful. You also could end up in this. Right? And so we need to take maximum caution. And see the love of God in in it all. Right? And so he says... That the rapture essentially announces the end of the church age. We saw that already. And we saw very clearly that rolling like that, meaning the Lord has taken his church. Now whosoever remains there and begins to worship Jesus, you become a tribulation saint and you have a certain way that God has charted out for you on that type of worship. And how it ends. When you hear now, from Revelation 3, which is right on the screen there, verse 10, say to test, to test the inhabitants of the, to test. That is not a joke. We're going to see that testing right now. He's saying to test the inhabitants of the earth. In other words, to test and see if you can really worship under those circumstances. If at this time you are being told, repent. 
prepare a holy church. The Messiah is coming. Then you say, no, I don't want, I just want to preach something that's exciting to my people. Uh, uh, prosperity and all modern people. Modern church, modern people. Just this simple thing, you fear that when you focus on repentance, you are going to lose sheep as a form of a form of persecution or something. Or if we bring it to the pastor's fellowship, you fear that they will tell you, no, 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 sit down, we want to talk about other things. If you can fear now, even as a Christian, to walk with the Lord in the public, to announce to that law firm, to that medical center where you are a doctor or you are a lawyer in that law firm, you fear to announce to them that you are born again, that you might lose your job, or the boss now must, might start working his way to clean you out of the company. If we fear to stand with Jesus at this time, when it still does not demand slaughter, I know, of course, there are places where pastors have been persecuted. I receive uh, the text from them. But I'm saying in the general scope of things, we are still in the church age. How much more then in that dispensation? So the Lord is saying over here that he is coming to test the inhabitants of the earth. To test. We're going to look at it a little bit here. And there are two things here. You realize, I'm beginning to talk about the man of lawlessness. I bless you, Professor Ambusa, Ambula. I bless you, my daughter. So, so I, 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 I am talk, beginning to talk about the, the, uh, the man of lawlessness. But there is another side. The judgment is all round. There is also wrath coming from heaven. There is judgment. You are going to see the destruction of the earth. The planets are crashing. Earthquakes. What? The water turning into blood and all that. So it's all round. So if at this time you are saying you like to preach or you don't want to receive Christ because you are a wealthy person in the world. You are relying on your real estate, on your wealth. But he's saying it's all coming to be demolished. So when we, when we walk through this, is this still worthy for you to ignore the announcement. You understand me now. So step by step. Let's see how far we can do it. And then notch it up. Right? Hallelujah. And so. Are they able. Is this person able to be born again? That's where we left it at. And we see very clearly. That the biggest revival in the history of the Bible. <laughs> will take place inside the tribulation. Isn't that amazing? And it boils down to the same thing I kept saying. That, you know, they said we don't believe. We don't want to believe in Jesus. They were doing their own thing. You kept going to them, please can you take the Lord? Can you repent? They say we don't want, we don't believe that. We, We don't believe that. But now, when the rapture takes place, a huge global monumental event has taken place. And I shaken the earth and turned it on his head now. Once that has happened, then all of a sudden it dawns on them just a moment. So Jesus is real. He has taken our friends here. People have disappeared from here. Then number two, they realize just a moment. So God is real. Number three, just a moment. So heaven is real. People have gone. Just a moment. Then that means even hell is what? That's how the biggest revival takes place. In the, in the tribulation and the great tribulation. It's amazing. Because all of a sudden, it dawns on them. So let me just divide this for you. He says, uh, he says here, we have three zones. The Old Testament saints, we have the church and the tribulation saints. Becomes automatically tribulation saint if he's a Christian who wants to worship. Or if it is somebody that rejected Jesus in this life, in this age. And then now the reality of the monumental occurrence of rapture. Real people have gone up there. You can imagine the vision of of any of the visions. Even the vision of January 15th, 2017. Or any of the visions you take. You can imagine, especially the one of January 15, 2017. You can imagine when they crossed like this, and then now the cloud appeared and glorious tears appeared. There are other details. They are having white turban. They are having white garment. 
And the garment has this connection, another cloth connecting here to the body, uh, connecting the sleeve to here, and the white turban flowing like this. And some of them are holding children. That puzzled me a little bit. Because, you know, we think you are personal. You stand alone there. But only later, and then we understood what the Lord was saying. That the Lord was saying, on that day, there is also the grand reunion. Not just reunion with Christ, but with your loved one. Families will unite. The ones who died wholly earlier. So, no, because I, did, I didn't understand, why are, they, why are families? No, he meant reunion once they are up there. With your loved ones that died earlier when they were born again. Right? So it's a win-win for you to be born again and be righteous and holy. That it doesn't matter at what time you die. If you die before the rapture, you, your, your soul goes to be in a conscious presence with God and given a temporary body, intermediary body. And then you come with Christ on that day. Your body, whether it was cremated and the ash poured in the ocean, the power, the resurrection power, the regeneration power, the renewal power of Jesus will call it back. The way he called back Lazarus from past which is flowing back to reconstituted cells and organs and everything. You don't even hear that Lazarus left that place limping and he was mentally unstable. Not at all. Perfectly normal. He recalled everything back. Hallelujah. Very serious day. So he's saying that uh, there are these three groupings. The Old Testament saints, and then now you have the church, and you have the tribulation saints. So there is now the group that receives Christ in that time called the tribulation saints. The opportunity again for this church, I saw rolling in the dust, gnashing teeth and wailing bitterly. They have another opportunity in there. But now the kind of recourse, the kind of uh, entailments, involvements are different. There is a slaughter. Hallelujah. So the revival in the tribulation will actually be the greatest harvest of souls in the entire history of the Bible. Hallelujah. So the tribulation saints, they will be huge in number. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 7 shortly. Just give me a moment. Hallelujah. If you start from chapter 7 verse 9, he says the following. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, every race, every continent, every island, every... Hallelujah! Thank God! Thank God! Thank God! Every ethnicity, every race, Hallelujah. He says, from every nation, every tribe, and people, and language, I saw that grand multitude. Look at this now. Look at this now. That no one could count. Hallelujah. Our God wins again. So you can imagine how much the Lord loves your soul. That he follows them in there with another salvation, another opportunity for repentance. When they rejected it here, the Holy Spirit is lifted. Now he's localized on certain people alone. But then, he still gives a chance. And now there is a particular way of overcoming the devil. It's a different way. Where, again, let me just finish this. He says, then, then I'll go to Revelation chapter, I think it's chapter 12 verse 11. I'll go that later. But for a moment he says, he's saying, uh, after this I looked. And there before me was a grand multitude, a great multitude, that no one could count. Hey! You can Im praise the Lord. You can imagine the Lord wins. He still follows people there. There is an opportunity. But then I want to walk through the circumstances under which you get born again. They are unbearable. There is decapitation. That means the separating of the head from the body. Aye, aye, aye. Because they realize suddenly that hell is real. And they begin to long to follow their friends who went in the rapture. They long to follow them. Because they realize they fall into a circumstance which is unbearable. The tribulation, the great tribulation. They are totally unbearable. The judgments, the earthquakes, the antichrist, the slaughter, 
the butcher, you cannot sell. I wish I had time to even touch the back of the beast. You cannot buy. And people will report you. Like you see when the Lord asked me to bring judgment on Ukraine. Have you ever wondered why? Why There was a big gathering of international senior most pastors out where the tent out here. And then I came to them that morning. Uh, three months before, I said, I see, I see. Okay, okay, don't do that. Yeah, just put the scripture. We don't have my time, really. Yeah, thank you very much for understanding that. So that we are singularly focused. And then I told them, the Lord had just spoken with me. I see a global, big war coming to the earth. And then I see the leader of that nation claiming part of another part nation saying that these are our people. They speak our language. They have our culture. I get, you know, when God speaks, it is in the detail. It's amazing when now, let him repeat here and see what Vladimir Putin said. What In a fiery speech that was broadcast across Russia and the world, Putin essentially laid claim to Ukraine. He said Ukraine is not just a neighboring country, it's an integral part of our history, culture. Modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia, by Bolshevik communist Russia, to be exact. Let me emphasize once again that Ukraine for us is not just a neighboring country. It is an integral part of our own history, culture. Like when I went to Concepcion and I said, Concepcion, Concepcion, Concepcion. God is calling Concepcion, repent. When the time came, Every news agency, Australian, ABC, CNN, what the conception, the conception, the epicenter is conception. Everybody repeating my words. Conception, conception. It's amazing when we put it together. You listen to this now. Conception. Oh, hey, you know you have some people there. <laughs> <laughs> That conception may return to Jesus. God is the translator which starts. God is calling conception. God is crying for conception. That conception may return to Jesus. God is asking everybody in conception to begin to repent. Conception. Conception. Time is over for sexual immorality. Immoralidad sexual. Conception. 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 Then look at the news. Conception. 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 God is asking everybody in Conception to begin to repent. repent. This is CNN Breaking News. 8.8 quake, very strong. Concepcion. A massive earthquake has struck Chile. Concepcion, the country's second largest city of Concepcion. A massive Did you understand? Central Chile. When God the speaks, man, he's not a joke. The, the one who is talking here is not a joke. He's announcing the coming of the Messiah. The Lord is doing that, even buildings like this. Why? That you may know that the master prophecy must be fulfilled. Will be fulfilled at this. Hallelujah. And so if you put it back to that scripture so that we can be able to see what happens during the insight there. He's saying, look at this now, what happens in there? He said, now the rolling, the, the loss, crying, weeping for the loss has not entered. Then he said, I mean, even the inhabitants of the earth, of course, the loved ones have gone. There is a situation there, right? And then he says, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. You can imagine that revival. That is a massive revival. But you see, the options were there to take the Lord here. Then he says, because all of a sudden, like I said, it dawns on them that eh, heaven is real. Number two, that means hell is also real. And then I want to reach a place where they read scripture also. Because everybody now goes back to scripture. And you must make sure you hide the Bible because a time comes again when now the Antichrist begins to burn Bibles and take away Bibles from people. If you are captured in the Bible, you are killed, assassinated. He kills people for the word. So, somehow you have to hide. You have to hide uh, the word to be able to refer to it to know. So, uh, just allow me so I can read this. This is amazing, right? Hallelujah. 
For me it's different. And you will see a bit of uh, our involvement in it also. It's a very serious thing that the Lord is announcing the coming of the Messiah. The church must heed. Because what lies ahead I have seen is unbelievable. In fact darkness. Darkness plunges the earth. Why? Because then the light, the church has been taken away. Right? So he says here. A multitude nobody could uh, count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne of God Almighty and of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their, in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Very powerful. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. Remember, I've interacted with these creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Continue up to 13, 14 we are heading. He's saying, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. So forever and ever is the name of Jehovah. And then he says, Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, the multitude, we cannot even count. I don't know how many millions. Who are they? And where did they come from? Then I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, They are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. If I were you at this point, they finally made it. Meaning, they defeated Satan. Revelation 12, 11, if you don't mind there. So, therefore, there's before the throne of God and the temple. Yes. So, it says, again now it says, they triumphed over him by the power of the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not, look at this now, look at this now, the price, for that type of worship, the worship ordinance in the tribulation. Look, look. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So they actually triumphed by not allowing the devil to cause them to renounce Jesus. They triumphed by offering themselves to be killed. Yes, do you want to receive Jesus? Do you want to continue with Jesus and we kill you or you, you renounce him and we give you the mark of the beast? You are going to see very shortly that the mark of the beast is not a joke. The mark of the beast is not a joke. It is eternal. Once you receive it, you cannot reverse it. Once you receive it, you must enter the lake of fire. That's why these ones here, they do not shrink. They realize you have to choose between two areas now. The lake of fire and the kingdom of heaven. And they decide to offer their necks for slaughter. And you line up people, you slaughter the first one after slaughter and the way you cried. Like that, going smearing, doing that here. After that, coming to the next one. Do you also want? Can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the, the uh, I don't want to use the word folly, the, the, the problem with ignoring the problem. Once you consider two things, in fact I put it into three. Number one, you consider that now, after the rapture was considered two things. In fact I put it into three. Number one, you consider that now, after the rapture was preached and prophesied, and for sure it happened. And real people you know have gone. Then you realize that number one, heaven is real now. It's actually real. They left their clothes and watches here. And hat and shoes and socks. Number two, you begin to realize that hell must be real. So you quickly begin to choose between the two destinations. Hell is eternal torment. Which we are going to see right now in Revelation 14. But for now we are here. So he's saying, Eternal torment and eternal glory. E everlasting life. And then number three, 
The longing to join your people there. You begin to say, let me just be slaughtered. But they are slaughtered in the millions. The largest millions. The greatest revival in the entire Bible takes place at that time. When the Lord showed me the vision of the church, the people that failed to enter, they remained left behind, remained and failed to enter the rapture. Failed to enter the rapture. It's a serious message. A serious warning to this generation. He says, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death, as to fear death. Wow! They now gave up. They said, you rather kill me because if you don't kill me and I renounce Jesus, it is worse in the lake of fire. Because now they begin to read scripture. Remember they are looking for information? Hallelujah! So you must go and mention this to the people in India. You must go and tell them, no, 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 no. Just receive the Lord now. Just be holy now. Don't go into that. Don't take chances. If you can't stand any little trials here, how much beheading and so forth. So that is very serious. And he's saying, they will be martyred. They become martyrs. Martyrs. Killed for the faith. How many would want to be martyrs? And then, of course, you see now, that is now God's exceptional way of rewarding them and bringing them into glory. Millions upon millions now, they will be declared missing. But then, guess what? Now, these guys will accept to be slaughtered to go join them. Right? He's saying, some of the people that remained, that were rolling here, they are those that were critics. When the announcement is being made, the Messiah is coming. They decide to criticize. Number two, some of the people that were, uh, some of the people that, uh, that, 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 that were rolling here, they are offended. They will say, no, me, I went to church, and the way that pastor behaved, I became offended. So I walked out of church. But look at this now. They fail to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't let another man sinning allow you now, make you enter the lake of fire. Don't do that. They don't understand that Jesus went to the cross and he availed himself to purify the sinners. Don't let offense, you know the devil uses offense. These people here. Some of them, they say, because I saw the way the other pastor behaves with money or behaves with women, so I decided, no, I don't want. But how now? Look at where you are. From Australia, it's better if you drink some water instead of sleeping here. You sleep better in in a bed somewhere. So, very serious, blessed people. Very critical. This thing of saying that I walked out of church because my pastor did what? No! No! Just find the Bible. Find salvation. Find another church if you want where the Bible is being preached. But don't end up into this. Because he says, they now rubbish their own lives and put their necks to slaughter. That's how to worship Jesus now. (laughs) That is unbelievable. And so, he says, Romans chapter 3.23, real quick. Romans 3.26. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Ecclesiastes 7.20 says in a hurry, because we are running today, we don't have much time. He says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right, and never sins. But they are being offended already. They say, no, the reason they did not enter because the pastor offended him. Not at all. Not at all, blessed people. And so who are they? I'm simply trying to open it up for you when the Lord showed me that vision of people remaining. And he's saying that at this time, Luke 15, put for me Luke 15 verse 7. He's saying, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. We live in a time when the church has refused to repent. Oh, how sad. 
When you bring the message of repentance, you know what they quote for you? They quote for you Romans chapter 8 verse 1. For there is there for no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, then can we just have a talk on this matter? Can we just have a conversation on that? What That same Romans 8, 8 verse 1 you have talked about. Then what is the definition of being in Christ Jesus? Only that we need to handle, right? Does it mean to continue in sin? Uh-huh. Then you nail it with them, but they don't want. The modern church does not want repentance. And look, and yet he says the Lord did not come for the 99 righteous that don't need repentance. They will roll down here crying. And their form of worship will be by slaughter. They will not value their lives anymore. Go to India and tell them that. They will not value their lives anymore. Because they will have now realized that hell is the door to hell is open wide mouth. And then there is heaven. And heaven comes through the slaughter. So I rather stand the knife cut me and then you go. But you see now you are talking to one who will die for the Lord. Remember I've shared with you people I've seen. I've seen. And, and I've, seen, I've seen. Look at this now. The Lord shows everything. That's the first thing you show. He says you will die for me. And then one of the days when he showed that, okay, that's all right, that's all right. These are unrecordable things, yes. Yes, so. And then the day, when the day arrives, then he, when he showed me now how it will take place, look now. Finally. He himself, the one we are reading about here, the lawless one. And then. They will hate anyone that testifies to righteousness. The media will hate anyone preaching holiness. And I've seen the going and the tumbling of buildings, the earthquakes you see now, we are going to see shortly. Greater earthquakes going because the whole world turns around and worships Satan. So the wrath of God spars up big time. But boy, when the day arrives, they are now celebrating. Like that. And then finally the assassination. I've seen everything. That's the first thing the Lord shows you. So, but, but the beautiful thing is this. That the moment you kill the body, the life just sleeps like this and stays and looks, stares at the dead bodies. Lifts. Instant. So there's no need to fear. Hallelujah. Is to be with Christ. Stephen went on his knees saying, receive my soul, receive my spirit. Hallelujah. So that's why they do not shrink. But he says here, I tell you in the same way, it will be more, there will be more rejoicing in heaven for one sinner, over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous ones that refuse to repent. So the Lord is saying that Jesus himself, everybody listen to me now very well. Jesus himself, the Lord Jesus himself, do you remember the garden of Gethsemane? When he cried out, the weight was too heavy. And he cried out to God the Father. And he asked him, Lord, can you take away this cup from me, the cup of wrath? He said, but however, let it not be my will, but be your will. And God the Father had such an opportunity to take away the cup, right? Oh yes, right. no, no, that moment, that moment right there. To just take it away. He said, let's find another way. Or let's finish these people, begin with a new project. He had opportunity. He did it in the days of Noah. He killed the whole world. God the Father had real opportunity. He said, please, can you take this cup away from me? And then, the Father, he refused. He refused to do that. What is the meaning of the Father refusing? What is the meaning of the Father refusing to take away the cup of the wrath, which is overweighing, weighing down on the Messiah? Too heavy, in other words. In other words, God the Father was saying that there is 
no other way for mankind to enter the kingdom of God except through only one man called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If he does not do it, there is no entry, my Lord. So therefore, these people you see today worshipping Buddhism, Hinduism, Muslim, all over the temples are full in Nairobi here. There is a problem. We need to go there. We need to go and tell them that Jesus alone is the way. Otherwise, you will roll here. You will roll in the dust. You will gnash teeth. You will wail. You say, oh, I wish I'd known. Now I know the Bible is true. Fine. But because, let me tell you one thing. In hell, in the lake of fire, everybody is a believer in Jesus. Everybody that enters the lake of fire, finally they believe that John chapter 3.16 is actually true. Now finally they believe. Oi! Same thing here, same here. They finally believe that, wow, only Jesus is the way. He said, there's only one way for man to see the kingdom of God. John 14 verse 6, he says there. He says, Jesus answered, I am the way. Did he say that I am one of the ways? Not at all. He did not say I am one of the ways. He said, I am the, the only way, the only way. So it's not about Hindu or Hare Krishna or whoever. Not at all. It's not Buddhism. Some Buddhist God or Muhammad what? Not at all. It is only Jesus. We need to reach out to these people with the saving gospel of Jesus because now we know how terrible it is in front there. It is our role. Even you, somebody reached you. Somebody had to reach you with the gospel for you to be here. So we need to make effort. It doesn't matter how long they abuse you. Right? Make effort until they are converted. Even you, somebody worked on you and worked on you until you became born again. And the window is still open. We need to do revival in India for creepers to walk the blind to see that the Hindus may see the deaf opening the ears that the Hindus may come to Jesus because he says, I am the only way and the only truth and the only life. Whoever does not take this now, no one comes to the Father except through me alone. Whoever does not take, they will roll down here gnashing teeth. Did you understand? That is the burden for evangelism. That is the message coming through that wailing. Wairunge, you are new here. Drink a lot of water. You are really, you are Kenyan. Don't, don't let me deal. I have the biggest nation on the earth. Take water and drink it in public here as you are sitting there. Don't do this to me, Kenyans. I've just talked about the council that you need to really give me a chance to handle the, the, the populous nation. Yeah, do, do, do anything you need to do so you don't sleep like JJ here. So, so very serious. Very, very serious. He says, I am the only way. Otherwise, the father would have taken away that cup on that day and hewn another way. But the father, however much he loves the son, there is no way he was going to take the cup because there is only one way. If he does not do it, mankind is doomed. Humanity. Hallelujah. And for me, I am even privy. Privy meaning I am aware. I am in the know. Of the conversation that took place on the mountain of transfiguration. Every detail. Plus the instruction. Go now. The way has been opened. Just go and finish it. The way has been opened. It is safe. Aye. So very serious. He said I am the way. No other way. He's saying all other ways that man has for trying to reach God through the tower of Babel. They have failed. Even Genesis 3 verse 7. They have failed. He says the following. Genesis 3 7. He says. He says. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed the fig leaves together. And made coverings for them. But they were still naked. Cannot appear before the father. Until Genesis 3 21. Look at that now. 321 then he institutes, he installs the worship of the blood of the lamb. The first death, the first death since creation now takes place. Then he says, then the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed him. Then they can fellowship now. Hallelujah. 
the message of the church that remains the people that remain they may not even be church the people that reject the gospel now reject the announcement now reject jesus now the christ rejecting world those saying oh no we we are buddhist we are hindus we are muslim we are what and these days they are even enthroned enshrined in the constitution it's like that their kind of idol worship is institutionalized and legalized my lord Aye! in some countries they even say you are not allowed to convert how now? When we know only Jesus is the way, what shall we do? We must continue going and pounding the gospel. Because the gospel has a way of reaching the heart. He that created the soul and the heart, he knows that which if he presents to the heart, the heart becomes converted. If he presents a creeper walking, then the entire Muslim village, they come to Mombasa. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they say, holy God, like this one, how can we enter with shoes? Oh yes, we must not give up. Did you understand now? Because the window is still there. The time is still there. Hallelujah. And that time I was shocked. He walked so many kilometers in the streets of the city. You want this to be happening where? In India. So that they storm the city. What is the message? That Jesus has raised a cripple. And then when they come out say, But that cripple, I know him. Do you mean he's walking now? Hey, even me, I'm running there. Hallelujah. We must bring this to India. We are bringing this to India. Because the Lord that created the heart, He knows that which if He presents to the heart, the heart will be convicted, converted. Hallelujah. Very serious. We are talking about practicalities here. Things that are happening in this land, in this revival, in this ministry. HIV has been healed. And He's saying here, that the ways of man, if you look at Genesis 3.24, the door is closed. Human effort cannot make headway. Until God came with Genesis 3.15, when he brought the evangelio. Hallelujah. He's saying Jesus Christ alone will save this world. We must preach Jesus. I know that there is a temptation to preach prosperity. But let us go back to preaching the cross and the blood. Let's go back to preaching Jesus. Hallelujah. He died and resurrected. He died and resurrected. He died and resurrected. You can preach it for 20 years. You will still be right. You are correct. Hallelujah. Then he's saying that those that refuse to offer, that they offer rather, they offer of the salvation, to offer the sacrifice of the blood. To, to Those that refuse the offer of the salvation of the blood, like the church of this age, they are the ones rolling here that the Lord showed me. They reject the cross and the blood, the very hope of salvation. Because the blood is the power unto the gospel. The cross is the heart, the heart of the gospel. That when you remove holiness from the gospel of Jesus, it becomes another religion, even worse than Hinduism. Because the Lord says their final condition is worse than they were in the beginning. Aye. And that's why we need to be very careful. So the Lord is saying that these people, the tribulation has come, distress has come like no other. And these people, they were given a chance but they rejected the very tenets of the gospel. Oh no. If you put that, right, just that statement alone, you capture the entire church globally right now. They are on something else. They say, no, that is very ancient gospel. Now you see, you know, people are modern. Aye. They have refused the substitute death. Meaning, look. Chapter 9, 23, they don't leave it on your screen right there. So then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciples, in other words, my disciple, in other words, whoever wants to be the citizen of the kingdom of God, follow me into the kingdom of God. He's saying, whoever wants to be my follower, my disciple, the citizen of the kingdom of God, must deny themselves and take up their cross and, and crucify their flesh daily. Oh no, the modern church, India is wealthy. The modern church does not want it. You are, you are inviting them to suffer daily. 
Oh, not at all. They will not love that. Even the pastors don't like it. But he's saying that the cross is painful. And the present day church knows when you take the cross, that means you are crucifying the flesh daily. Daily. And it's painful. So the Lord is making an invitation for us to persevere, to suffer with him. Hallelujah. And so, let us look at the circumstances under which the horrors, the, the, the dread, the, the terror, in fact, terror is the word, the difficulties, the sufferings that happen inside there in the tribulation. Okay, let me just describe it for you. Daniel, it is never, never qualified. There is no reference for it. Daniel 12, verse 1, he says the following. Daniel 12, number 1, he says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, Israel, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Let me show you what my, Michael, this kind of mystery. When I gave a prophecy, that is the difference between you coming here and going elsewhere. Because here I can share with you deeper things you don't find elsewhere. Deeper interactions with God. So the Lord shows me in a dream, he shows me the, the, the tremendous ISIS, ISIS from the Syrian border, preparing to come and, uh, and to attack Israel from the Syrian border. So then I have a conversation with the Lord, back and forth. I ask him, God the Father, I said, if ISIS is coming, then why don't we protect Israel? Because now I could see them wanting to come, as he showed me, look, look, they want to attack. That would be around the Golan Heights, right? Then I simply asked, I mean in that conversation, I said, why don't we protect Israel that ISIS may not make it through. And then the Lord accepted. Then I told him, please, come strictly along the border. The word is strictly. Along the border. Meaning protect. Otherwise, if you come elsewhere, people will not know you're protecting. But come strictly along the border and protect Israel. But it's amazing because I simply want to raise the case for Michael. What you hear there about Michael is unbelievable if I share now. What I see and people don't see. It's unbelievable. So I made a prophecy, 2012. And now I called God the Father. It was live on TV and, uh, and also on radio. We did it live globally. And I called him to go and protect the border of Israel with Syria because of the danger of ISIS. To protect from ISIS. Then I finished the prophecy. And then now, when the time came for fulfillment, you know, now you see my biggest worry also is because of modernism. Sometimes you worry when you meet Israel, okay, I know that I meet leaders from Israel, you understand. But sometimes part of the meeting is first of all to introduce who is about to talk to them. Hallelujah. Because of modernism. So modern. Hallelujah. Until you find me asking, you people, you are so modern now, you forget the ancient God of Israel. You are forgetting his wonders. That whole journey from Egypt, you've forgotten? You know, because now the generations and what have you and modernism and can come in. And sometimes people don't even believe anymore. Sometimes people are in new age religions. Can you imagine? Going to Mount Himalayas. So the biggest fear also was that when he comes, will they be able to recognize him? But God is very mighty. In fact, I was very surprised. So eventually when he came, let's hear, let's hear the footprints. When you hear Adam, they had the footprints of God. Let's hear the footprints. Strictly along the border, as I told you. Until the IDF, they put down their guns and began to record. When you hear that Adam and Eve, they had the footprints of God walking and they did. This is now the footprints of God. And remember it was along the border only? Along the border. Even recently when I told them there is a big war coming with Iran. But Hashem, Hashem has sent me that he wants to protect you. He will protect you better. I kept showing them this. And they said, but we know this. When it happened, I was in the Golan that day. I know this. This was the Lord who came. So you don't know what No, they, 
are you no look look now are you seeing the gun like this not at all the gun is god is now protecting the body he's saying the land you are going to is the land that you are the lord your god loves it's not that the, like the land of egypt where you want to go and fetch water from the nile and water by foot like one water a vegetable garden and you water the hectares of corn and wheat not at all it's the land the lord your god loves it's like that all you need to do is to sleep and the lord your god will irrigate it for you just cover your blanket well he will pour from heaven as long as you walk right with him he will bring irrigation by himself and he will bring the crop it's a land of hills and mountains it has no river nile it has no euphrates river hallelujah look at this and let us see how the newspapers reported exactly my words of prophecy look at that look at my words the pillar of cloud defends the border of Israel with Syria. Another one. In a hurry, we don't have time. The enormous cloud of God protects Israel from ISIS. The exact words of the prophecy. From ISIS. Look at this now. Another one. Biblical pillar of cloud protects Israel from ISIS. That is amazing. As if they are reading from the prophecy... Conception, conception, conception. What is wrong with you, conception? God is crying for conception. Please, conception, repent, conception. God is crying. And every news agency cried conception. And when I say border with Syria, ISIS, everything was repeated. Uh, even recently when I was there, I said, did you people pick from my prophecy and write it or what? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, but anyhow, what I, the reason I brought this up, because he says, Michael the great prince, because now I wanted to mention the circumstances of the terror, the terrible times in which these rolling are going to have now to accept Jesus. The circumstances, when I mentioned Daniel chapter 12, and I, I came in to show you about the cloud. Why? Because of Michael. Michael the great prince who protects your people. Now, let me tell you one thing. What people don't see, what I now see, what I see is that when he came, when he answered me and came, and he was going along the border, notice number one, he could not enter inside. Have you noticed that? Not at all, because it's not yet time. Not yet time. Only recently when I went now to Jerusalem in June, then he showed me the dream, how he came, the cloud came and touched the soil. When he touched the soil, then look what he did. He went like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, 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 this. So much, so much. And then stood like this. Meaning, I missed you. It shocked me in that dream. I came live on air, right? After that, the next morning I came live on air. It was not yet time for him to enter. That's why you see, he is on the Syrian side. Syrian side. But what people don't see is this. I saw when he comes every inch of the border of Israel, my Lord. You, you forget about these things you see in the news. Every inch of the border there was this massive archangel, Michael, with a flaming sword. And he would put, he is almost twice your height. He would put flaming, flame, flame, like a, something you put in the fire, metal and flaming. Flame and put down like this. Then he would lift it up like this. Every inch. And he multiplied himself across the entire border, even by the sea. He covered the whole border of Israel. How are we together now? This is serious, you people. I know I need to move very fast because of time. What is in front is more, more important now. So you see, we need to understand. Then, then also... The hosts of heaven with flaming swords. What people don't see, I see a full army protecting every inch. So forget about these things you see in the news. Oh, we'll crush Israel, we'll finish you. No. The Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts, is watching Israel. But he's saying it will be a terrible time, like has, what I want to raise there is this, like has never happened from the beginning of nations until then. Meaning, you have no reference. Go tell the church, tell the people, be born again now. 
We don't even have a reference to give you on that time and the difficulty and the terrors of that time. Like never happened before. Thank you so much. Like never happened before. Hallelujah. And we see in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, 5 and 7. Verse 7 is what I... You can start verse 5 if you want. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river, and one on the other opposite bank of the river. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Meaning the difficult time, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, that distress to God's people. Meaning the great tribulation. Then the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted up his right hand and his left hand and then I heard him swear. Swear. He swore. Look at that. He swore by him who lives forever. That is Yahweh himself. He swore by Yahweh my Lord. He swore saying that the great tribulation must come for three and a half years. It will not fail. Ay, 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 ay. Must come. In other words, it's a guarantee. There is a certainty that it must happen. Recently here, July 8th and July 11th, I remember the two days, one of them, when I was sitting there recently, and then I fell asleep, and one foot, the table that you see there, and then one foot from it, the Lord wrote, he wrote Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. But look at how he writes. He wrote from this side going this way. And it's amazing because I am asleep and now I'm seeing this vision, the hand of the Lord writing here. One foot from the table like this. In the air like this. He's writing Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. But look at this. He's writing from this side going this way. From right going left. But he makes me know when he writes 6, I already get to know what is the next thing he's writing. I get to know the next before he writes. Very powerfully so. Revelation chapter 12 verse 6. So here he's saying, he, he says, the woman fled in, okay, 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 okay. So forever. It will be for times, for a time, times and half a time, when the power of the holy people will have been finally, will have finally been broken. All these things will be completed. That is amazing. And so, and then, of course, then that means they will be fleeing. Their power is broken, right? So even the nuclear weapons cannot work anymore. So and then, and then Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 in a hurry, he says the following, that the Lord wrote recently, just this past month, he said, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for three and a half years. He's guaranteeing it will take place. Tell them, please be born again now. It is a certainty. It's a guarantee that the most difficult time in the history of all creation will take place. Aye, 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 aye. And then Daniel 7, 21, 22, he says the following. That you may understand the circumstances under which now you want to receive Christ. Why? Because you refused the prophecy. You did not obey the prophecy. He says, as I watched this horn was waging war against the holy people of the Lord and defeating them. Can you put King James? He's saying, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints, tribulation saints, and he's saying, and prevailed against them. Now, still King James put Matthew sixteen eighteen. So we compare with this. He says, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word is prevail. That when I build the church, the Lord says, the devil will not prevail. My church. That confession that you are Christ, the son of the living God. Confession. It is not Peter, Peter. No, no. It's the confession. Confession. To recognize that this is Christ Jesus, the Son of the living God. We need Him for salvation. He has come to redeem us. We must receive Him. And then, He says, built on that confession is His church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. The devil will not prevail. But when you go now to Daniel seven twenty one, look at that now. Then He says, 
and waging war. I beheld that this horn was waging war against God's saints, this against the saints, and he prevailed. That tells you the church has been taken. That's why the saints now, tribulation saints, tell them, please don't take chances. Hallelujah. And then he says, verse 22, they have finished up. Eh? He says, until the ancient of days came and the judgment was given unto the saints, to the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Hallelujah. So we need to finish up with these things here. The book of Revelation Chapter 6, verses 9, 11 over there. The circumstances under which you will now have to worship. Revelation 6, 9, 11 says, And when, I, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who were slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus they had beheld, they had maintained. It says, And they cried out in a loud voice, saying, How long, O holy, O Lord, holy and true, sovereign Lord, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Again now he's talking about on the inhabitants of the earth. You meet them there. He now names them. It's not the church. They are the ones for whom the tribulation is meant. He's judging the Christ rejecting world. And they crowd in a loud voice saying, oh, okay there, uh-huh. next. So he's saying, and and white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants, also their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. That is amazing. Did you just hear what I heard? It is the Lord himself answering them. The Lord is saying, no, 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 hold it a second. I want your fellow friends there, servants there to be slaughtered first. God wants the tribulation saints to be slaughtered to test the inhabitants of the earth if they can worship, if they still love Jesus under those circumstances. Tell them not to try. Don't try this. Don't do this. And so we, there are many others we could look at. Revelation 13, 1 and so forth. You see that? So he's saying that those that roll around at that time when now they enter the tribulation, they enter a world full of lies, deception, wars, chaos, bloodshed, persecution. You can imagine. Now it does not pay to invest on the earth at that point. It does not pay to say, no me, I don't want to receive Christ because I'm wealthy. Not at all. Because things are being destroyed. Hallelujah. Tonight we're going to choose. We're going to make a real choice. He says there's nothing good that remains on the earth. Tonight we're going to choose before the rapture happens. Before the door closes. And he's saying these people will then turn to scripture. These people here that rejected Christ. Rolling after them. They will turn to scripture to try to get information. Counsel. And they will get which scriptures? Thess- they will be led to Thessal- First Thessalonians chapter one. Oh, I beg your pardon. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen to eighteen. First Thessalonians uh, ch- chapter five, verses nine ten. How the Lord takes them away. First Thessalonians chapter one, nine and ten. How the Lord takes them away from before judgment. They will be led to John chapter fourteen, one and three. They will be led to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 to 58. They will be told, no, those people have been taken by the Lord. It is called the rapture of the church. Then all of a sudden now they will understand, oh, okay. I think then now, if I don't make a decision now, I am into the lake of fire. Burning there and suffering. And the Antichrist is very serious on their case at that time. Now, because of the tempest, the mayhem, chaos that ensues, there is now need for someone to appear and take charge. The Antichrist appears in that order. First he comes as a man of peace, of course, which he does not make. If you read, read Revelation 6, 1 on the horseman, the second horse, I have seen him, 
There's bloodshed. He has a spalda, a big sword. That's what is the war. You see the wars going on around here. The big wars are coming at that time. And then he's saying, he's saying that now he appears, you will need somebody to appear and take charge. So that now they be able to give solutions to the world. Systems are broken down. Somebody we are going to finish today, just drink a little bit of water. Hallelujah. And then when he comes, they will submit under him. But then, you know too well that he is struck. I can share that vision. I will share that vision if you want. Hallelujah. Yes, I will share with you because there were senior pastors here from all over the world at that time. So what happened is that uh, the Lord showed me again, like he showed me the war in Ukraine coming. Then he showed me uh, that day. In that vision, I saw the beast. Okay, I can begin with the first vision many years earlier. I saw the dragon come by the seashore. Then he called the beast from the sea. When the beast came, he came. Then I saw three stairs. He climbed three stairs, white, meaning church. He climbed and went and stood there. That's many years back. And then after that, then I saw a lot of white fish dead and floating on the sea. White fish, you know those are saints, right? The slot of the saints. This is what you see in Revelation chapter 6, 9, 11. But then now, this particular case, I saw the beast. I think it was January 29th, 2022, if I'm not mistaken, or 23, I think 22. Hallelujah. I need to check whether it's 22 because God has been speaking quite a bit, right? So now, January 29th, I see the beast. is huge. Then I see that all of a sudden, one of his heads is wounded. But that wound, I have details now. That wound extends a bit to the neck. And that wound exposes a fresh flesh blood with blood. Fresh Flesh with blood. Bloody or pen with blood. And then the next moment, when I look at him again, the wound is healed. But the moment the wound is healed, then I see him approach. I have preached this to you forever, right? Yes, on radio, right? Even abroad. But anyway, for India now. So the next moment he goes and he approaches the saints from the back. And he catches them with his mouth from slightly above the waist. You would think he's catching to eat. But he catches and look like this. Catching from above the waist and then pa, 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 destroying. Damaging the saints. The head split, their legs split well. So it's a very difficult time. Don't fool around. I've seen the inside of that season. It's a bad season. You can imagine I'm prophesying in between the two. And so you need to be very careful that at that time he will have authority. If you check Revelation chapter 13 and just reading verses 1 and 4 maybe, he says the following. He said, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw the beast come out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, the ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. We don't have time. And then it says, the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast, look at this now, satanic power. So the devil is driving him. So you won't tell him that you are abusing my human rights. Not at all. Because the satanic, the devil, gives him his power, his throne, and authority. But even most importantly, what the Lord is raising here, you remember, pa, pa, pa in that vision, destroying the sheep, destroying the, rather the, the, the saints of the Lord. And then the grass is disturbed with blood and so forth. The grass is disturbed with parts of human body. I mean, of the bodies of the, the saints. So, and, and the Lord says, go give it to them as it is. Don't change it. Go give it to them as it is and ask them, do you think then you can manage that? then why are you not obeying the prophecy that is announcing that the Messiah is coming and you need to repent and be holy? Why are you not obeying? If you cannot stand that, give it as it is. Pa, pa, destroy, crush the head on on the tarmac and all this. 
destroying, not eating, simply devouring to destroy. And then go tell them as it is and ask them the question. Then why are you playing with holiness as though you want to enter the tribulation? Then why are you playing with repentance? Why are you playing with righteousness? Why are you not holding on to holiness? Holding on to repentance? Holding on to righteousness? If you know that you can't manage. And another message is here. Look at, look at the brutality. Look at now the cruelty and the, the, the raw, raw presentation by the Lord. He says, like a leopard, you know how vicious a leopard is. A leopard is bad. A, a leopard is very bad. It has no rules. When it attacks you, it is murderous and bloody and vicious and angry all the time. It does not want to look at your eyes. Never. That's why normally it jumps and takes the, 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 the skin of the head from that cover the eyes. It is so, cannot, it cannot stand your eyes. It wants to eat you. And it attacks with all the clothes open and everything. Vicious, bloody, murderous. Delivered. And then he's saying that as vicious and murderous and bloody as the leopard is, then he says, this beast is a combination of the viciousness of the leopard, the bloodiness of the leopard, murderousness of the leopard. And then he adds it to the lion. You know, the lion is the king of the jungle. The lion can catch a leopard and eat it for lunch. So that is serious. He's saying, the viciousness and ferocious, when a lion has seen a prey now, it's out of control. <sighs> now it's out of control. Plus the viciousness of a leopard, put them together. And then add the bear. The bear eats plus the bones. The bear is the worst. The Lord deliberately paints this picture here. And he says, then go to the church and ask them, do you think you can manage him? Go and ask them that. Do you think you can manage him? He's a combination of the bloodiness, viciousness, murderousness of the leopard combined with the viciousness, murderousness, bloodiness of the lion combined with the uncontrollable. I don't know if you put together a bear and a lion who can win that battle when they attack each other in a cage. They might eat each other. And so you are saying, He's saying here that he puts those three words together and he says that the beast that is coming is like this. Meaning you cannot manage him. So tell people just to prepare well and get out of here. Tell the church in India, don't play with holiness. You cannot manage this. And so he says that the Holy Spirit will be there to help the church. At that time will inspire them, not indwell them. There will be an evangelism that goes on. Even at one point, the three angels we are going to look at in the next message, they fly, God making a last call. Telling them to defy Satan. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, he says, on the screen right there. He says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the Spirit said they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. They will rest from their persecution. Can you imagine that? He's saying there are only two ways you can die in this time. I mean all the time, but I'm now here. He's saying either you die in the Lord and they kill you or you die in sin, your sin. And if you die in your sin, it's quite bad. You'll stand before the white throne judgment with all your sins on your head and yet Jesus died and carried all the sins of everybody. Substitute death. You simply needed to receive him. Go and tell the church not to fool around with repentance. Go and tell the church not to fool around with the announcement, the glorious announcement that the Messiah is coming. Because when it does fulfill, get fulfilled, and it finds you out, it is unbelievable. What we have read until now. Hallelujah. And so the Lord is saying, the beast is now unrestrained because the Holy Spirit is not there. Now he's operating full throttle. Again, 
We are walking with these tremendous people that were rolling down here. They have missed the rapture. And so, the enemy comes with satanic power. Wounded and then appears as though he's now healed. I want to look at how he's injured. If you go to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah, I know it is chapter 11. Give me verse, uh, verse 15, verse 17, I think. Try, let's try there. Woe to the worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm. His, okay, the, the other version, they said the right arm and his right eye. May his arm be completely withered. His right eye totally blinded. So, he will have one eye blind. One eye blind, one arm, the right arm shriveled. So maybe you'll have something like this. And yet, the world will still love him. They will still love him as he is. They will say, we don't care, he's giving us good solutions. I tell the church to repent. Tell India to repent. Tell Kenya to repent. The nations tuned in, please repent. Because it's better you take Christ now than having to lay down your life for him. Because now you simply have to die to sin. And when you die to sin, it will be so powerful. And then the image will be placed in the temple. Can I go there also? So now he will have an assistant. We have not read. If we needed to read, we would have read Revelation 13 verses 1 on and then verse 11 on. Then you see now a false prophet, prophet appears who has access to the temple. And puts a mark there to be worshipped. And so, I take it that they may use artificial intelligence. right? Something like that, right? Whereby now that image will speak. And that image will now command those who don't worship the beast to be slaughtered. Tell the church to prepare for the rapture, please. Don't deal with this. This is unbearable, unbelievable. Don't handle it. Don't deal with it. It's not for you. And then also, the world will turn against some two messengers I don't want to handle here. Because they testify against the devil worship and the sin of the world, and they move with power. They can shut heaven. Their power to shut heaven and rain come. Their power over heaven. They can call for fire also in the meeting and fire comes. Can you put the column of fire also? Because what we have here is the one that came over, over when the, when the angel, when Gabriel came with the golden trumpet and then the fire and he stood up there with the fire. But you can put this one. Look, there is also this one here. From touching the worship. They have power over heaven to open it or shut it completely. They can call fire from the Lord. Do you remember, I think it was February, is it 2008 or something? I need to check the time. When the two entered where I was, right? When God the Father entered with somebody where I was, the thick dark cloud of God covered that place, then he entered. And when he entered, then the two stood, two of us stood in front of the Lord of all the earth. He now, the, the cloud covered even went like this. Look at this now. And then we spoke. I stood this way and I also stood this way. Show Kisumo. And then, look at this now. Focus on me now. The cloud. Okay, you just be here for a moment. Be on me. So, he, now the cloud covered him. Huge. And then we stood. And then when I just opened my mouth to speak like this, we spoke exact words, exact everything. Say, Lord, you are so holy, Lord. Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are so holy. Speaking double. Time is over. 
And then the two of us became huge olive trees, huge, and grew up there into heaven. Thank you. So now, we've not mentioned the second beast. We've mentioned a little bit of the hatred that will go on during that time on that kind of ministration. But I want to finish now. There will be a mark. There will be a mark. Okay, movement, Kenyans, no movement. Otherwise, I'll kick you out. I'm saying it live. I'll kick you outside this door. This time belongs to India. I, the, least, the last thing I want is disturbance from Kenya. I'll just tell you to walk out and I'll kick you out. Kenya. Because right now I have the most populous country here. I want to bring them up to date. That's why I postponed the message of the rapture for tomorrow. I wanted to handle these people that failed to make it. And you can see how deeply I'm handling it. I'm jumping a lot of things, but at least bringing the key things to them. Even to you, Kenya. I've never shared this. So now, there is the mark of the beast without which you cannot buy or sell. Remember in that vision, they, are now, they have converged on this woman. Say, what, why do I feel you were a pastor? Say, no, me, I renounce Jesus. After that, she got the mark and I saw her go like this. She shopped. The exit, the tellers on the other side, exit on the other side. And then this other side of the road, the radio station is here. Two young men, untucked shirts, telling the world, no, it is the rapture. When I just gained contact with the church lady, they disappeared like that. So, you cannot buy. And once you get the mark, it is eternal. Once you get the mark, it is eternal. You cannot reverse it. Whoever has the mark, you have to now make do with it. Eternally. The judgment will be unbearable. Revelation chapter 14, 9, 11, he says the following. He says, a third angel followed them. You'll see these angels later because I'm going to handle the pulpit from heaven. Don't worry about it. But for now, he says, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast or, and, and, and the image of the beast and receives its mark on their forehead, or on their hand. Look at what happens to them. He says, They too will drink of the wine of God's fury which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. Why full strength? That is the long suffering of God. God has been waiting for so long for them to repent. They did not repent the long suffering of God such that now the wrath that comes because he has been waiting because of his compassion, long suffering with his love and repentance and grace and all this. But he's saying now, a time comes when the door for grace closes. When now the wrath is pure. It is not mixed with any love, not mixed with any repentance, not mixed with any grace, any compassion, any mercy. Not at all. It's pure wrath of God now. That's why he says full strength. Has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented by burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb himself. What a tremendous thing in the presence of the Lamb. And I say it very clearly that if you don't take the mark of the beast, even your neighbors will report you the way they reported to the Nazis. Look, look, the Jews are living here. It will be bad. Very bad. They will report. You cannot buy. And remember, nobody can buy on your behalf. Not at all. And remember, because of the wars and because of what's going on, there's also inflation of food. The Lord has shown me that dream. He put a coin in my hand and then people were lined up buying cereals and he told me, you line up. I was in Maputo at that time. You line up and also purchase the cereal. So when I lined up, but that lady, the can, she punched the inside. So it was scooping less than half. So when I bought with that coin, ancient coin, I turned it. So when I bought, it was less than, even meat was not enough. It will be terrible times. So the mark will be eternal. Those that have it must enter the lake of fire. 
And that anyone who takes the mark, it is irreversible. Now, I want to handle the last leg and then we'll finish. The Lord puts a chip. He puts a chip. If you go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. He puts a chip in the heart of every person. We are finishing now. We are finishing. Tomorrow we'll handle the rapture. Don't worry. This was, <laughs> I needed to handle this that you know, may know it's not easy. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're going to finish this now. So the Lord puts a chip in each person about eternity. That everybody is aware that there is eternity. He has made everything beautiful in his time and he has also set eternity in the heart of humans. In the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So that consciousness of eternity is what makes them now want to offer their lives. You remember the grand multitude no one can count? This drives them. They are able to detect that right now I have to choose. Either I enter the lake of fire or that is it. I be slaughtered and enter heaven. And so we have a few scriptures here. Revelation chapter 15 verse 2 he says the following. He says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea are those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name and they held harps given them by God. Hallelujah. But what a way to worship. <laughs> What a way to worship. So now, can I just say something? So because of the realization that the Bible is real, God is real, eternity in heaven is real, eternity in the lake of fire is real, because of that they make a conscious choice because of Ecclesiastes 3.11, they're able to detect eternity in heaven. They choose heaven. They say, slaughter me, but I go into glory. Some of them, slaughter me, I want to join my family that already went in the rapture. The monumental event has happened and shaken the earth upside down. Things are destroyed. Earthquakes. I have not mentioned earthquakes. I have not mentioned Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 to 15. Massive earthquakes that move mountains. I have not mentioned, the, look at this now, the seal judgments. The trumpet judgments. At one point, one third of all vegetation, drinking water, the seas, the sheep, one third, one third, one third. Why? God wants them to know. It is not climate change. It is God doing it. It is not climate change. It is not. It is God deliberately doing it. I have not mentioned how the final one, the bowel judgment, and at the bowel judgment, now you see Everything else now that was remained untouched is destroyed. Plus the Euphrates opens, even an army come from there now. But you see now, in that one also, all the water now turns blood. There is even the drinking water, all of it now turns blood. Even the sun is flaring, burning people. He's burning people's backs. I have not mentioned. It's unbearable. Tell people to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Nobody can bear. You cannot. Worship in those circumstances. I told you, I want to follow them inside there and see. Can they really worship there? I said, oh, who said that? <laughs> oh, thank you, my dude. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Prepare the church, my daughter. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know you have a big church there. <laughs> yeah, just prepare the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. No. I said, the prophecy is being announced in Mumbai, India. With power. In Ahmednagar, with power. The prophecy of open heaven given over here, one year, eight months before I have a date, even a re-invitation letter, even talk about visa. And then come there, and surely heaven obeys at my present Boah, rain. And then cripples are walking. The blind can see. And in Mumbai also. And then, 
You have not yet changed. But the king of Egypt has changed. He has begun to build silos. He has appointed a slave boy, has become a prime minister. There is a vehicle moving saying, give way, give way, opening for him. Silos are being built. Farmers are farming. Crops are being stored. And the king of Egypt did not see an open heaven of Amen Nagar. He did not see cripples walk or the blind see or deaf for mute. Why? Things are bad because on top of what I've shared, I have not shared the trumpet judgments. First of all, the seal judgments. The trumpet judgments. And then the bowl judgments. At one point, there is an earthquake that comes and moves mountains and moves uh, islands. But the next earthquake global comes. It flattens the mountains and it it sinks, the, it destroys the, 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 the islands and sinks them. They are not there anymore. So it's terrible to worship in those circumstances. When the Lord Almighty, the rapture happens and he makes me go down like as if lightning pure on that side. I find myself down rolling in the dust like that. It was not a joke. It was not a joke. He was saying, please don't miss it. Please do everything. Tell the church, just believe the prophecy. Because every prophecy of the coming of the Messiah is always fulfilled accurately. Just prepare. But don't be found down there rolling. It's unbearable to worship under these circumstances. I said, I want us to follow him. To follow them in the sea. Are they able to worship in the circumstances? It is not possible. Stop joking death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. That is what death is. How can you say it is gain? Oh, that I would have some wings like a dove and be raptured away into the kingdom of glory. I. That is serious. Under the circumstance, how can you worship? He's saying, they reach that place again, Philippians chapter 1 verse 21, where they realize that just a moment, now death is gain here. Because they realize that even the disciples, even the apostles, they were slaughtered for this thing. Gunyali, stop sleeping really. They were slaughtered for this thing. Even the prophets were slaughtered for these things. And then they realize that just a moment, we're going to do it also. Let's also do it. Verse 22, 23. I don't have time before we go to the book of Hebrews 11, 35. For if I am to go on living in the body, this will, be, will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. Then he says, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Do you see where they reach? They finally, finally arrive at a place where they must now accept to be slaughtered. But they are also having some point of reference. They are saying, remember the disciples were slaughtered for this thing. Remember the prophets of Yahweh are always killed for this thing. And then in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35 on, he says the following. All this is now, because guess what? Because they have made reference to Bible. They have gone back to Bible to seek counsel under those difficulties. And guess what? You must hide your Bible in the pocket because they are looking for people with Bibles and killing and taking away Bibles at that time. The word of God. So you must hide it somehow. They are deleting them in the whole world. But you need to find it to read it. So you can read that women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be raised so that they might gain an even better resurrection. A better resurrection, that is called glorification, which we are looking at tomorrow. A better resurrection, why? Because in this form of resurrection, look at this now. These are Old Testament saints. They simply heard from the prophets. They heard from the prophets that one day in the future, the Messiah will come. And when he comes, he will die on the cross and he will resurrect in a glorious resurrection. 
And then he will share it with the faithful ones that follow him. And that resurrection is what they are calling, the glorious resurrection. They are calling a better resurrection. Why? Because now, if you resurrect, you are not like Lazarus, where you have to die again. They don't die again. So when they just, look at this now. The Messiah has not yet come, has not yet gone to the cross. Not yet. But when, ay, this, is, this is a challenge. This, this, this is a big challenge. This one is a big challenge. Because these people simply heard the prophecy that in some future date, the Messiah will come and will be born in a manger and will die on the cross and give the glorious resurrection. He has not yet come. But because of merely hearing that, look at what happened. The women received back their dead, raised to life. There were others who refused, who were, rather who were tortured, refusing to be released. And he said, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. When they heard that there is glorification coming, they refused. They said, you just torture me. Look at this, the next verse. He says, some, okay, some face jeers and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. Look at that. They were captured, tied, and stoned by group mob. Painful death. Stephen suffered it. Look at this now. He said they were put to death by stoning. They were sword. They were sword. Look, using a saw, cut into two. They were sword into two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, and they were destituted, meaning dispossessed, and persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of their faith, my Lord. The world was not worthy of them. Can we clap for them? Very serious. Very serious. He's saying that when they heard from afar, from a far distance, that one day in the future, the Messiah will come one day in the future, they just heard, they have not seen it. He has not come. They heard that one day in the future, the Messiah will come, die on the cross, and bring glorification, the better resurrection. He's saying that they right away accepted to die for that faith. And yet for you, the Messiah has already come and died and resurrected. They are no cripples who have walked. They have no Bible to read. They have no Holy Spirit in their hearts. But for you, you have Jesus in your heart already. He has come, died, resurrected. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the cloud of God is here. You have the rain of God is here. You have the cripples in Ahmed Nagar. The blind in Mumbai. You have the deaf forever. Everything is for you. You have the Bible you can read. You tell me. What a challenge. So this is the kind of scripture now that these people that have remained will be reading. And they say, no, even us we must die. Just cut my neck, cut it quickly. Hallelujah. And he's saying, the world wasn't worthy of them. Meaning, when they heard that there is glorification, which we are going to see tomorrow, that glorification is coming, look at what they did. They rubbished the world plus his wealth. And they agreed to go and live on the mountains and living in caves, in holes. But if I tell you now, can you go to Mount Kenya and live there for the sake of the gospel? You say, no, how about if a lion hit me there? How about if a python chased me, the African bear? What will I do with a blanket running again in the night? <laughs> I tell you. No, 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 no. If, no, if the Lord Jesus, if Jehovah Yahweh, he watched them and is watching you. I don't know whether I would clap. I would weep. I would not even clap on that. He's watching this generation. And if you read on, you find that this hall of faith, 
this whole of this fame of faith, superior faith, superiority of faith of the Old Testament saints, you'll find that they have not been rewarded until now because the Lord is still bargaining with an idol worshipping generation. We are worshipping Hindu and temples and Muslims and homosexual generation that is celebrating gay pride. God is waiting for you for them to be rewarded. Let's see this now. These were all commanded for their faith. They did not look for human approval, but they looked for approval from God. They were commanded by God, my Lord. And that every present day pastor in India is looking for commendation from government. From senior government leader, senior business billionaire. You say, that guy is an industrialist. He's a sheep in my church. That guy is a billionaire. He's in my church. Every single pastor in India is looking for approval from the people, the big people, the government people, the rich people. And yet these people, look, they did not seek human approval, but they received commendation from God himself, my Lord. I know. And he's saying, yet none of them received what had been promised. Why? Verse 40 says, he says verse 40, since God had planned something better for us, that all together with us, they would be made perfect. Meaning until now they are waiting for a homosexual generation that is celebrating gay pride to receive Jesus, be born again well, for them to be rewarded. That is unbelievable. What an indictment. Did you understand now? So the circumstances under which these people worship is quite rough, right? So you tell everybody in Kenya, tell them just prepare well now and enter through the rapture. Don't try. Don't, don't take chances. It's unbelievable there. Hallelujah. And so they realize that in this thing we have to die now. We have to die for this thing. And they know First John chapter 2, 15 and 17 at the end there he says, whoever has the love of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All of a sudden, now the wealth that made them refuse Jesus during the church age, they have realized earthquakes have destroyed, the locusts have come stinging people, tormenting people, the demonic locusts, the, everything, the walls have destroyed everything. Now, let, let me tell you one thing. I think we have now reached where I wanted to reach so I can finish this sermon. Because we have reached a place now where now we can rubbish the world. There is now no need to invest in the world. We rather invest in heaven, my Lord. I know. Because the world is being destroyed, now we can see. The world is being destroyed. We have just gone through it just a little. I did not handle the seal judgments. I didn't handle the horsemen. I did not handle the trumpet judgments. I did not handle the judgment, the bowel judgments. Those are horrific also. I did not handle how what, some of them just destroy the environment of men. And the others come and destroy, not the environment, but they attack man directly, like demonic locusts. So when you see me prophesy locusts on your screen here, look at the locusts. When I came and prophesied the locusts of Egypt in this age, modern age, look at that on the screen now. Look at that. It became a global locust. Global locust. Unbelievable. Global. They reached aircrafts. They reached everywhere. Look at that. Look at the trees. So, everything the Lord makes me do is for a purpose. The Lord is saying, be careful. He will prophesy another type of locusts. Demonic locusts. That will come and sting people. Five months you long to die. You cannot die. Do you still want to worship in that way? Gnashing your teeth, rolling like that. Missing the rapture. Why? Because he said, no, me, I have wealth. Now it's being destroyed. Now we have reached a place where it's better to invest in heaven, haven't we? Hallelujah. Now it's very clear that we must all invest in heaven, not on the earth. Because they say, oh, I have a lot of wealth in Mumbai. Uh, you know, that guy is a billionaire, he's an industrialist. He has wealth in Hyderabad. You know, he, he's selling gold in Kerala. You see, that guy is very rich. He cannot accept Jesus. But we are trying to work with him. They're focusing on wealth. But now we have reached when everything has been rubbished. Totally destroyed. There is even no drinking water. And there is famine. Things are bad. The oceans are blood. They are smelling like rotting corpses. Hallelujah. 
Even the underground water. Even the sea creatures have now all died. You that enjoy fish now, forget it. Hallelujah. Do not love the world. Okay, I said verse 17. I don't have much time now. Let's move on now. So very serious. And then he says, the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Hebrews 9 27. Then they realize that just as it is, people are destined to live once. Just as people are destined to die once, meaning live once on the earth. And after that face judgment. All of a sudden they realize that after all this, there is now a judgment seat of Christ and there is now the lake of burning sulfur. They say, no. Let us take Jesus. You remember how we started before we went for the short break? I said, do they have an opportunity to receive Christ? After rolling like this, I stood up, watched that side, pure light, uh, lightning, pure like this, and then rolling like this, went, checked my teeth. Do they have an opportunity? But boy, what a tall order. That's a tall order, right? That kind of worship is tall order. And that's why I want to finish by encouraging you to prepare the churches because time is over. Because at that time, judgment will also be raining on the earth. The sealed judgment will have killed one quarter of the earth. Approximately two billion people. The stench of death is on the earth. Remember when I prophesied COVID? The words of my prophecy killed 20 million plus. And there was nowhere to bury people. The earth smelled dead body. But now two b- billion in India, they threw dead bodies, you remember, in that river. And the Lord brought me there in that river. In the glorious body. You know, we have two forms. The Lord brought me there. <laughs> Let me not say what, what the Lord brought me there to do, right? Because you're going to fear sometimes the way the Lord uses his prophets, right? He said, no. Yeah. To tell the dogs that it's not even worth to you, for you to eat. I do wash myself. The Lord hates competition with idols. Comparing him with idols. It's unbelievable. So we see that there is a stench of death and nowhere to bury people. And then Revelation chapter 8, you see the trumpet judgments. One third of the plants are destroyed. One third people eat, you see. Revelation 16, only if you get a chance to read. Then you see the bowel judgments. All the plants destroyed. All the water destroyed. All the, everything turned blood, oceans, mountains have been flooded, islands disappear, burning, the sun is burning people. The conclusion is the following. Hallelujah. They say, no, I have a PhD, I don't want to receive Jesus. Because you know, we lawyers don't receive Jesus. Because we lawyers, you know, we are busy, we don't receive. <clears throat> we don't, re- I know my daughter is a lawyer behind there, she's saying, please don't pick on lawyers, right? So we, we lawyers, we don't receive Jesus. We say, you lawyers don't receive Jesus. No, no, it's, it's, it's hard. It's difficult to find a lawyer who is born. They can tell you such a thing. Why? Because they are wealthy. They're living in the top neighborhoods. They're always classy. the learned brothers. They're in the courtrooms, eating top restaurants. They're going for the law society seminars. They're another class. And so they have almost surpassed God according to their own standards. Thank you for I. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because they are wealthy. But now we have reached a place where I want to make a conclusion here. I want to conclude. Yes, I want to bring this ship, this big ship to the shore now. Right? Because he's saying here now that therefore there is nothing on this earth that compares with heaven. Hallelujah. As we are going home now. Therefore there is nothing on this earth that ever can compare with the glory of heaven. With glorification, my Lord. Ay, 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 ay. He's saying that the choice is so clear and obvious. Everybody tuned in globally, they know the choice is now very clear. Those that have invested on the earth for which reason they don't want to receive Christ, they end up rolling like this. Say, no, it's not worth it, please. Just receive Jesus now. But I can give you counsel also if you decide now to go into that and you, or you slide in for some reason. The only thing I can tell you, please don't take the mark. Please, but but you, there's no need for that because the door is still open, right? Hallelujah. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 7 and 8, he says the following. 
For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Hi. To be finally away from this earth that you so love. In other words, he's saying, now he's tra- training you, training your focus on the unseen. He said, this one you see here is temporary, perishable, and is very deluding. It lulls people, deceives people. Hallelujah. And he says, Romans chapter 8, 35, 39, he says the following, because we have now seen that they themselves have offered themselves to die for the gospel because they realize there is the lake of fire and heaven. And in any case, they prefer heaven because lake of fire is torment. Now they are slaughtered. Now look, therefore now they fulfill this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That is them singing now. But on the other day during the church age, you said you don't want They say, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Saying, "As as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, even death, they say, cannot, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now they have died for him. Why? But what a type of worship, Wangeshi, are you there? What type of worship is that? Wakili, uh, uh, Betty Oyele, senior counsel. What type of worship is this now? No, you rather take Jesus now. It's unbelievable worship. A tall order, right? Now they are saying no. <laughs> For that matter, nothing, even death will not separate us from Jesus. But in the beginning you did not obey the prophecy. And you refused righteousness. Hallelujah! The Messiah is coming. Because all of a sudden, they have realized Ecclesiastes 11.3 on your screen that if clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it shall lie forever. Cannot change its destiny, my Lord. All of a sudden they realize that in this life, only here you can prepare for your destination. You can choose and go to hell or go to heaven. He's saying, after you've died, you cannot change. No, 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 please. Father Abraham, remove me from here. Not at all. He did not say that prayer. He said, send Lazarus to touch water and cool my tongue. He never said, remove me from here. Because he knew, whatsoever enters hell stays there forever. You cannot change your destiny after death. That's why they agree now, let us just die for this matter. It's better to fall on the side of heaven. Hallelujah. So when you see the church fooling around with righteousness, fooling around with holiness, you should just ask them, do you think you are going to be able to manage to worship under those circumstances? It's not possible, right? No, it's possible in Spanish. Hallelujah. And they have realized, they have realized, okay, we saw Romans chapter 8, 17, 17, uh, 18, but they have realized 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eyes have seen, what no ears have heard, what no human heart or mind has conceived and perceived. Hallelujah. The things God has prepared in store for those that love him, willing to die for him also. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, they are now pursuing the promises of God in glory. 
God, do you think all of them will pass through this? Not at all. Most of them will take the mark for convenience. Do you remember Esau? Esau is famished, is famine. He said, no, for temporary pleasure, let me just eat this soup and throw away my, my, his, his inheritance. Majority of them will take the mark of the beast. Because in this age, in this time, when it's just very light, they have refused to persevere. They have even rejected repentance. They say, no, it's a blackmail. Repentance is kind of downgracing and downgrading. And he says, so now, it's very serious, blessed people. He's saying that they have realized that they have to choose eternity. That's why you see a big multitude, more than, more than the revival of all history of man. Hallelujah. The history of man. So what have they realized? What have these people realized? He's saying, in that way, those who are few and wise who chose that way, the seems majority do, they've realized that God is actually real. And that the Bible is true. And that Jesus is real. And that heaven is real. And that the lake of fire is real. All of a sudden they realize this now. Oh, what a way to worship. I prefer they listen to the voice calling out in the wilderness and prepare in holiness and enter the rapture. Some of them without even tasting death. And they have realized that even the heavenly rewards, they are real. The crowns, the thrones, now there is prepared for me a crown of glory. Not just for me, but for all those that will also faithfully follow Christ. So when the Lord on that day of May 4th, the year 2014, showed me the vision of the people that will miss the rapture. They miss the coming of the Messiah, the glorious coming in the sky to snatch the church. Reject the announcement of the coming of the Messiah. Reject his instruction. Don't follow it. Live their own lives. Think that this world will not come to an end. Don't believe the prophets itself. They become scoffers. Say, but the world has been continuing like this forever since our ancestors came and died. But when it happened, pa, rolling and gnashing their teeth. The day the Lord showed me that, he really showed me so much. It was a stern warning to this generation that please don't get there. It is impossible to worship under the circumstances. Can you be rising up now so we can be able to go now? So the Lord is saying the Messiah is coming. Let everybody listen to this. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be handling the rapture itself and you'll see the pillar of glorification. I've dedicated tomorrow to glorification, which is very big, that we may now, the next day will be the last day to simply tie up the loose ends and say bye bye but we have been blessed we are still blessed we will continue doing this until that day comes so those of you at home who want to receive Jesus repeat after me say mighty Lord Jesus I repent and turn away from all sin and I ask you my Lord Jesus to quicken my heart that I may be able to be sensitive to the announcement of the coming of the Messiah Lord, establish your word in my heart and establish righteousness in my heart. Lord, give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I may prepare a holy church for the glorious coming of the Messiah. Mighty Lord Jesus, please help me and order my steps towards the kingdom of God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I am born again. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the instrument is going up and loud. Eh? Do I have to say that? This is the same warning I'm talking about the council. Not at all. Not at all. I have broadcasters abroad also. They run our systems. You don't have to talk to them. In South Korea, you can imagine, has top, top broadcast systems more than